be. But even in this population, which is not a trauma population, mind you, this is all covers, this is atherosclerotic disease, there is reasonable long-term patency, mid-term patency on PTFE in the above knee popliteal position, and that's worth pointing out. It's really when you start looking at transgeniculate bypasses or tibial targets where the PTFE patency plummets precipitously. And by no means am I suggesting that PTFE is a superior conduit to vein, but the patency outcomes are actually better than I think we tend to give it credit for. I'll also point out, this is 20 year data from Grady. Um, Dr. Feliciano evaluated the first 10 years and I did the last 10 years. And if you look at every implant of PTFE put in, in that institution, and, and this is unpublished work, so I don't have additional details to give, but it's 141 implants. And the overall infection rate is 8%. These are folks, no one's giving ANSEF to people before shooting them, right? These are dirty, contaminated fields. And the PTFE infection rate, this includes vi uh, mesenteric implants, this includes th thoracic implants, they're not all just lower extremity, was 8%. And the vet, well, about half of those were patients who were critically ill, who had a temporary intravascular shunt put in, that field continued to desiccate, the muscle continued to die back, and then had PTFE put in. Primary implant of PTFE at the original operation is associated with a very low infection rate. It's not zero. I'm not proposing that it should replace saphenous vein graft. But for both infection and patency reasons, it probably does better than we tend to give it credit for. But let's pretend that it's some one of these. It's either a mangled extremity like the top picture, which is a horrible motorcycle crash we took care of, or the, art or the, the drawing of the bottom picture where it's already been implanted, and then there's a secondary infection of the PTFE. What do you do then? I, I, I firmly believe conduit is not the solution. The solution is figuring out how to manage the soft tissue to get the bypass out of the field, whether that's an extra anatomic bypass, like the classically described obturator bypass, or a fresh bypass from above and below through healthy areas is the better choice. But if, you ha if that's not an option because the soft tissue doesn't allow it, then you do have to start thinking of one of these advanced conduits. There's been a long history of attempted use um, I'll point out that Dr. Jeff Lawson, the father of the HAV graft, is also in the audience. And there's been decades of work around what it means to have a decellularized graft, what it means to use cryopreservation, somatic stem cell use, scaffold guided, self assembled. Where does AI fit into this? And this field has progressed significantly, but we're still not quite there, right? We're still using them primarily for arteriovenous disease or peripheral artery disease. And we don't have grafts that have a just sew them in wherever you want type of off-the-shelf indication. The artograft, if you go to their website, says it's used for hemodialysis, lower extremity bypass, or arterial trauma, but there's very limited data on trauma use. This is a series out of Penn using artograft, and it's small writing, but I'll tell you, it says maybe there's a role, but we weren't able to show meaningful benefit or even um, uh, not inferiority when compared with PTFE or, or saphenous vein graft. The cryo life, as many of you know, um, which was recently purchased by Artivion, um, is available, but it takes work to set up. It comes in a million different configurations. It comes in a bunch of different sizes and lengths. The manufacturer is in Atlanta, and I can't just use one off the shelf. I got to set that up. I got to call. They got to bring it in. It comes in a big box. It has to be prepared. It's also relatively expensive very limited trauma-specific literature. The HAV is the one that's obviously in uh, trial right now. Many of, the, many of you are involved in their, their pivotal trial uh, that's been ongoing for the last two years, and we're, I think everyone's hopeful that that is a potential option that allows you to have something on the shelf to use. Lastly, for large vessel reconstruction, I would highlight things that we've done for vascular disease all along, the NASE procedure, the Claggett procedure, using femoral vein is a great option, reconstructing bifurcated grafts using femoral vein, panel grafts, tubularized grafts. I think it helps to be a little creative. This is a patient who um, uh, had a gunshot wound to the abdomen with a um, injury at the splenoportal confluence, and I wrapped bovine pericardium around a chest tube, fired a TA stapler across it, over so the suture line to make a big tube. I've done the same thing with falciform ligament where you can mobilize the falciform ligament, wrap, wrap it around a tube 
and use a stapler. I think, I think it helps you to be creative in these circumstances. I remember a case as a fellow with Dr. Feliciano sewing a panel graft um, to, to reconstruct a large vessel. I believe he developed chest pain at some point during that operation, but did okay. Um, I think you have to think outside the box a little bit on some of these cases. So to summarize, there still remain limited options. Both saphenous vein and PTFE are great choices. PTFE probably does better than we tend to think it does from a patency and infection standpoint, but it's still a secondary option. And it's helpful to be a little creative in your tunnel creation and innovative conduit use. Thanks so much, happy to take any questions. With the preamble that I'm way out of my depth here, um, just an observation that um, my vascular guys uh, who are pretty fashion forward um, have been using of late uh, bovine carotid for uh, for large vessels and for uh, young people. You know, I'm trying to remember the exact cases. They either replaced a, a traumatically injured iliac or maybe the lower segment of the aorta. And, you know, this is anecdotal, but it, it seems to be working. We have six-month follow-up on these two young people. So, and not, uh, cause I confused the two bovine pericardium, but, but this was, and they have done it and they've done some panel work with the bovine pericardium, but that seems to be a lot, a lot of work. But if I have it right, it seemed like they reached on the shelf mm -hmm. and they pulled the bovine carotid off the shelf and just started sewing. That's the artograph, sorry. That's the, that's the artograph. And it's, it's absolutely out there. It's, I think the question is what are we trying to accomplish, right? So. Is it, is it a better choice than saphenous? Probably not. Is it a faster choice than saphenous? Probably. What does it mean compared to PTFE though, that is cheaper, is also readily available? We don't have comparative data to suggest that one is better or worse than the other. I think it's an absolutely valid choice. My personal preference though, is until we have that data to use what's most cost efficacious. Hey, yeah, thank you, Roddy, uh, Robbie. Uh, good talk. <clears throat> and I thought the idea of the uh, tubularized bovine pericardium was really genius. I want to try that on the bench <laughs> and see how that works for me. Um, seeing Dr. Holcomb in the audience reminds me uh, that there is utility in taking the saphenous vein out of the amputated limb if mm -hmm. we're fortunate enough to uh, receive uh, all the body parts. And also, uh, what are your thoughts on just using PTFE to a tibial target as sort of a temporary shunt of sorts. And then uh, when the patient uh, proves to survive and uh, start to heal a little bit, then do, go on and doing a saphenous reconstruction. Yeah, so in terms of planned temporary use, I think we have so many options available to us, right? So um, using a Viabon as a planned temporary is I think still a little bit better choice than sewing on the PTFE. And while I've done that, I actually think taking a page from our um, ECMO and uh, Impella colleagues, a retrograde uh, micropuncture sheath through the DP to the contralateral um, femoral access or to a radial A-line hooked up with tubing goes a long ways towards temporary shunting that's a lot faster than having to sew. <laughs> Excuse me. So I worry about damage to soft tissue when I'm creating new spots to do temporary shunting. So I've, I've moved away from the idea of sewing something as a temporary shunt. I would rather just use an endovascular option or a percutaneous infusion catheter. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Um, so, so Robbie, I just wanted to congratulate you. Really a great and thoughtful presentation. And it just reminds me how hard it is to do the kind of clinical research you want to do in the setting of something like trauma and then vascular trauma, because everybody is sort of an N of one mm -hmm. and you try to make signal out of all the noise. And I think you presented that very, very well. And I just want to congratulate you. Um, in that regard, you know, putting this together, when you think about like conduit, like what conduit's efficient, I think the comments around off the shelf, PTFE off the shelf, artograph off the shelf, maybe someday humicide or other technologies off the shelf um, because there's time. And what I've, what I've also reasoned is when you think about cost, um, if you think the conduit's expensive, amputation is a lot more expensive. 
and just trying to figure out a way to measure that and then get your head wrapped around that. Like, and how you balance like the cost to the hospital versus the cost to the system. Tony, great, it's yeah. not a question, just. I'm glad it's not a question because I don't have any answers. <laughs> the, um, I think all we can do right now is comparative cost analysis within a strategy because we don't have the tools to look at what it means to offer different big picture strategies that well, I'd say. So I'm Adenauer from Brazil. First of all, great talk. And regard, regarding unusual grafts, Chuck said something about taking the, the saphenous vein from the amputated limb. And I read that paper and I did it different. I took the popliteal artery from the amputated limb. And I think it worked very well for that situation. So. Uh, sometimes taking the artery is even better than taking the saphenous vein because of the caliber and things like that. Um, and I would like to ask you a question. For carotid injuries, the classic thing is still to take the saphenous But I like using the external jugular. And I would like to hear what you think about it. Yeah, so... I think being creative is great. I absolutely completely agree. I, I will tell you, I tend to primarily do vein or PTFE. For internal carotid, it's saphenous vein all the way. But the second I'm talking about common carotid, I, I'm pretty low threshold to use PTFE on a common carotid. Sorry to everyone who's here, but anything that's super aortic trunk, first order branch, I, I PTFE all the way. Um, so one comment, one question. The comment is uh, the extracorporeal percutaneous shunt. It's great. I use it all the time for ALI uh, here, and it works great because it usually takes us six to eight hours to get them to the OR as a code one. Um, in terms of uh, the prosthetic conduits that you're describing, like humicide and all this, um, do you have any data on secondary patency for the humicide or for bovine artograft? No, for so, me, secondary patency for artograft is terrible. Yeah, the patency rates that we tend to report on all available alternative conduits are in the setting of dialysis access and even less so peripheral arterial disease. And I would say that the secondary, the patency rates on trauma indications are, are essentially non-existent at this point or close to it. Dr. Moore? Uh, very <clears throat> nice review. Um, uh, that was a great review on arterial system. Uh, what's your view on the venous system? Uh, you know, I see all these constant reports of ligating the infra renal uh, vena cava. And I, and I argue uh, we should be putting those patients on vena vena bypass and reconstructing that IVC. It's a morbid thing to do. They survive, but they get fasciotomy and they get prolonged uh, morbidity from their lower legs. So I'm curious what you would choose in the case of a venous injury for reconstruction. Yeah, I have the program in front of me, and I see at 2.52, there's a talk, vein ligation first reconstruction, so I'm going to be a little careful. I, I will give a sneak peek that I, I tend to be a strong proponent of venous reconstruction as well. I think we miss the sequelae of venous ligation because of selection bias and, and seeing those patients back. I also believe for size match reasons, low threshold to use PTFE for venous reconstruction uh, in, from my perspective. When you have a combined... SFA and femoral vein injury, I my go-to, unless it's a, a really strangely sized system, is saphenous for the artery and PTFE for the vein, even if I have sufficient length of saphenous to reconstruct the femoral vein. I think we try to, I have a hard time conceptually thinking about your body has a vein this big and it has a vein this big and I'm supposed to make one replace the other. I think we tend to undersize venous reconstruction when we force saphenous vein into the femoral position, and it leads to some of the reported outcomes around poor patency rates around femoral venous reconstruction that may have been sidestepped by use of a PTFE graft. Hey, Rishi. Hey, Riley. Uh, one of the situations that is the most frustrating are penetrating injuries that tag the iliac. Mm -hmm. So big vessel, gross contamination. Uh, do you attempt any kind of insight to anatomic-ish bypass, or do you go straight to a non-anatomic with PTFE? So thankfully, I mean, you pointed out the gunshot case, but I'll, I'll put blunt out there uh, as a start to the answer, because I think endovascular therapy is the solution there, right? Anything you can do to fix that artery without exposing it to the outside world. Um, but if you have to do open repair, <laughs> don't ever, please, hopefully this isn't being recorded, <laughs> I always approach that open repair 
as what is my endovascular bailout look like? And I have a low threshold for a few days later to putting a stent graft in. Honestly, if there's a follow-up CAT scan that looks at all funny, we've all taken care of patients with ruptured late pseudoaneurysms from hollow viscous contamination in a PTFE field. I think, what does it look like? Do I leave enough room? Do I need kissing stent grafts? What does the hypo look like? Am I sacrificing the hypo? Should I do that now to make sure I have seal zone if I need to salvage with the stent graft? Thanks, everybody. Dr. Rajani, opening up a Pandora's box there of oh, oh, sorry. things to do. So thank you, Dr. Rajani. Uh, next up on your uh, program, it says Dr. DuBose there, who uh, unfortunately, he's here and he's available. Um, so fantastic. So next up, we have uh, Dr. Joe DuBose talking to us about definitive endovascular repair of traumatic arterial injuries, is it time for an endovascular first approach across the board? Dr. DuBose. My name is Joe DuBose, and I'd like to thank Dr. Tal Hoare, Dr. Chuck Fox, and Dr. Rishi Kundi for the opportunity today to start uh, to talk about definitive endovascular repair of traumatic arterial injuries. Is it time for an endovascular first approach? These are my disclosures. I think when we're talking about uh, it, the treatment of vascular injury with an endovascular first approach, we, need, we can really utilize specific injuries as an example of how uh, this transition has taken place in certain areas. T-bar has largely replaced open repair for blunt thoracic aortic injury and has, has already emerged since 2005 in the introduction of uh, FDA approved devices for trauma indications as the standard of care. And the data clearly supports that this has been beneficial. The Aortic Trauma Foundation retrospective study, which we reported in 2015, demonstrated that T-bar over open repair was associated with lower transfusion requirements, lower overall mortality, and lower aortic-related mortality. Subsequent, several repairs have documented uh, this uh, benefit as well. Uh, among those I'm most familiar with, obviously, is the one led by Dr. Tom Scalia, presented at the American Surgical Association, which constituted an NTDB national sample study which documented an increase in T-VAR that was sig significant over the time frame studied, and with T-VAR nearly completely replacing open repair over that time frame. And the benefits were quite clear and demonstrated well through this study. Comparing open repair uh, to T-VAR, T-VAR was associated with decrease in morbidity, decrease in ICU and hospital length of stay, and decrease in mortality. And when propensity matched T-VAR between T-VAR and open patients, T-VAR had a 50% lower mortality. But what about other anatomic locations, particularly those that are challenging uh, to get to in, in the traumatic uh, arena? Uh, and I think that axosubclavian injuries are quickly emerging as another area where endovascular has emerged as potential standard of care. This has been documented through a couple of studies here, the first of which I'm familiar with from my own work in 2012 with a review of the published experience at this location. And what we found is that with follow-up periods ranging from hospital discharge to 70 months, there was a very nice patency uh, available uh, over that uh, duration of uh, post-operative follow-up. And when you look at uh, other studies, including the one conducted by Branco and reported in 2016 of two high-volume trauma centers, when you match patients with endovascular and open repair, endovascular repair at the axis of clavian locations associated with significantly lower in hospital mortality, lower rates of surgical side infections, and a trend towards lower sepsis rates. And finally, even a more recent study of uh, anatomic injuries at this location has demonstrated, again, conclusively that endovascular repair across a wide array of potential complications, morbidities, hospital outcomes that can be measured, and mortality, endovascular is simply uh, beneficial over open repair when it can be applied. And this also has, has emerged as a, a relative truth among uh, other anatomic locations, including iliac arteries, another junctional site. Uh, a recent study reported in 2021 showed that although most of these are blunt injuries that are treated, whenever endovascular repair can be brought to bear, it is associated with a lower amputation rate and improved outcomes. There are anatomical areas where endovascular does not necessarily, based upon the data we have available to us, makes much sense in terms of being our first line strategy. Among those are extremity artery injuries. And the reasons for this are myriad. We have very limited data. These are surgically accessible locations with proven uh, conduits that can be used for interposition repair in the form of saphenous vein graft or PTFE. 
and the, the ramifications of lifelong anticoagulation, antiplatelet and surveillance need in young trauma patients is clearly a detriment to the endovascular utilization liberally in those injuries. And I think following along with the uh, recent changes in vascular care for peripheral vascular disease, we've all come to appreciate that endovascular is not a panacea at, for uh, either atherosclerotic disease and probably for trauma in peripheral arterial locations. But the endovascular revolution is going to continue to grow. This is a great paper using Prove-It data that was presented by Greg McGee at the Pacific Coast Surgical Association. And what he found is there's been a 2% annual increase in endovascular use overall. And when examining those outcomes, mortality when endo can be applied is better across the board, particularly at thoracic and abdominal uh, locations. So my, in conclusion, I think an endovascular first strategy warrants some considerations uh, for vascular injuries. Um, it's proven it's worth at specific locations and in specific patients. Uh, but I think of a widespread liberalization of this policy really requires additional data and study. And I hope that that incites some discussion today at the meeting. And, and again, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not there to participate. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Dr. DeBose. We'll, we'll do some questions uh, during the panel discussion. Um, We'll bring all the uh, speakers back up, but we'll we'll jump right into our last uh, talk for this uh, session: endovascular management of peripheral trauma uh, by Dr. Anita Dua. Welcome to the podium. Thank you. Heels take a little extra second. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for having me back. Uh, my name is Anai Tadua. I'm a vascular surgeon at Mass General, um, and I love peripheral trauma, so I'm excited to be talking to you about that today. So let's start out with talking about why the endovascular revolution is so important. Essentially, the beauty of endovascular is it allows you to get to places that are hard to reach, that you could potentially do, but it's just difficult to actually go ahead and be able to get there. And if you have a better option, you should be able to use that to get the patient what they need. So in talking about peripheral trauma, I'm really going to, because it's only six minutes, talk about kind of the two big areas that cause the biggest issues with peripheral trauma. So starting out with the subclavian and axillary area is really one of the, the most dangerous areas that a patient can be injured. I don't have to tell that to this crowd. Um, in the United States, at least, gunshot wounds are the most common mechanism of injury, and there's a, a significant morbidity mortality associated with that, up to 30%. Um, and that's inclusive of data from the uh, open into the endovascular uh, revolution. At this point, um, over the last decade, we've seen a massive increase in the utilization of endovascular therapy for this type of injury. It's now greater than 9%. That data is actually from about five years ago. So the best way to talk about these cases is to talk about the actual cases. Instead of showing you a lot of uh, um, data about how these injuries end up, I want to talk to you about three interesting cases that specifically had um, axillary injury for the first two and the last one a tibial. So this is a patient that was 28 years old who had a history of FMD. So um, she had basically arteries that were a little bit more frail than they should be and was wrestling with her brother and suddenly had severe pain in the left upper extremity in conjunction with numbness. She was found um, to be, you know, pale and at the scene they called 911 and took her to an urgent care where she basically passed out. She was found to be tachycardic to the 140s, hypotensive. She was intubated and transferred to MGH. And when she was seen at that time, um, she was noted to have a very large asymmetric swelling on the left side of her neck. Um, she was stabilized and I'll show you the scan here. It'll play. So just take a look at that left side. Okay. And so at this point, given the fact that she had such a large hematoma in that area, it was a difficult spot to get to. Um, we opted to approach her in an endovascular fashion. She's not ideal for a patient with FMD, but in this traumatic situation, we felt was the safest thing to get her stabilized to control the bleeding. So this is where the endovascular revolution really helped out because it allows us to do basically this case in about 20 minutes. I mean, it took more time to get her up to the operating room and get her set up with anesthesia, as per usual, than do the case. Um, so I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, slides depicting what we did. So to begin with, we did get groin access, and we also got left brachial access with uh, micropuncture um, just right over the uh, elbow area. Um, initially did the angiogram, as you can see. There's um, active extra up top. 
from that subclavian. So we had uh, wire access coming from that left brachial. And the reason that we did that is because we wanted to ensure that we were in the true lumen and that we could get through and through access. And then we snared the wire, um, which was a glide, from the uh, patient's left brachial access down into the descending aorta and then pulled through and through access. And you can basically turn a glide wire into a Lunderquist by having two people hold both ends and then um, be able to uh, basically deliver anything over that wire, uh, which is what we ended up doing. So you can see this is the snaring here and pulling it right through the groin. Um, because we had that initial shot, we were able to do all of our measurements and knew that we were probably gonna use, well, we were gonna use a covered stent um, in this particular location, which is standard of care. You can see the stent being placed here. And that's it there opened up. Then we'll show you a final run here. So again, the, the point of this is not to show you, I mean, it, it's not a difficult case. So this is not to say, oh, this is so hard to do. It's actually easy, but that's the point. In peripheral trauma, when you have a situation that would otherwise have required thoracotomy, sternotomy, you have something you can do in essentially 20 minutes that's controlled the bleeding. And then if you need to, go ahead and evacuate the hematoma. So in talking about what type of stent you use and what type of um, uh, important factors you need to take into consideration for endo, specifically, um, if you're dealing with the peripherals, flexibility is important, especially if it's more distal. So the Vibons are excellent. They're self-expanding. They're covered stents made by Gore. VBX is uh, balloon expandable covered stents, which are excellent for precision. So if you're getting um, into the iliacs, um, the common iliac that is not the external, or if you're um, more uh, proximal with your um, chest in that area, uh, VBX is an excellent option. And again, um, in the terms of sizing, one-to-one -one is, is, is decent. And a patient with FMD, definitely one-to-one -one, as you don't want to oversize. Now, really important for this type of a case is what do you do about the vert? So um, in this patient's case, we were able to, to um, determine from her original scan what side vert dominant she had and then ensure that we could save it. But um, if you have a patient that's um, having active extravasation, you do want to, of course, control that. So you can't do the standard technique of being able to put a covered stent and then a bare metal stent and then another covered stent and telescope them into each other to allow for flow. You can do that if you have um, an injury, like a dissection, for example, in the iliac, and you want to leave the internal uncovered. You can put a bare metal stent in between the bridge. That doesn't work when you have a rupture or you have a frank bleeding. Obviously, in that case, you have to put a covered stent all the way across. Um, just to show you, I promised no data, but I'll just show you a little bit. So a couple of studies just to point out that essentially um, multiple papers have come out showing that when you do use um, stenting for the uh, subclavian injuries, it appears to have a lower um, improved rate of mortality and also um, lower complication rates. You do have to follow the patients. You do have to do ultrasounds. You may have to do an intervention, but it's worth it in um, this patient population and especially with the beautiful stents that we have out currently. Now, the next one I want to show you is um, actually Dr. DeVos. I know he's not here, but um, this is one of his papers, basically, and Dr. Scalia, who is here, um, basically saying that this idea that was talked about earlier by, by Dr. Rajani, that if you do have breakdown of like an anastomosis, for example, that you've done open or pseudoaneurysm in that area, then a stent is, again, a great option. You can make the argument, obviously, this is someone that might be infected, but in that particular point in time, so even if you had an aortoenteric fistula, getting a stent across it to control the bleeding, and then it buys you time and allows you to plan. So this is a patient um, that was a 34-year-old that had a gunshot wound to the right chest, significant blood loss, hypotensive, um, was uh, brought in and was noted to have a very faint radial pulse. Um, CT scan here, this, is, this case is a little bit different than the last one because here we had significant arterial and venous injury. And so how, how do we manage something like this in a very large hematoma? And hard to tell what's coming from where, obviously. So this is just some of the preoperative imaging. We did have enough time to do that. And so we have multiple options here. Again, you've got venous and arterial injury in a location that's you can get to it, but should you get to it if there are other options? Um, we knew that we ultimately would need to evacuate that hematoma, but just going right into it would not be ideal. So we opted to do a hybrid approach for this patient came from the left femoral um, artery to get uh, access initially, took a look at what was going on. This is arterial now, so we're not looking at the vein yet. And decided that a, a, a VBX stent would be an ideal option for this. And this we were able actually to deliver coming from the arm again, um, because you, up, you can basically put up to an eight French sheath. I, I usually do cut downs because um, I find it to be after doing all this work, you don't want to break your sheath hematoma and all the drama that comes with that. But in a quick situation, you can at least stick, do this part, and then do a cut down and repair after that. Once we put the VBX stent in, sorry, um, we then went on to uh, look at the vein. Now, as you can see, the vein um, had significant issues as well. 
So at this point, I mean, we didn't obviously stent the vein. We did, in, in this case, realize that we had to come in and evacuate the hematoma anyway, but now with the arterial flow um, uh, managed, we were able to get distal and proximal control um, with the vein so that we could then enter the hematoma. We had no bleeding, and then we're able to tie off the two ends. And so this is, again, not to say this is such a fancy case. It's actually pretty simple, but the idea of being able to bring the hybrid approach in, which is really the new thing, it's no longer endo versus open, it's endo and open to get the best outcome, which is why the vascular surgeons and uh, trauma team, um, you know, work too well. And ultimately, the patient had a great result. Um, and uh, uh, again, only one month follow-up, but survived and um, is doing well. Anticoagulation postoperatively, we're pretty liberal. And aspirin plavix right away. And sometimes I'll keep these patients on a heparin drip, especially if I've done venous work as well. Really have no issue with bleeding, um, which I'll talk to you about later on when I talk to you about TEG. <laughs> And then the last case, just very quickly. So the other place that's big drama when you have injury is the tibial area. Because you're looking at doing major bypasses, a lot of times they're femoral fractures as well. It's just a difficult thing to do. And these patients may get amputated and can be ischemic. Um, but this was just a very uh, straightforward case that was uh, a unique way of using endovascular. So we had a patient that was a professional knight who um, basically got stabbed in the leg, had, <clears throat> had a break. And when he had a repair done by our orthopedic colleagues, he had a... Uh, uh, injury with a nail through his tibial. You can see that pseudo over there, and you can see the nail that probably nicked it. Um, he had a big X fix on. I mean, this is not a guy we're doing a bypass to. So the original option was, you know what, he's got three vessel runoff. Why not just coil embolize and take it out? But I've actually done some work that Dr. Fox mentored me through, and then Dr. Holcomb did with me in UT that showed we shouldn't be knocking off vessels that we should, that we need. And so instead, what I ended up doing was used a covered coronary stent in this area. Um, there's a little bit of a dissection plane, but it's fine, and the patient did well overall. The problem with using covered coronary stents is it's actually not meant to be for humans, which is interesting. So if you do use it, you have to fill out all this FDA paperwork and all this garbage afterwards, but it's very much worthwhile. And there's a lot more data coming out now from the vascular world about stenting the tibials and it being okay. We still are touchy about it, but you know it can be done if it has to be done. So overall, this patient also did well. ABIs are still one, and um, um, we just continue to follow him with ultrasound. And if that does go down, ultimately, he's got two vessel runoff. But in that period of time, we were able to control the bleeding and ensure that he didn't need anything further beyond uh, just putting the stent in. Thank you very much. Um, if I could invite all our speakers uh, back to the podium, we're going to do a... Nope, we're going to keep it going. Okay. Well, um, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Dua, sure. uh, for your time. And uh, any questions before we move forward? All right. We will move on to our next session. Yes, sir. Please. We have a bunch of questions. And it, it's really for Dr. Dua and, and for our good friend, Dr. DuBose. Dr. Dua, that was a brilliant presentation. Um, so, you know, and the, I do have to say, I was talking to my friend Tal here. We think that's the first butt floss a slide at EVTM or possibly it's a trauma meeting. <laughs> yeah, no. We can't do it at meet, so but but it, it's a good analogy, right? So difficult to reach reach places. So this is a question about training, right? So I'm with you on the most difficult to and, and Joe's talk also, right? It's definitely the it's definitely the right application for endo. But as we move further and further into the periphery, our trainees are forgetting how to sew. Right, so now we have trainees that go straight path vascular, no more general surgery, and you know, and and the trauma medical director is looking at new vascular graduates that can't so open. So how do we, you know, as we're doing this, and look, his data was all endo is almost invariably invariably better, except for the real periphery. How do we make up for the training deficit? Oh, there's one word: simulation. It has to be. I mean, there there is no way around it. We we you know. <laughs> Not that we do, but you, we can't just do things open, um, you know, and, and do thor especially something like thoracotomy, sternotomy, because we want to train the trainee. Um, and as we know, you know, doing it one time isn't good enough anyway, which is why a lot of the argument about animal models is that it doesn't work not, you know, from a PETA perspective, but from a you do it once, the pig is done, and how you, what have you really done? What's your return on investment? So I think we as a community have to say simulation is the way to go. And it's not just about the sewing, because sewing is hard or, or, or not hard based on your exposure, which is really what we have to train them and what they're actually, you know, have to be, you know, 
um, exposed to. Some of the options can be, as we have networks like this, a global situation where you can send people to different locations, but even that's not ideal. So I think at the end of the day, a good investment in excellent simulation. And the sad thing is they really do exist. They just cost a lot of money. And so we have to agree as a community that that's the way that we need to train them and then actually bring it into our paradigm and test to make sure that we're able to get the outcomes that we want and then ultimately let people fly. That would be my answer to that. Excellent. Of course. Very quick uh, question. Anna Girardi from uh, Italy, International Radiologist. And uh, uh, which is your experience with the balloon expandable stand? Uh, did you ever have uh, cases with the retrograde uh, dissection or not? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, so the balloon expandable stents, it depends on what the pathology is, right? If so, if I'm just, if it's a healthy vessel, so let's say a trauma patient, right? So not talking about PAD, not, not arthrosclerosis. In a trauma patient, I do one-to-one -one sizing exactly, and I don't oversize at all. If I do use the VBXs, you know, the 8L VBXs, you can post-dilate up to a 16. So I'll put one of those, especially if you're coming from the arm, because that'll at least go through an 8. Put that into the uh, um, the iliacs, for example, and then I come from the groin and just hold it in place really gently with a balloon down below so that it doesn't fall, and then come with a bigger balloon if I can and, and re-expand that up and over because you can't come from the arm then. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. I know we're not supposed to discuss anything, but I can't uh, resist. <clears throat> I've said in numerous forums that a uh, way to train the new generation and the vascular vascular surgeons, <clears throat> as well as the trauma surgeons, is to do hemodialysis access. You can sew a two and a half millimeter vein into a calcified two and a half millimeter artery. I guarantee you, pop it to your artery, you can do blindfolded. That's completely true. The problem is we have to fight the transplant surge. So at MGH, they don't allow the, not don't allow, but vascular doesn't do any uh, dialysis access because they're now starting to take over. So that's part of the problem too with us, but which is a good point. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next session. Oh, we got chairs now. <laughs> That's nice. We do. So I'm uh, Greg McGee, and I have the pleasure to introduce um, our first speaker in this session, which is Dr. Raul Cohenboy, talking about endovascular repair, peripheral vascular injuries, 15 years of evolution and care. Dr. Cohenboy. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank uh, Chuck, uh, Rishi, Tao, and Tom for the kind invitation. So I, I figured that um, most of you would present some data published in the literature, although there is very little, and as you heard, uh, most are small case series and no randomized trials or anything of that nature. So I decided to show you some real data, at least of what's happening in this country since 2010. So basically the methodology was to look at the national inpatient sample from 2010 to 2018, which has about 50 million records. Uh, and through ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes, we found the number of acute injury cases. Quite frankly, this is the largest series uh, that's out there, 17,000 patients, 15,000 open, uh, and uh, 1,800 endovascular. And these are exclusively stent in acute repair of vascular trauma. This is no embolization, no other endovascular stuff. This is really flow restoration by stent placement. And uh, we look at some outcomes data and uh, then the temporal evolution, how these things are happening. And to confirm this data, I look at the TICWIP database, which is exclusively from trauma centers in the United States, use the same methodology. There are 7,000 cases or so uh, in TICWIP uh, from 2016 to 2019, so much more recent period with about 600 cases of endovascular repair. Again, only stents, treatment in the index hospitalization. So this is not <clears throat> chronic or late AV fistula management or pseudoaneurysm that's expanding three months after injury. And then look at the temporal evolution as well. So let's start by nominate and subiclavian arteries, as you can see. Whether you look at the national inpatient sample or the TQIP data, uh, this is very interesting because the endovascular 
approach is taking over from, from the open repair, not quite yet, but moving in that direction. And on the right side, you see some outcomes data and uh, uh, patients treated in the vascular had higher injury severity score, new injury severity score, and much less fasciotomies and uh, decreased mortality, although cost is comparable. Now, if you look at the temporal evolution, those lines have crossed. When you look at national inpatient sample data, uh, TQIP not, not quite yet, but as you heard, uh, it's probably the right thing to do for subclavian and innominate artery injury. Auxiliary is not quite there yet. Uh, we talk a lot about subclavian and auxiliary, but if you look at auxiliary artery exclusively, about 20% are done endovascularly. Uh, and as you can see on the right side, there is no, in terms of outcome measures, there is no advantage demonstrable at this point of endovascular over open, including cost and uh, amputation, fasciotomy, et cetera. And here is the temporal evolution. Knees on the left, CQIP on the right. Those lines are tending to cross, but they are not quite there yet. So therefore, this is not the standard of, of care at this point. At least the practice in the country. Brachial, uh, about 1% being done uh, in the vascular. I don't think there is any reason to do that. Uh, and as you can see, uh, short of a much lower incidence of fasciotomy, on the endovascular group, all the other outcome measures are comparable. And as you can see, the lines are not tending to cross at all. In the iliacs, about 27% in the knees and 20% in the TQIP uh, data are done endovascularly. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, the endovascular management carries a much lower uh, rate of fasciotomy and uh, also death during the hospitalization was lower, although cost was higher in the iliac. Uh, remember that these are patients that are, they have other significant injuries as well. And the lines are tending to, to cross at some point in the future, uh, at least in looking at the NIST data, not in the TQIP data. Uh, but again, uh, we are not there yet. And because of the nature of these injuries, primarily in penetrating injuries with associated uh, injuries, uh, these cases are primarily done open. Femoral artery, about 10% are done endovascular in the country uh, since 2010. Uh, and, and as you can see, uh, much lower incidence of fasciotomy and certainly a shorter length of stay, primarily in cases that have isolated extremity injury favor endovascular repair, although the uh, use of the endovascular approach is uh, very small. And here are the uh, trend lines for NIS and TQIP over time. And finally, for popliteal artery, the minority are done endovascular, about 6% in the NIS and 9% in the, in the TQIP data set. Uh, here you can see that uh, Patients that are done, done open have a higher injury severity score, primarily because they must have associated fractures. Uh, fasciotomy uh, rate is much lower in, if you treat them endovascularly, and the length of stay is obviously lower in isolated lower extremity injuries if you treat them endovascularly, although cost is not uh, decreased and uh, 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 compartment syndrome is comparable. And here are the trend lines. So looking at this from a 30,000 foot view, and that's the reason I'm presenting this to you, is to give you ideas. Where is this field going and where are the opportunities to do this end of ass or to continue doing this open? So compared to open repair, the way I read this data is that in the vascular case, particularly stents, are the minority 7 to 10%. Mostly are done in the nominate and subclavian uh, arteries. Cost data is very mixed. Length of stay, which would be a tremendous advantage to keep these people in the hospital as little as possible, is not superior overall. Obviously, these are patients with multiple injuries and there is a lot of other factors there. Less fasciotomies and shorter length of stay in femoral and popliteal have, have been documented. There is super, superiority may be in isolated injuries and stable patients, which is not particularly common in this patient population and not yet common enough to change the standard of care. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Cormer. Any questions, Rishi? Dr. Cormer, um, when I see two modalities, endo and open, and at least in the axillary subclavian, endo has every indication of having superior outcomes, but that the utilization of endovascular is much lower, that says to me it's a resource problem, that these injuries are being cared for in places where either the physical resources are not supporting endovascular or that vascular surgeons are not making themselves sufficiently available and the relationship is not there uh, for that to be the go-to for trauma surgeons. Would you, do you think that's accurate? Well, I, th I think that's a fair statement. I just think that for the example that you use, the subiclave, and actually the lines crossed. <clears throat> so endovascular is, is being done more often in recent years compared to the open access. And I think uh, that's been a consensus, at least on the presentations that we heard this morning. The other, the other sites, though, I think it's still debatable. Uh, I think it's an abuse of ut resource utilization to use endovascular approach to repair a brachial artery, <laughs> to be honest with you. So that's the reason I present this data, because we need to look at this. Chuck and I are having this conversation virtually about the algorithms for the Western Trauma Association, peripheral vascular trauma. And this data suggests that we, we can't say, well, you can use them indistinctly because that's not what's happening in the country. So, uh, but, but I think that in some of those locations, uh, obviously the lines will tend to cross over time. We are just not there yet. Well, the, the fasciotomy data is fascinating to me. And the question, do you think it's not so much that one uh, favorite, you know, the, the, that it's better, you have less ischemia with the endo. It's if you're doing an open case, you're there. So you're going to throw a prophylactic, and there's data now that says maybe, well, maybe we're doing too much fasciotomies. So do you think it's, it's the fact that we're there and we're doing the fasciotomies versus the patients in the IR suite or a hybrid place someplace, and they're nowhere near an operating room so they don't get a fasciotomy? I really do. I, I really, really do. You know, I, I've thought long enough about this um, for 30 years. Why are we doing fasciotomy? So th this issue of prophylactic fasciotomy is based on ischemia time is inexact, inexact science. Some people say four hours, some people say six hours, but we really do not know. And, 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 and the fact that you are there and you say, this guy has been ischemic for six hours, I revascularize, the muscles feel, feel a little tough. I, I'm, I think I'm going to do a fascia. <laughs> I think those are the cases that are being avoided if you get to them at the same time. So again, based on the previous question, availability, you're available. It's right there. The resource is available and you do it endovascularly. You're not going to do a fasciotomy because you're not doing it open. I think those are, those are the differences here. But the comparison has to be apples to apples, right? Endovascular and open done at the same time time frame in the same in the index admission immediately after resuscitation so it's complicated to to distill this to dissect this out but i i believe the fact that we are not opening the leg uh doing open act, uh, approaches will prevent us from doing pre uh, prophylactic fasciotomies i have a quick question dr corma that was a great um summary of the data that exists on what the current status is of what people are doing my question is, um, does the fact that uh, uh, th these are the current ratios uh, of what's being done in the community mean that endo should not be done more frequently? Or is it just a reflection of what's actually current practice? We had a whole session on ECMO and trauma where clearly that's not, um, not everyone is doing that. So that we're at the vanguard here. That's uh, my question for you. No, I don't think this data suggests that we should not be doing this. I think this data suggests what the current practice is and the trends of what's about to come. Uh, but I think we can reflect on this data and the outcome data in particular and decide that there are some uh, arterial injuries that don't deserve endovascular, the endovascular approach and the endovascular expenditure. Should we be... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yes. Should we be training our trauma fellows to be getting more proficient at doing these endovascular procedures to have a higher rate of 
adopting this process rather than just leaving it to our vascular colleagues? Yeah, I, I, I hope I don't get into that debate. Uh, there's been a lot of debate recently. Uh, <laughs> That's stuff my best Dr. DeBose. Between, between vascular surgeons and, and, and trauma surgeons. I am one of them. I am a trauma surgeon with vascular training, and I only train in vascular to be a better vas better trauma surgeon. And I've repaired all the arteries at UC San Diego for 23 years, and now where I am in Riverside, I, I do them the same. Um, and I never need vascular because I was trained in vascular surgery. So I think I think we should be training vascular it, uh, trauma <coughs> surgeons in vascular repair uh, because there are not uh, enough vascular surgeons available to be there at three o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, I, I think, uh, but I think that the debate's too heated now for us to solve that today. Thank you. <laughs> I think. Well, one, um, one last quick comment. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, in that vein, I have one more question then. Uh, in terms of vascular trauma, in terms of uh, n the number of cases needed to be proficient, uh, is it enough to just train someone to use a catheter and a wire? Or do they have to do this electively and chronically and all the time to stay proficient? Yeah, I, I really don't know the answer. Um, I know that um, there are not enough cases for vascular fellows to do open either. So <laughs> there you have it. It goes both ways. Thank you very much, Dr. Quinn. Thank, Thank you. you. The next presentation is Endovascular Management of Penetrating Trauma by Dr. Fernando Hoblar. Thank you, Ravi. And I guess we'll add some more fuel to the fire. Um, so these are my disclosures. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. So we, it's been mentioned, you know, penetrating arterial, uh, arterial injury. One to 2% of all trauma patients, not all trauma patients, but 20% of trauma-related deaths. And you can divide it into peripheral and central injuries. And for the purposes of uh, this discussion, I am going to include axillary subclavian, not as peripheral, but as, as central injuries, because they're more in the trunk, not, not in the extremities. So we've seen the use of stent grafts in vascular trauma, mostly for blunt. What about penetrating? What about in those areas that Dr. Uh, Dua mentioned that it's a little bit harder to get access to? So, you know, when you're dealing with the axial subclavian, you have to do a sternotomy, thoracotomy combination. If you have an endo option and you have the equipment and the expertise, which I think is really the issue, not everybody has this. No trauma center has an in-house trauma surgeon. We do when I'm on call. Um, but usually for penetrating, you, we first serve this for patients who are stable. If they can get some pre-op imaging, you can get some measurements to see if you have the stents necessary. Um, so what's the key to success in trauma? We know this, stop the bleeding. That's the key to success in trauma. So if you can do it in a less invasive manner with minimal blood loss, why shouldn't we look into this? So there are, and the, uh, Dr. Rose showed some of them, studies that show lower mortality compared to open repair uh, with penetrating injuries. So we wanted to describe this because we started doing this and look back and see, is, is this right? Or should, should we be doing this? Um, so we looked at uh, since January 2011, because the first case I actually did, a thoracic case, was for a pseudoaneurysm, was for a gunshot wound that the cardiothoracic surgeon didn't want to operate. So we did that. It was a January 5, 2011, and then we kept going. And I've already mentioned our, our setting, and it was an RB-approved protocol. So 14,000 admissions in a period of 10 years, only 16 patients received an endovascular repair of a penetrating arterial injury. 10 subclavians, four aortas, one renal artery, one vertebral artery. Mm. In the subclavians, mostly on the left, and all were uh, all had a successful endovascular repair. The aortas as well, four endovascular repairs, the renal artery, and the vertebral artery. So this was a 17-year-old patient. As I mentioned, we got patients from Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. From the Virgin Islands, gunshot wound through the left neck, came out of the chest, and he came in about a day and a half later. 
He, we got a CT scan. He had a pseudoaneurysm with an AV fistula. We did an open approach, uh, like Dr. Dua, I do. I'm, uh, if I do an eight French or a nine French, I'm doing a cut down on that brachial. And usually it's easier to go retrograde. So we went retrograde. You can see his G, uh, JVD, he had a thrill from the fistula. And uh, well, I can't get it to run. So he had a pseudoaneurysm fairly large with a fistula and an isolated left vertebral artery coming off the aorta. So it was a good coincidence. We were able to do a repair without uh, covering the vertebral artery. Um, and the patient went home several days later. We saw him for one month follow-up. This is a right subclavian injury. You can see the large hematoma and this pseudoaneurysm on the CT scan. Doesn't look as impressive on the, on the angio but you're able to do it with a endovascular technique fairly easily. We can do this for transections or for pseudoaneurysms. This is a left-sided injury. You can see the bullet there and do a fairly successful repair. What about patients who come in more emergently? This patient came in when I was on call. He had multiple gunshot wounds. He had actually uh, ALL, uh, leukemia survivor. He had had a med port on that side. I took him to the OR, dealt with his uh, small bowel and large bowel perforations. He had a pulse on that side. He was not bleeding, but when we put him on the table for the laparotomy, he started bleeding from there. So we put a Foley catheter, temporized it, did damage control, resuscitated him, took him to the CT scan with a Foley, saw the injury. I had tried to do a, an exposure while I was in the OR. I'm a back surgeon. I can do this, but ran into the, the adherences from the med port and the whole thing. So I'm like, let, let me stop. Let me see what I can do here. And I took him. He had a transection. I did a combined femoral and brachial approach. And usually I'd cross those. We have about 17 cases. I've only had to use the snare once. You can use an angle taper and a glide cath, and you'll get through. Um, and I was able to do the retrograde. You put a large sheath. You can go into the sheath through your wire. Oh, they come back. And uh, we put in a, a biobon. This is a thoracic injury, a posterior injury. Uh, CT surgeon by that time had retired. We don't have a CT surgeon at university now, so I get called for all these, and we were able to do a repair. I love the, the anorex cuff. To me, that was the best thing. I'm, I miss it so much. This is that last one that was placed uh, that we were able to find for this patient. He had a gunshot wound to the flank. He had a, a initial CT scan. They didn't see a pseudoaneurysm. Neurology was, uh, urology was following him. They do a repeat CT scan three days later, large pseudoaneurysm. They didn't want me to do it open because they would have had to take out the kidney. They didn't want to do that. We did an endovascular repair and the patient did fine. He moved to the uh, US after Maria. So I've lost him to follow up now. And this is a right renal injury in a patient who already had a laparotomy. They didn't uh, notice anything wrong. They did post-up CT scan and I was able to go in, cannulate from below and put a 2.5 centimeter long stent graft. Um, so these are patients, again, they're young. These have a higher ISS than our blunt thoracic aortic injury patients. The median was 75 because most have more than one gunshot wound. So actually, most of them are actually pretty sick. Uh, we have had no issues, no access complications. The follow-up for penetrating injury is much worse than for blunt, unfortunately. Uh, these are the devices we used. As I mentioned, uh, sometimes uh, aortic extension cuffs. Uh, one C tag and two gore overlapping cups. I miss that anorex. And then the subclavians, usually the BB, uh, the biobond, we have used the BBX and the biobond for the renal and one vertebral injury. So if the patient is stable and you can get a CT scan, at least in our place, we can get the graft and do it. We actually have in stock of that at the cardiovascular center. So it's not the same issue as the aortic injuries. Um, we've had two deaths. They were both in actual subclavian injury patients because obviously they had pulmonary issues. One died of post sub day six, one died of post sub day 35. Um, and then obviously they have a tendency to be lost to follow up. So we can do this. Um, I think the issue is the availability of having people who know how to do this and having the necessary equipment to be able to do this. So obviously we need more follow up for these patients. Can these be applied to unstable patients? Again, if you have a hybrid OR, your trauma center. I wish I had one. I wish I didn't have to take it to the cardiovascular center. We just got a C-arm. So I'm hoping I'm able to take the care of these patients there. Um, obviously, limitations for us are the small sample size, the follow-up, and issues with the local politics. <laughs> so these are our references. And thank you. And that's my four-year-old. I'm trying to convince him not to be a surgeon. Thank you, Fernando. I I've known you a long time and I consider you one of the world's greatest people, but you're the first person I've ever heard to say two things. 
one, I miss the anurex and crap. <laughs> And two, you're the only person I've ever known who had a hybrid room before you had a C arm, which I think is an amazing journey. <laughs> Questions from the audience. Fernando, I have a question. So uh, right over here. <laughs> um, so what do you, what things do you do differently for penetrating injuries than blunt injuries? So for penetrating, if a patient comes in unstable, well, it will go to the OR, right? For the, uh, these patients, they usually have to be still enough to get a CT scan, and then we can get some identif identify the injury and get the measurements so I can get the graft. So that's the big difference. We're not there that yet that I can take the patient to the OR and do the stand graft there, except that one I showed where we put the Foley catheter in, then got the CT, and I was able to get everything going. The blunt patients are a little different. In fact, I was talking to Ravi yesterday. We, I had a patient who came in. I was on trauma call last Saturday. Comes in, I get two patients, same car, really bad seatbelt signs, blunt trauma. I take them both to the OR. They both had ischemic colon, the sigmoid, avulsion injury. But one, his lap band was down here, so he had injury to both common iliac arteries. So I go in thinking I'm gonna do easy and an open interposition repair. But when I go in, a lot of fecal contamination, the patient had distal palpable pulses, no mild perfusion. So I just said, I'm gonna deal with the bowel and then I'm gonna do endo. So I did that and did the boater bag, they was taken back, and then I was able to get the grafts and take them later. So the blunt, in my opinion, you, you can't compare blunt and penetrating. But in our series, the penetrating, you saw the median ISS. They, they're not getting shot once, they're getting shot multiple times. So you have to deal with those other injuries. And in that sense, like what we did here, we usually deal blood, then feces, and urine, you know, that's you know, when we're opening up. I say, no, deal with the bowel. I can temporize, uh, uh, if I can, the vascular injury. And if I wish I had the capability to use endografts as uh, a shunts, um, because I think that would be helpful in some of these cases. But uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if I answered your question, but it, it, they're different animals. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first is that I've gotten in the habit of getting radial access and then snaring from below, which one removes the need for a cut down, but also from below, I will use just a 10 centimeter, eight, nine French sheath because of the stability that the, the body flossing allows. Um, second one is a question. I know that Ravi and I fall on different sides of this. Do you open the hematoma after you've done the endo repair? No, that's a great question. So I'll go with that first. I actually don't, because usually they will have um, brachial plexus injury and a venous injury. And I tend to leave those alone. The feedback I've gotten from the, when they eventually go for a nerve uh, transfer surgery or later, is that that's great because there's less problems for us when we're doing that. So I tend not to. Um, I had one open case where the patient had a, a, a venous uh, air embolism and I'm, I'm worried of that. So I don't routinely drain the hematomas. Um, your first question was when I started doing these cases, I started doing them in an IR suite. And back then it, they were high profile, the biobonds. So you needed eight, nine French sheets. So I just started doing brachial cut down because it was easier and then I didn't have to worry about it. I've also found it's easier to go retrograde, especially when you have those dissections, thrombosis, and even with the transections. Now that we have lower profile, I will go femoral and then either brachial or percutaneous. But when I started doing this, I usually did both cut downs because what I do is once I cross the lesion and transections, I can get the wire and pu push out the sheath rather than do the snare and then just put it the dilator and put it on again. Um, it, I did, I will admit, and he's usually you can do it. The last case, we have about 17 cases. The last one I did, it, for purposes, I'm, I'm like, everybody's doing snare, so I'll just do it. I just wor always worry about a theoretical issue of pulling something into the vessel. But yeah, I, I do agree. But when I started, it was because of the profile of the larger sheath size is necessary. Yeah, I'll tell you, Rich, I 100% I snare. I do it every time. I, I plan on doing it because I think in the grand scheme, it saves me time. And I think it's faster. But my question for you to wrap up, uh, Fernando, we talked, I think it's, it's, it's great to hear your story. And I think it has so much applicability to anyone here because I think a lot of this does happen in resource, relatively resource poor environments sometimes. But I've never heard you speak about, um, I've never had a chance to ask you about the rest of your team. You know, we've all been in the situation where you're the only one in the room who knows what a wire even is. Do you have a team that helps you with this on a regular basis or is it always retraining 
from scratch over and over. So initially, that's when I was in IR, the team was just a resident and myself. We had nobody to help us scrub. So that's why I'm thankful for the cardiovascular center hybrid suite. When I started, it was a challenge because I did my EVARs there and you know all my day stuff, vascular stuff there. So I helped train the people. And now it's great because they know what wires to get and everything while I'm running around trying to get everything ready. Um, the drawback to that now is that they use a hybrid OR in the teams for TAVIs, mitral clips, and now cases come in and have to wait till that's done. So that's a challenge. But I agree 100%. If you have a team that knows what they're doing, it helps you a lot, especially in these cases. I do uh, part-time at the VA for aneurysms and everything else. And there, it's like every case is a first case because you have to continually train people, it can get in your nerves. But having a, a trained team, definitely, that's the way to go. We had a question earlier about, is there enough vascular surgeons in the world? And I will, I will also say it's, it's more than just the provider, right? I think there are vascular surgeons who get a gunshot wound to the subclavian artery in the middle of the night, and they, ha they feel compelled to do it open because they don't always feel like the staff support is there to do some sort of endovascular intervention in many hospitals in this country. I, I, I can see that. I mean, I don't know the number of trauma surgeons in the U.S., but we know the number of vascular surgeons in the U.S. is limited, and not all of them like trauma like we do. Um, so it, I know it's an issue, and I don't want to get into controversies, but I do agree it's a training issue, as was mentioned before. Um, I've had the issue that I'm the only vascular surgeon that covers our trauma center. There's two of us at the university system. So if my trauma surgeons didn't know how to deal with peripheral arterial injuries and know how to do open repairs, I wouldn't be able to live, basically. I wouldn't be able to breathe. So I agree that training is necessary. And I'm disheartened because I've had some of our trainees as residents who know how to do this go to a training program in the U.S. for a fellowship for trauma, critical care, and come back and all of a sudden they're afraid or they can't do it because they didn't let them do it in a fellowship. I, I'm like, no, let's go back. They'll call me. I'll help them through it and get them at, back up to speed, which I think was kind of what Mark DeMoya was saying in his publication that sparked a lot of controversy. I think it's there's cases for everybody. I think trauma and vascular should work together. Do I think everybody who deals with trauma should have vascular experience? Yes. Who better to stop the bleed, right? Um, but I know I'm preaching to the choir, so thank you. Thanks, Fernando. Do we have the next presentation for Dr. DeBose? Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, Dr. DeBose's uh, talk on definitive endovascular repair of traumatic arterial injuries. Sorry. I think it back, sorry. Direct site endovascular repair of arterial injuries. Is it time to remove the suture line failures from vascular injury repair? My name again is Joe DeBose. And again, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk today about direct site endovascular repair of arterial injuries. Is it time to remove suture line failures from vascular injury repair? These are my disclosures again. I'm going to talk specifically about this direct site endovascular repair technique and its ability to really potentially assist in areas of contamination and vascular repair. This is the doomsday scenario of the vascular injury in the form of an iliac artery injury and an enteric artery injury. And the arterial repairs conducted in this environment have the increased risk of potential devastating complications, including uh, early repair thrombosis, infection, and, and most dramatically suture line disruption leading to subsequent rebleeding, exsanguination and potentially even death. So how can we remove and minimize the risk of suture line uh, disruption at, at these at-risk arterial repairs? Well, tissue coverage is obviously very important. Enteric diversion may or may not play a role, depending on the situation. And the strategies we use for washouts and delayed closure to achieve a relatively clean field may uh, have some value as well. But I've always struggled personally with trying to find something else to mitigate this risk uh, further. And I think uh, my colleagues at uh, the uh, Clinical Research Lab at Travis Air Force Base introduced me to this concept of direct site endovascular repair, which I think is a, a, a very useful tool in these kind of environments. What you see here is a stent graft prepared across the injury directly through the site of open exploration. And what you do not see is a suture line that can subsequently disrupt. I did not come up with this technique. Major A.J. Davidson, um, who is now at Travis Air Force Base himself as a vascular surgeon, then a resident, and uh, under the mentorship of uh, Tim Williams, the, the um, uh, wizard of Wake Forest, as I often call him, 
uh, was the first to kind of describe this and look at it in a porcine model and to subsequently uh, work with a, a, a team, including myself, to describe a, the technique for clinical use. This is the way they initially described the technique. They deconstructed and removed the stent graft from the delivery shaft of a typical Viabon stent graft and compared it to shunt utilization initially. And this is the technique that they described. So initial open control of the proximal distal vascular injury, you dissect and control the vessel, you take this deconstructed uh, or uh, removed uh, stent graft off of the delivery device, you put it directly into the uh, one side of the arterial injury, you pass through a separate puncture site, the cord uh, for releasing the uh, stent graft through a distal remote site at, at either the proximal or distal uh, control area, and you secure the edges of the stent, you pull the rip cord to deploy the stent as it was designed to do, and what you now have is a stent deployment uh, essentially serving this endovascular stent graft as not only a shunt, but perhaps a more definitive repair. And what they found that when they compared these two shunts, the flow rate was better and, and out significantly further at 72 hours than you would normally think about leaving, uh, if you had the choice, a subsequent um, temporary vascular shunt. So th their conclusions uh, was that the direct side endovascular repair compared to temporary vascular shunt and had resulted in improved uh, flow rates, less restricted blood flow, and they demonstrated this as a rapid technique that's low complexity, and it may have improved durability over uh, typical shunting techniques. But I would say it's a very useful hybrid technique that can oftentimes serve as a definitive repair, and it avoids a suture line in that contaminated field that is subsequently at risk. Uh, we all have patients we can demonstrate as an example. This was a gentleman who had a, uh, that we treated at shock trauma, gunshot wounded the torso. We had many injuries, but the most uh, notable uh, ones for the sake of this discussion was a social colon injury, small bowel injuries, necessitating resection, and a right common femoral, uh, a common iliac artery injury that required the control and initial shunting. And this is the injury we were up against. We ligated the vein uh, in a damage control approach and then shunted that right common uh, uh, iliac artery. This is what it looked like after the patient had been resuscitated, multiple take backs. Now we're at a stage where we can think about definitive repair. And the solution we came up with, we thought would work very nicely in the initial phase. We sacrificed the internal iliac and mobilized the external iliac to achieve a very nice tension-free repair, uh, connecting the common iliac to the external iliac across the debrided edges of that injury site. And we covered this with retroperitoneum, uh, we fixed his bowel injuries and we, he did very well initially. Got his abdomen closed. By day 16, was working with physical therapy and on his way to discharge. However, on day 17, he became acutely tachycardic, unresponsive, and went into PE arrest with a tense abdomen. And we all can imagine what happened. It was breakdown of that right common iliac artery anastomosis. So it took several more take backs, shunting. Uh, and getting him resuscitated before we could really talk about what we wanted to do to achieve this. And this is where DSER came into utilization. So we elected to choose a Viabon uh, stent graft. And just pictorially, what we did is we controlled uh, with the abdomen open, the proximal aorta with a, a, a Reboa. Uh, we placed the stent graft across the gap of the injury. We deployed this in a very nice fashion. And this served as an excellent definitive repair for this patient. This is what it looks like in the operative field, in the open operative field. You can see again, no suture line here to protect. So we covered this, I got it as clean as we could, covered this with the rectus femoris flap and, and Dr. Kundi can perhaps provide additional update, but at least two years after injury, he, I know for a fact that he was complication free relative to his DSER utilization. So this is a very interesting technique that I think has uh, a place in every vascular trauma surgeon's toolkit and I hope the description of this incites some discussion in, in, the, in the group there today. And again, I'm sorry I'm not there to participate myself. Thank you very much. I think we'll move into the fourth and final discussion of this session. EVAR for 100% ruptured AAA by Dr. David McGreevy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, EVTM is not just all about trauma, so that's why I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, EVAR in, in aortic ruptures. Uh, some of you might have heard this. I presented this also at the EVTM Symposium in, in December in uh, 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 last, last year. Um, so we've been doing EVAR now for, for uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms for quite a while now, and also for ruptures. And 
the data, however, there's multiple reports that have been looking, looking at the difference between doing EVA or open surgery for ruptures, uh, but not really seeing any generally short-term survival benefits. Uh, there are um, reports now coming out uh, showing maybe a survival benefit when it comes to more long-term in five or ten years. Um, uh, and these these trials have often been criticized because they've uh, their design design has been very poor uh, pa the difference in patient characteristics between these types of patients uh, and also different types of operative uh, techniques that are used um we our our center in Odebro, uh for quite a few years ago now presented um the first part of of this data uh, which was, was called the eva only uh, trial, which is basically where we're using only EVA to treat all types of uh, uh, aortic ruptures. In that, then back then, showing an overall mortality rate of, of 24%, which is generally in line with what uh, can can be seen in the other um, uh, data series. Uh, and as EVTM has progressed now, with you know faster CTs, uh, we're also uh, more more used to placing um, uh, endovascular um, accesses in these in these uh, hyper, specifically um, hemodynamic unstable patients. Uh, we're getting better at this. So now we we looked at our data now uh, twelve year data from from Adebro where uh, we've been doing um, uh, EVAR on all our um, in the inferior or um, uh, all our, our um, uh, ruptured cases. Uh, with only 3.5% of patients that we see were unsuitable for surgery. Um, mo most of them were infrarenal, 89%. We have some juxtarenal and some uh, uh, pararenal patients. Uh, all of the patients were started on uh, using local anesthesia, but 37% uh, of them were then converted during uh, course to, to general anesthesia. Uh, and basically all of them were done through a percutaneous access. There's one patient where we did cut down on, which was done uh, after that uh, percutaneous had been, had been tried. 54% um, of these patients came in hemodynamically unstable and 18% of them received a Reboa. Uh, and we're generally targeting, you know, a per permissive hypertension with, with systolic blood pressure around uh, 90. And, and if we can, trying to use partial occlusion to, to uh, permit uh, flow to the renals. Um, so the, different, the, the, the problem with, with doing EVA on these types of, uh, of these patients is that you have obviously uh, problems with, with uh, neck anatomy. Uh, so uh, in 28% of our, our uh, um, patients, they had a neck length of under 50 millimeters. 21% uh, had an angulation over 60 degrees, and 15% of them had a conical neck, which is then uh, described as a neck that increases more than three millimeters over in one centimeter. And these, basically, if you if you look at these uh, criteria, this means that over or about 50% of our patients had what we call in the ESVS or SVS guidelines as hostile necks. Um, so to, to be able to do EVAR on these patients, we then need to use these adjunct techniques. So we can't just place an EVAR graph. We need to put to try and salvage the, uh, the renal arteries, the superior mesenteric and, and the um, uh, uh, celiac. Uh, and we're doing this, you know, either using parallel grafting, so in chimneys and so on. Um, also, uh, so, so also on all of these patients, we will always do a uh, CT post-op day one. Uh, and what we can see there is that it's um, only 11% of them had uh, a type 1A or type 1B endoleak. Uh, all of them, or majority of them, were then uh, treated, uh, as you can see there. Type 2 endoleaks we could see in 7%, and all of these we decided not to treat. And, and on the follow up, uh, um, they were, uh, uh, we couldn't see them any longer. Uh, complications, uh, majority were kidney failure in these, this group of patients because we're in many cases also, in some cases, we're, we're um, uh, either we're, we're covering one of the renals. Um, so in 17% of those, so three of those 18 cases were where parallel grafting was used. Um, and only, well, only one of those patients actually ended up requiring uh, dialysis. Um, and on the 30-day uh, follow-up, we could see that 14% that, uh, had a type 1 endoleak and 6% had a type 2, which then uh, the, the ones with a type 1, then we ended up uh, going on to try and to treat. 
Uh, what we did do is we did a regression analysis. So we looked at this data to see if uh, the, this hostile neck anatomy uh, was causing an increase in post-op uh, angle. Well, there was a correlation between that and a post-op endoleakage, leakage, and also uh, looking if there was an increase in mortality if these patients had hostile necks. And we could see that there was no, according to the, the regression analysis, we could see no uh, correlation between that. Uh, our 30-day mortality rate overall for these patients was 27%. For the infrarenal patients, 24%. Uh, and the one-year mortality rate was 37%. And we could also see there was no significant difference between men and women uh, in, in uh, mortality, and also between over 80 and under 80, which is oft, often a topic that's discussed in these patients, which where uh, many or well, the, these other reports have been showing that uh, specifically women uh, are, are showing a, a benefit in, in using EVA. Um, uh, and also then, as I said, then the regression analysis we did when we were looking at the 30-day mortality rate uh, was that juxtarenal uh, hemodynamic instability, if they're getting uh, CPR uh, before we're starting the procedure, or if they're requiring uh, an aortic balloon occlusion, that was increasing their risk of mortality. So basically, um, our data, what we think it suggests is that you there is probably uh, endovascular solutions for most cases of uh, aortic ruptures. Thank you very much. Let's go. Quick question while folks are coming to the mic. First, wonderful data. Congratulations on your success. The, the one adjunctive technique, and I'm curious to hear availability and thoughts, is anchors and whether you think anchors have a role in some of those um, short necks as well. We have used them in some cases. Uh, it's not our go-to uh, technique to use, but in some cases where we're finding it difficult to, especially with, with large angulations, maybe when you're getting the bird beak, then we're going to try and maybe see if we can do something about that with, with the anchors. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, we use it in, we've used it in very few cases, but, but uh, it's not, our, sure. not what we use regularly. Please. Yeah, great talk. I'm Yosuke Matsumura from Japan, and you're doing endovascular job very aggressively. And my question is, reborn in AAA is somehow challenging because migration can be the critical. So in my center, uh, in the AAA patient, we all, uh, always choose the left uh, brachial as the axis, arterial axis. So what kind of uh, the catheter uh, do you use uh, for reborn, and which axis do you use? So, so we always uh, will have our, the left arm available, uh, mm -hmm. but we generally tend to, we, we, we'll do a double puncture. If we're doing a, using Reboa, then we'll generally tend to try and do a double puncture uh, from the groin and then have, and then, yeah, so then that way. Um, but, I mean, we have done Reboas from above as well in certain selected cases. So, I mean, it depends on, on the, you know, the patient and also depends on the anatomy, what, what type of stent grafts you're going to be using. If you're going to be doing parallel grafts as well, you're going to have to have more access. So, so it's it depends on the procedure, obviously. What kind of uh, catheter I do you use in the the seventh range or the bigger one? The, sometimes the seventh range catheter uh, have the higher risk of the migration because it's thin. Uh, what? Well, yeah, Tal can maybe. In just to, about the aortic balloon occlusion, we use it, we, as David said, but usually we use one for the system, one femoral, and the other one for the balloon, and then you change. You can use double or double punctures, and in very few cases from above, I have to say. About the seven French, we used also the newer Reboa. We used before the big systems, the equalizer, the CODA balloons, mm -hmm. but now you get smaller systems so you can use them, which means you can use smaller accesses with huge development. I just want to stress what David is saying. We're saying we can do all ruptures in endovascular way. Mm -hmm. And this is increased the interest also in trauma, which is different, but it's interest that you can solve this by endovascular means. An excellent session. Thank you guys very much for all of the presentations. I had a comment uh, uh, related to Joe's talk um, about putting endovascular stent grafts. Huge, huge advocate of doing endo stuff to get out of trouble. But stent grafts in contaminated fields, um, I've learned can sometimes bite you later on. And, and we did a large series of these when stent grafts came out in what turned out to be infected pseudoaneurysms and dialysis grafts. 
and then realized that six months down the road, this chronic source of occult sepsis um, was later identified because they don't present the same way that a bypass would with sort of anastomotic decompensation and then you, you realize you gotta fix the problem. So occult sepsis uh, with a contaminated stent graft can be a really big, big challenge or something to be, I would say, aware of because these patients go back into the wilderness and the providers in the wilderness may not understand that they have a stent graft that's in a contaminated space that's now that chronic source of sepsis. And so it's just something, and then you got to figure out how to fix that. That's changed that game. So. I think it's a great comment. I think we focus so much on the hyperacute management that sometimes these occult, underreported, chronic conditions that we don't necessarily correlate um, because they're a little more subtle. Uh, we forget about over time. I also agree it was a great session. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. So Dr. DuBose uh, and Dr. Hain, I will be moderating the next session. We are one minute ahead. So next we have uh, Anna Romanoli presenting Hard Signs Gone Soft. All right, thank you to the EVTM for the opportunity uh, to present uh, this original research um, that uh, I have no disclosures. And this was originally presented as um, two separate papers at the AAST in 2020 and 2021. Uh, first, Hard Signs Gone Soft, a critical uh, evaluation of presenting signs of extremity vascular injury. And then the following year, Hard, Soft, and Irrelevant, Hemorrhagic and Ischemic Signs, Better Distinguish Important Characteristics of Extremity Vascular Injury. So indications for exploration of presumed arterial injury were reported by Sinclair and Spencer in 1960, and they included distal arterial insufficiency, expanding hematoma, active bleeding, pulsatile bleeding, and location of the wounds. Hard and soft signs of vascular injury first appeared in the 1984 second edition of Rutherford's vascular surgery um, without reference to prior origin um, and indicated uh, the hard signs indicated immediate operative exploration as opposed to observation alone. The distinction between hard and soft signs of vascular injury is founded upon little more than observation, and these signs do not suggest or imply anything about um, injury pathology or manu management. They simply imply additional workup versus operative exploration, but in spite of this, they persist as trauma dogma. Both of these studies utilize the AST uh, Prove-It database, um, hard signs gone soft, uh, data was collected a year earlier and looked at both upper and lower extremity injuries. Uh, hard, soft, and irrelevant had an additional year of data and looked only at uh, femoral and popliteal injuries. And for the purpose of this project, uh, hard signs were designed, uh, defined as hemorrhage, expanding hematoma, and ischemia. Um, and hemorrhagic signs were defined as hemorrhage or expanding hematoma, and ischemic signs were de defined as absent or diminished pulses. So this is a representative algorithm from the Western Trauma Association for the management of the patient with ex uh, suspected extremity arterial injury. So, uh, so patients with hard signs uh, generally go directly to the operating room uh, unless there are kind of multiple ballistic fragments uh, complicating the picture, um, whereas patients with soft signs enter some sort of uh, complex workup algorithm that can involve uh, ABIs, uh, duplex CTA, um, or uh, catheter-based angiography. Um, so the first question, which we addressed in hard, soft, and irrelevant, is uh, are hard signs and soft signs actually being used to inform clinical practice? Um, and the answer is no. Um, in, uh, we found that 39% of presenting, patients presenting with hard signs of vascular injury underwent some sort of preoperative imaging, um, and we found that uh, Forty-five percent of patients presenting only with soft signs of vascular injury uh, were diagnosed at exploration, as opposed to um, having preoperative imaging. So we posited that hemorrhagic vascular injury, as opposed to obstructive vascular injury, which present as hemorrhagic and ischemic signs respectively, are fundamentally different 
disease processes, and early identification of this distinction implies physiology, pathology, and informs treatment decisions. Do hard signs correlate with admission parameters? A little bit. Uh, there was a difference between isolated extremity AIS, admission hemoglobin, and admission lactate. But when we reevaluated the same data set and broke the patients up as presenting with hemorrhagic or ischemic signs, we found that ISS, SBP, hemoglobin, pH, and lactate all differed kind of uh, between these two groups, indicating that patients with hemorrhagic signs are generally presenting with a uh, greater depth of shock. Do hard and soft signs correlate with injury pathology? Yes, to a degree. Um, patients with hard signs were more likely to have uh, transection, and patients who presented without hard signs um, were more likely to have uh, an occlusive pathology. Um, but we do see that same breakdown with hemorrhagic and ischemic signs, uh, with significantly more patients with uh, presenting with hemorrhagic signs having a transection, uh, and more patients with ischemic signs presenting with occlusive occlusive pathology. Um, this is important because early identification of occlusive pathology, especially in an isolated extremity injury, um, raises the question of preoperative heparinization um, if there is a, you know, isolated extremity injury or relatively low soft tissue burden. Do they correlate with outcomes? In general, hard signs were associated with higher in-hospital mortality rate, amputation rate, reintervention rate, and more blood products whereas hemorrhagic signs were associated with higher in-hospital mortality rate, amputation rate, length of stay, and more blood products. But when we did some subgroup analysis for the uh, hard signs gone soft paper, um, looking at patients with hemorrhagic signs who underwent CTA versus exploration only for diagnosis, and then the same uh, for ischemic signs, we found that between the two groups, there was no difference in need for reoperation or reintervention rate, no difference in need for amputation rate. But we also demonstrated that patients presenting with um, is, uh, hemorrhagic signs who underwent CTA prior to intervention had no difference in their packed red blood cell utilization in the first 24 hours um, or throughout the duration of their admission, indicating that the delay in these patients that may have been associated with getting a CTA did not alter their initial uh, resuscitative needs. When looking at ischemic signs, uh, there was again no difference in need for reoperation um, or amputation. However, patients presenting with ischemic signs who went immediately to exploration actually required more blood products in the first 24 hours, um, suggesting the possibility that the preoperative planning afforded by CTA resulted in less blood loss during the operative exploration. Uh, looking at outcomes in the hard, soft, and irrelevant paper, we found that hemorrhagic patients presenting with hemorrhagic signs uh, had a significantly higher blood product utilization and also had a significantly higher uh, in-hospital mortality rate. So their admission data uh, supports that they have a higher depth of shock on arrival, and this then correlates with a higher mortality rate um, in the second paper. Um, there are a variety of differences that we observe in um, kind of intervention performed when looking at hemorrhagic and ischemic signs, um, but both in the hemorrhagic and ischemic groups, patients who obtained CTA prior to exploration had a higher likelihood of undergoing endovascular or hybrid repair, and also had a higher likelihood of going on an initial period of non-operative management or observation. Um, and again, uh, indicating that they are sicker, patients presenting with hemorrhagic signs were more likely to undergo intervention emergently in the first zero to three hours of admission. Uh, they were more likely to undergo ligation, um, and patients presenting with ischemic signs were more likely to undergo non-operative management. So in conclusion, there's no consi consistent difference in parameters associated with depth of shock in patients presenting with hard signs or not with hard signs with suspected vascular injury. And this is not really being used in clinical practice, given the readily um, available multi-detector CT world that we currently live in. Hemorrhagic signs were associated with an increased depth of shock of, at admission. Patients were more likely to have transection. Um, and they were more likely to require emergent intervention and more blood and had a higher uh, rate of in-hospital mortality. Uh, patients who underwent CTA for diagnosis with hemorrhagic signs were more likely to have a higher rate of endo or hybrid repair. And ischemic signs patients who underwent CTA um, were more or were less likely or required less blood products within the first 24 hours. Oops. So uh, in conclusion, this is 
kind of a different um, assessment of a patient with suspected vascular injury algorithm that we've proposed. Um, and essentially, if a patient uh, does not prevent, present in hemorrhagic shock or they present but they respond to their initial resuscitation, uh, we would advocate getting a CTA of everyone. Uh, if there's a tourniquet in place, consider loosening the tourniquet prior to getting a CTA in a patient with hemorrhagic signs. Um, if the patient does not respond to their initial resuscitation and they are presenting with any hemorrhagic signs, consider tourniquet or potentially Reboa depending on the location of injury, and then urgent limb exploration with vascular or endovascular control should be pursued. However, if they present only with ischemic signs, um, then they should go down an algorithm in which we evaluate for uh, other sources of life-threatening hemorrhage and then uh, plan for damage control revascularization based on their ischemic burden in time. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely talk. All right, questions? Just pushing back slightly on the ABCs of trauma, airway, breathing, CAT scan. Um, so, I, you know, I hear you, um, and I understand uh, the rationale behind doing the CT. But, but as, we're, as we're doing this, and again, you know, we all uh, have training centers, right? So recently, you know, we did this, and it was a newish attending, and it was a popliteal, and, uh, you know, it was more ischemic than bleeding. And we ended up losing the leg because there wasn't an appreciation for the urgency, right? So when you're heading to CAT scan, you're teaching people that the problem is less urgent. And somehow, so there's a nuance to everything you've taught us just now. And I'm just saying that nuance is really important, right? It's like, there's a clock running on this leg. Yeah, we're doing a CT, but you gotta get the hell to the operating room. Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree, but there's nuance to everything we do. And as, as someone who is dual trained in vascular and trauma, like, I like knowing whether the thrombus is in the pop or in the trifurcation vessels before I start exploring. It changes my approach. It changes my reconstruction plan. So, I mean, I am a huge proponent. You could do a on-table angio. Um, you could, but that is often technically more difficult to accomplish in the middle of the night, especially if you don't know where it is. Like me shooting an on-table angiogram with a micropuncture or butterfly needle through the field is different than having to go up and over to try to localize you know, where the SFA cuts out, if it cuts out above the knee or below the knee. I mean, we could explore the groin, but I think um, in, you know, at least in, in my home institution, um, our ability to get a high quality CTA um, does not generally delay patient's arrival to the OR if we decide we're going. Well, I think your paper is a really great reference, but... Um, and particularly because it sort of deviates away from hard and soft signs, because I don't ask a resident at three in the morning, do they have soft signs and what are they? You know, I really just want to know what is the clinical examination. I also think the algorithm doesn't really deviate, uh, distinguish uh, blunt and penetrating injury. And if I have a person with a penetrating injury and they got a hole at the knee, then I just really prefer not to teach people that are in community hospitals that they ought to get preoperative CTs, mm -hmm. because I think that it's like Sheldon just said, you know, we're sort of like allowing them permission to just walk away from the patient and get a CT and then wake somebody up from a sleep after the CT has been done to go to the OR. So I think like at shock trauma, maybe that's fine because everything's really co-located well. But, you know, I worked in Steamboat Springs and Vail and I've worked in Iraq and other places where you're just not going to have that same urgency if you get imaging. Um, but I think the paper is really good uh, also in terms of like asking for ABIs. I don't see it on this slide, but I do think that you emphasize the importance in that paper. And I do think that we ought to teach people that, you know, having a Doppler assessment is just as important because patients in shock might not have palpable pulses. But I really prefer just to go right to the OR for penetrating injuries and for blunt injuries. I do like the imaging. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I think that it, it, there's some nuance to this. And in a situation where you have a um, single defined trajectory, I think that the utility of getting preoperative imaging is pretty is, you know, potentially less. But in the setting of, you know, either multiple gunshot wounds or high energy blunt trauma, then the imaging may really help you figure out, you know, where the thrombus starts, where your proximal control location is. Robbie. Yeah, I, I mean, Chuck sort of 
said the exact same thing I'm going to. Joe and I have talked about this a lot. I think we even made a podcast about it, if I remember correctly. I both agree with this and strongly completely disagree with it because I think – to Chuck's point, we have to continue to embrace the idea that for vascular trauma, there is a disease process called blunt trauma, and there is a disease cause mm -hmm. called planetary trauma. And most of the time, they don't actually have a lot to do with each other, right? A single vessel, a single level gunshot wound to the leg should never get, uh, that's outside of, you know, Greg just asked me, what if they don't have a pulse in the other leg? Yeah, sure. There's going to be cases where you get it, but there's almost never a role for CTA in that patient, I would say whether it's for operative planning or for consideration of endo versus open, because we have to get to the idea that you can figure out endo on the fly a lot of times too. The Harbor Free Group, as you know, has shown that the ABI target of 0.9 really only is applicable in a penetrating trauma mm -hmm. circumstance, right? They've never had a clinically significant blunt vascular injury that had an ABI greater than 0.6, and we've, we've sort of made that transition. So I love the work you're doing. I just think we have to lean, it's our responsibility to lean harder into this idea that trauma is really different between blunt and penetrating mechanisms. For sure. Yeah, and I just like to talk about the methodology for just a second rather than the message. The methodology is filling out the, the, the case report form, if you will, after you know the outcome of the patient. And that's always going to skew your assessment of your initial assessment of the patient when you know the outcome when you're filling out a retrospective data. So I got to be got to temper some of these things just a little bit with hard conclusions and guiding stuff in the future based upon the methodology. It's an incredibly important data set. We contributed to it, but just be a little careful, right, on on recognizing the limitations of the methodology. Oh, for sure. I am curious about how pre-hospital tourniquet application has f um, obfuscated uh, this algorithm insofar as a tourniquet applied pre-hospital will, on release of it, if there is no arterial injury, will cause spasm underneath it mm -hmm. and will have a finding on CTA. And I have explored uninjured brachial arteries um, because it was narrowed on CTA. And it, essentially, to, to address Ravi's point, it turns a patient with a penetrating injury into one with a penetrating and blunt injury at the same time. Yeah, I mean, we did not, um, I'm not sure off the top of my head if the Prove-It database captures pre-hospital tourniquet use. Um, we definitely did not look at that specifically, um, but that's definitely a valid point, especially in these young patients um, with either upper extremity injury or uh, trifurcation vessel injuries where they are incredibly prone to vasospasm and you can uh, certainly find yourself in the vascular do loop of trying to open stuff up in a patient you don't want to heparinize and then things start falling apart. Thank you. That's excellent presentation. Uh, I agree with what's been said. Something, uh, just a comment, something I'm glad uh, usually doesn't get enough attention. And you can have arterial injuries with palpable pulses distally. Every time a resident calls me and says, oh yeah, it's got a pulse. That case I showed with the Foley, anesthesia actually got the radial line on that side because he had a pulse. So I'm glad it's being based more on hemodynamic status, ischemic signs. Or, but yeah, every time somebody tells me, you know, hard sign, soft sign, yeah, the patient's got a pulse. I'm like, doesn't exclude an arterial injury. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Romanoli. Next. Next is Greg McGee talking about innovative techniques in rupture. Thanks for the invitation to speak to you guys again today. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit, again, outside the uh, realm of trauma here on um, ruptured thoracoabdominal aneurysms. Uh, these are my disclosures. So uh, we talked a little bit about a ruptured AAA uh, earlier with David's talk. Uh, and we know that um, in the United States, at least, that ruptured inferenal repair uh, is improved with, um, with EVAR versus open, open repair. Um, we also know that elective endovascular repair of suprarenal and thoracoabdominal aneurysms has a significantly lower perioperative mortality than open thoracoabdominal repair. Uh, and we also know that ruptured suprarenal and thoracoabdominal aneurysms have extremely high mortality uh, in any way of treatment, open or endo. And the reasons for this are that you have visceral and renal artery branch involvement that need to be revascularized. You have a significant time constraint. You can't leave up a, a, a balloon in uh, zone one 
above the uh, celiac for too long. And there are no dedicated devices for repair of thoracal abdominal aneurysms currently in the United States, at least. So uh, at our own institution, we have gone through a paradigm shift uh, over time. There's different uh, methodologies here that we initially started off doing more parallel grafting um, of the entire thoracal abdominal segment. We've done physician modified grafting as seen in the second slide here, which uh, is done in the back table right before the case or during induction, which takes about an hour once you get pretty good at it or maybe a little bit less. And then uh, we've done some more exotic things um, when, when patients are, when you didn't have those techniques available, uh, like double barrel um, grafts in the thoracal abdominal, and sorry, in the thoracic aorta, and then using limbs to go into the celiac and SMA and an inverted um, iliac branch grafts for the renal arteries. Um, and more recently, we've done um, laser uh, in situ fenestrating repair. And so this uh, talk is going to be more talking about this uh, newer methodology because we believe that this is really has a, a really good um, uh, indication in rupture. So, um, sorry. Uh, so laser in situ uh, repair allows for rapid cessation of hemorrhage. So you place, you have a ruptured thoracal abdominal repair, you place the endograft uh, or endografts uh, in the um, thoracic, descending thoracic aorta, wherever you get your proximal seal zone, your distal seal zone in the iliacs or, or in the infrarenal aorta, depending on the type of uh, repair that's needed. Immediately you have now control of the bleeding. Then you can sequentially target each visceral or renal artery branch. So you can revascularize the renal artery and the other renal artery, then the SMA and then the celiac sequentially. Do, while you're doing that, you have a very small hole, so very minimal amount of bleeding while that's going on. Obviously, now you're on the clock and you have to get this done relatively quickly. But this can be advantageous for ruptures as patients can, who may present in a sort of quasi-stable setting, can very rapidly progress to hemodynamic instability and have, can have sudden cardiovascular collapse on the operating table, especially with induction or anesthesia. When you're doing um, uh, infrarenal repair, oftentimes you can start this with, uh, or, or finish it really with um, just groin access and conscious sedation, or not even sedation at all, just local. But I think it becomes comp increasingly complex when you're, um, when you're adding more visceral and renal artery branches. So this is a case example of an 88-year-old man. He came in to our center. He had a history of a previous EVAR with a type 1 that was he was told was uh, going to be fine and it ended up not being fine. So he presented with sudden onset of severe abdominal pain. This is his scan. He had a 11-centimeter uh, ruptured uh, pararenal aneurysm. And you, as you can see, it's pretty... Uh, as it starts to go through, it gets pretty dramatic in terms of the retroperitoneum. Very large retroperitoneum hematoma, a lot of um, blood loss there. Contained though. So uh, initially he was, um, oops, sorry, this went through really quickly. He was uh, awake and alert on presentation. He was functionally independent. He had an active lifestyle with regular exercise and he desired all uh, forms of uh, treatment to be pursued. So uh, here you can see there's a very angulated neck posteriorly. The celiac goes kind of almost straight up and the uh, SMA is in spasm there because of probably a soon to develop compartment syndrome. So um, he had previous stent grafts that went all the way up to the level of the renal arteries. There's no, ever, no uh, way to uh, get seal um, by adding a cuff or anything like that. I mean, he was hemodynamically unstable with a lot of blood in the retroperitoneum. So we desired to do a laser in situ for repair. The operative details here are we obtained bilateral percutaneous femoral access and left brachial artery cut down. Um, while we were doing this, um, he had a cardiopulmonary collapse requiring several minutes of CPR. I have another picture I didn't include in this of my hands doing the CPR during the case and one of our other fellows is doing the rest of the access. Um, so we deploy initially a, a T-VAR graft. This is a standard tube graft and, and just above the, um, several centimeters above the celiac artery. About, you usually get about at least two stent grafts above. Um, so four to, to six centimeters above the celiac. Deploy that um, initially, you come from above and um, and we in this case we also put up a coda I mean a, a coda balloon in the uh, super renal artery um, as well. So here you have now the the stent graft is I'm sorry I don't know why that's going forward like that. Um, the stent graft is deployed. It's acting like a functional balloon. You come down from above. You pop through with the laser. You make a little hole. You sent that, and then you come through and then access the celiac, and then each individual graft sequentially. So here. Um, is the laser is popped through uh, the graft. The celiac is then revascularized. We then do that the same with a different angle with the SMA. And then 
We deploy another stent and then do this again with the left renal artery followed by the right renal artery. And then in this situation, the remainder of the stent graft is completely deployed into the previous repair and you have uh, now complete um, uh, repair. Now this patient, um, as you can tell from some of those angiograms probably has a uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. So we had to do a decompressive laparotomy. We evacuated several liters of blood and had immediate control of his hemodynamics. Um, he had a temporary abdominal closure and then dialysis catheter was placed. Um, Post-op day two, we took him back for abdominal closure. Um, on a post-op CT scan, we found he had stenosis of the renal arteries so where that, those fenestrations were made. So we went and took him back at that time and um, resolved the, those uh, issues by placing another stent. And, um, and then uh, the rest of his post-op, of course, he recovered uh, over the course of a month and was discharged to a long-term care facility, awake, alert, um, functionally independent, not, sorry, not functionally independent, but, um, but uh, um, able to eat and tolerate diet and then ultimately was taken off dialysis. So his stent grafts were patent. He had no evidence of endoleak at the time of discharge. So we, uh, we wanted to look at our, um, uh, we have a pretty high volume aortic transfer center and we get about 200 to 300 aortic transfers per year, uh, including cardiac and, va and vascular. So we wanted to look at our outcomes of um, uh, ruptured thoracic abdominals and we basically compared this in situ laser fenestration technique to all previous techniques, including physician modified grafts, which we have a large experience with. And we found that in the series that um, we presented last year at the Western Vascular, that our operative, sorry, our, our in-hospital mortality is only 11% for in situ repair versus 25% for non-in situ repair. Um, and then specifically for the patients who presented hemodynamically unstable or hypotensive on, a, on arrival, the non-in situ repair had a 45% mortality versus 8% in the in situ repair, which is, which is statistically significant. And um, this was our trend basically over the years since we've um, been doing these. And um, as you can see, the volume has increased and um, we've pretty much gone to now from no uh, in situ repair to almost exclusively in situ repair uh, for these types of patients. And um, yeah, that's when we first started doing it in 2018 and then we now are completely 100% doing uh, in situ. In summary, um, there are several methods for endovascular repair of ruptured thoracal abdominal and suprarenal aneurysms. Um, but in our hands, uh, in situ repair as a, a uh, is associated with decreased overall uh, mortality, especially in the patients who present hypotensive. And the reason for this is uh, fairly straightforward. They're, if they're hypotensive, you don't have time to put in a graph that has four separate holes or branches because there's continued blood loss while you're doing each sequential, each branch um, incorporation. So if you actually have complete cessation of blood flow or you know, complete control of hemorrhage, then you can sequentially do one at a time. You're really minimizing the amount of blood loss during that repair. So post-operative um, complications are uh, uh, frequent, unfortunately, but this, you know, if they're alive, I think that's a win. And then further data is obviously necessary to, um, to assess the durability of these techniques. And thank you very much. So I'm gonna ask the first question just for clarity's sake. So you partially deploy the graph from above, fenestrate, go through the fenestrations, select and cannulate your branches. Do you pre-stent at that point? So, so I didn't, I, just for the sake of time, only talked about really one technique, but there's really two techniques that we use and they're kind of different. So um, when we use a transfemoral approach, if the, uh, if the aorta, if, if the branch vessels are coming off at a point where the thoracic endograph would seal basically in that location, it's somewhat preferable to do a transfemoral technique where you pre-stent pre mm -hmm. each of the branches so because you can see them very easily on the scan, I mean, on the, on the fluoroscopy, and then pop through directly at that point. Um, that does take a little longer though. So if they're like in cardiovascular collapse, you really don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. So the second technique is coming from above and they're partially deploying the graph. So two stent rows. So now you have basic, and it's fully deployed. Yeah. So you now have complete seal there and you're basically a funnel and then come down from above where the, thera where the graft is sort of funneling down to the, to the sheath, pop through there. We, make a, we put in a little, um, like a six by 22 eye cast in that location, just in case you fall out, you can get back into it. Mm -hmm. So you know where it is. And then at that point, get into the branch, completely complete the repair with a stent, remove access, and then go to a different location for the next one. Okay, so when you finish completely deploying it, kind of rides your rails down into the branches a little bit to align itself perfectly? 
No, so it's, it ends up looking more like a tambi, like an inside to tambi in that okay. technique. So they're more like longer branches. Our, we, saw, we sort of say our, our standard is the, is the 79 VBX for every oh, single wow. branch. Okay. All right. Uh, does anyone else have any questions other than me? No, no, you're helping. So just with the second technique, right, you couldn't, you couldn't get, get the uh, pre-stent, right? And now you're, you're popping in. So the, the, the SMA, the celiac is covered. Right, it's it's covered by your initial deployment. So how how do you get the laser? So this is just a trauma surgeon trying to figure this out. How do you get the laser pointed in the right direction? Because you don't have this. What? Right? How do you find the hole? Yeah. Th thank you, Doctor Hogan. This simpler language. Is better. Yeah. So so um, th this sort of comes from the the various different techniques for elective repair, right? So. Um, in elective repair, there's really two kind of standard ways of doing it. One is a fenestrated technique and one's a branch technique. When you have a fenestration, you're directly at the location where the branch tech comes off. If you're doing a branch, it has to be superior to wherever that, that visceral artery is coming off. So in this technique I described here on the, on the screen, what we're doing is basically deploying the stent graft well above the location of the visceral arteries. So then you have, you pop through this, the, uh, uh, graph material with a laser. Here we're using a 2.3 millimeter spectronetics laser. You get a wire down below the graft, then you can shoot an angiogram through that catheter. That allows you then to see the visceral arteries. Then you go into it with a selective catheter and wire, exchange for the exchange for a stiffer wire, and then you have the stent done. Got it. Um, how are you sizing it for the visceral segment? Because if you're too far away, I mean, we tend to have to sew in mini cuffs to get closer to the wall when we're doing elective PMEGs and stuff. Uh, in this technique, it looks like you're gonna be pretty far away from the wall in some of these cases. How do you account for that? And how do you deal with type threes in these patients? Yeah, so um, that's great. So specifically, uh, the sizing comes down to proximal seal. Okay, so proximal seal, distal seal, depending on what they have below. If they have no repair below and you're gonna do a bifurcated graft, then you just, you know, you, you size it such that you have a tapered graft, you can put your bifurcated graft into. Um, if you're deploying into a previous stent graft, then you have to be able to, to size it appropriately as well. Um, so the, the sizing all depends on the proximal seal above wherever the injury is. So and this is a thoracic thoracic abdominal in zone five, basically. Um, and then sizing for the visceral branches comes down to whatever you think their approximate size is gonna be. Usually that's like a five, an eight um, for the celiac, an eight or nine for the SMA. They're gonna be a little bit smaller in ruptures because um, they're you know, in spasm. But you know, if you're close enough, that's, that's pretty good. Type three endoleaks, specifically uh, 3C endoleak, so between, which means basically the stent graft um, into the branch and the aortic stent graft, we tend to manage in this kind of, kind of scenario with a cuff so that then you have basically a fenestrated branch confirmation, fenestrated parallel grafting confirmation. Talk, good talk. Um, a, a technical point. Uh, when you put, when you deploy the stent, the cover of the stent, and you cover completely superior mesenteric artery, renal artery, everything, how many times do you have to do the fenestration? Because, for example, you have you have ischemia in the superior mesenteric artery, and you have to consider also the vasoconstriction due to the shock. Yes. How many times do you have? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I think you know the comparison we have on this is like a thoracic cross clamp, so or let's supersede that cross clamp, right? Um, and and most uh, um, vascular surgeons' hands. So you know, obviously, let's say it's less than an hour. You know, for the renal arteries, you have less than half an hour, I think. So the renal arteries are a little bit more, um, even though the SMA is paramount for to prevent death, the renal arteries are more susceptible to ischemia. So we actually selectively do the renal arteries first. And I think, you know, in, um, it does take some, you know, um, experience, um, but uh, most of these we can get done in, with a total ischemia time of around 20 to 35 minutes. Uh, so, uh, have we left with ischemic SMA? No. All right, great, one more uh, question. Great talk. Um, to clarify, you don't do a spin and fusion imaging on any of these. Have you employed that? Have you found it to be helpful? No. So, well, we we so fusion imaging we love. We use it for every case basically, but for ruptures we tend not to do that because of the timing. And so, in those situations, we either pre stent so that you can see the stent that you actually know where you're going going for each one, or like I said 
come from above and then you just shoot it and you just mark it out on the screen and then you go for it. Yeah. Um, if you do have the time to do fusion, it does help a little bit, but not a huge amount really. And follow up question. If you're doing the renals first, you're doing both renals from below, both viscerals from above, and you haven't had any issues ever having to cross or dislodge your branch after you've put, if you, if you had to do the renals from below, go back up and do the SMA and celiac. And if you had any problems crossing the renal ostia. I, I haven't done um, the that way you're describing. So we're doing SMA and celiac from above and renals from below. I don't either do all four from below or all four from above. Um, but uh, we have done it with other techniques. For example, I was talking about the uh, you know inverted um, iliac branch grafts and, and double barrel excluders. We've done it that way. But um, I think it's just easier to do everything from one, you know, from a logistics perspective, when you're in the same spot, so if you're at the left arm or in the femoral, then it's just easier to do all four from that way. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. McGee. Uh, next. Uh, next, we have Dr. Hoare speaking about mangle, oh, sorry, uh, liquid embolization for trauma and non-trauma patients. Hi, thank you, everybody. It's very nice to meet again. I will take it very short. And the reason I want to speak about uh, this is that... Uh, Liquid embolization agent can be very useful. In trauma, it's not used that much, and there are different ways to look at it. But just to, to remind why we're speaking about it, because we use it in EVAR and for the rupture material, and I will go through it very simple, and we publish now the 100% EVAR material that shows that it's possible to do it. And what I mean, it's part of the concept, and that's why we are trying to get something we can learn from each other, doing concepts that speak about doing uh, getting bleeding control with different tools one of them is embolization and um, the onyx itself and i will concentrate on onyx even there are other product there are other products but this is our person or my personal our center experience is with onyx it's one of the liquid embolic agents and it's been published in these articles with my colleague here anna maria and others and there are some few publications in trauma so interesting in trauma i cannot find so much material about it when we are speaking about a uh, liquid embolization, we talk about acute bleedings, uh, ruptures, and endolic. And we have it on the shelf as one of the products on uh, products Onyx or Phil, another product. But there are others. I will just say it like NBACA. So there are other products. I will speak about the one that I know. Just very shortly, this is um, an. Uh, some kind of polymer that you can use. It should be dissolving DMSO and other uh, 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 chemical in ingredient and use in different viscosities in a vessel, which means you put it in a vessel to stop a bleeding or to stop the vessel uh, and depends on the viscosity, it will behave on in contact with blood or water, it will become effective. So this is how it looks with the setup. And the good thing about Onyx, which might be interesting for trauma, that it's not connected to coagulation. So not like the, the, um, the other tools we're using to stop bleedings, uh, like coils, you can use it even if you have a, a problem with the coagulation. It's fast, it's effective, and it's a question, is it effective? It depends on the situation. It causes also artifacts. You have to have the right catheters, the right material, and just a warning, it's not something to play with. You have to know what you're doing, like most of the endovascular tools. And this is important to think about when we're speaking about everybody can do everything. I don't really agree to this. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be experienced. This is how it looks when we're using this onyx. You have to shake it. The IFU say saying 20 minutes, we can use it after five minutes. And just in cases of ruptures, again, as a bleeding control, what we do, we do the onyx at the end of the operation. We're trying to exclude the bleeding, and then we put onyx, like seen in this one. This is the setup in the hybrid suite or the ER. Uh, and we, as I said, exclude the aneurysm and do embolization with this material that stops the bleeding. These are some examples. I will not go into details. Endolix that you can use this material. You see it very good. You can see when it's getting effect and it can be used in these cases, like this patient waiting for fenestrated coming on the same morning with the rup or the morning before with the rupture. And you can solve it with, for example, onyx or other materials. Um, the endolix, so you can control the bleeding 
as seen here, and other tips, uh, types, and the leaks uh, from above, from below. You can use it to get your machinery, your, your patient feel better. And these are some examples. Um, you can do a direct puncture also to use it to get rid of some endo leaks. And the question is about trauma. Is it possible to use it? Yeah, of course it is possible. The reports are very few. There are no coagulation issues, so you can use this material. For example, Onyx, fast embolization, you get it downstream, so you can get your catheter and spot it. You get it down to the bleeding area, and it will probably close the back door of the bleeding, which is a problem if you close just the proximal side of the artery. These are just some examples. It's quite easy to use if you know what you're doing, uh, you, get, you can control it by waiting a bit. You can also put it on different coils. Um, so you can put your material to lie somewhere. You can get it getting up or down if you use it correctly. But this is some uh, training that needs to be done with this. So Onyx or other embolization tools. And we have our colleagues from Japan here that has been using the super glue, the NBCA or other materials possible. It's possible to use it in trauma and bleedings. There are different uh, tools to use. You need some experience, so you just don't play with it because you will get embolies from it and it might be a problem. In trauma and non-trauma, is it effective? I think it's very effective, but the question, there are no RCTs or more data about it. The good thing, it's very fast to use these embolization agents. They go downstream, so you can find it where you need it, even in the small vessels, close the back doors, probably. You can use it with coils, but the problem is sometimes it to control it. There are CT artifacts, so you will have a problem when you do CT control. It needs some time to prepare and to control. So be aware, of course, and I will be happy to discuss or answer some questions. All right. Um, so uh, liquid embolic agents, particularly low viscosity ones, give me anxiety, particularly specifically because they go so distally. So if you're taking out something in the pelvis, yes, you're you're getting your bleeding, but I worry that you're also getting those collaterals which would otherwise keep the pelvis uh, alive. Do you have you had any ischemic necrotic uh, complications from this? Yeah, we, yeah, of course. And we've seen it, for example, have a problem to use it in the intestines bleeding because you, you will close other vessels. Uh, it's always a question price to pay, um, where to use it on which vessel. For example, I'm a bit, um, we don't use it on, for example, younger people. You, you're a bit afraid to use it again, ischemia and other complications, but I don't have a better answer on this. Okay. All right, other questions, Greg. Oh, that's great talk um, as usual. So I couldn't agree with you more about the the need for experience and, and the, the concern because uh, Rafi and I are just talking about how we're, every time we use this, it's like a uh, very tight sphincter tone um, mm -hmm. because you know what can go wrong. Uh, I, I, was a couple, I was a little confused. Do you fill the aneurysm sac um, with onyx? And if you do, do you have to use a lot of it? Because when I try to fix endoleaks, you have to put like 20 no, of these in there. Here it comes other factors, but no, you don't. We use it usually for endoleaks and you fill the endoleak and close the gutters, for example, or type 1B, it doesn't matter the details. In some cases, yeah, we use the world record of Onyx <laughs> 76 packages. I, the, the idea was to close the space. It's very expensive. Right. And today I think we know it's not needed, but it's as part of the process of learning how to use the material, this was done. So I think for 1B, it makes sense as if it embolizes, you're kind of able to control that. But for 1As, um, how do you, how do you make sure you're not going to embolize into the visceral arteries or whatever? How do you how do you prevent? Migration? You you look at it and you do subtraction and you you you're looking all the time where the material is going and this is a major thing. So you don't just don't put it in. You have to know, look at it, see if it's starting. If you stop, it will go another way where the low resistance will go. So if it goes up into a vessel and it show one to the renal, then you stop because you cannot control it there. Right. So there is a price to pay. Yeah. With it, yeah. Thank you. Hey, Tal, thanks for the great talk. And I, my experience is fully endoleak based, and I'd be curious about your experience with trauma. And because I don't know if there's another time to ask about this in the next couple of days, liquid embolics versus plug based devices that we're seeing now and, and that shut down arteries faster than, than fabric covered coils. And how do you decide what to use? 
Uh, I think when you have to, it's a great question. Uh, when you want to stop a vessel, you can use a coil or a plug. Uh, and if you have the, the plug itself, if it's Amplatz or a Sierra or whatever, it's effective. It goes to place. It's, it's very fast. Uh, I'm thinking always when I see these bleedings and there are other people, radiologists here, for, exa for example, if you see the back door bleeding and you, you're, so if you put the plug, I will not be able to come back. So that's more, this is how I'm thinking, um, depends on the situation, but I, I'm always at the same situation thinking about what, what should we use now? Should coils, it takes a bit more time, they will not stop the bleeding at once, it, it, the coagulation issues, the trauma, th that's my, my experience. Only a short comment. Uh, it depends. I, I think that the most important thing depends from the coagulation status of the patient. Uh, because uh, coil, um, plug, um, micro plug, everything, mechanical agents works with the uh, coagulation status of the patient. And then traumatic patients, the coagulation is never normal. Uh, so glue or uh, onyx occlude immediately. You have no problem and you arrest the, uh, the, the hemorrhage immediately. Um, about the ischemic issue, I think that depends from, uh, from uh, how, how much you are comfortable with the embolic agents, because uh, you, you can see in every moment where it is going, and uh, you can arrest immediately, and you can withdraw the microcut. Um, of course, you have to, to have a learning curve, and at the beginning, you have to use the uh, liquid embolic agents, uh, onyx or, uh, or glue, not in uh, bowel, uh, in bowel uh, bleeding, for example, but I don't know, in muscle, in uh, gluteal uh, hemorrhages, in something where if you have non-target embolization, is not a great, a big deal, is my suggestion. Thank you. All right, um, now that we have chairs, would all of our speakers for this session come up for a last round of questions from the audience before lunch. No. All right, does anyone have any questions for these three? All right, I have a question. Um, this was alluded to uh, previously. Do you think that graduates of integrated vascular residency programs are prepared to a minimal nominal level to take care of vascular trauma? Uh, all of you. Well, I, I mean, I, I, we were just talking earlier about how um, not all paramedics are the same. I think not all vascular training programs are the same. So um, we know that some programs are very heavy aortic, some are very heavy peripheral, some are very heavy trauma. And so I think that it's going to depend on the program. It's going to depend on where they're trained, who they're trained by. But certainly, um, I mean, I could say our trainees, I feel like, are very comfortable with doing okay. vascular trauma. Uh, yeah, Greg and I uh, kind of debated this issue at VAM um, earlier, and I, I, I agree with what he says. There, the way the curriculum requirements for the integrated vascular residency uh, currently stand is that there are not specific uh, requirements for number of months on trauma rotations, and the requirements also don't stipulate whether those are done as a junior or a senior resident, um, at which point you're... Uh, kind of ability to overall conceptualize the vascular injury in the setting of the patient's polytrauma, I think are, it's very different as a PGY-4 running the surface as opposed to a PGY-2 who's, you know, doing post-op checks and scrubbing the occasional case. So I, I agree that it depends on the program. Okay. Anyone else? Well, Chuck? I would just be curious from an international audience, um, what their training challenges are, because I know about the U.S. issue because we talk about it all the time, but Tal, can you tell us uh, what training is available uh, in Sweden and what the challenges and the topics of discussion are? I think it's a, it's a huge problem, as we spoke also about the endovascular methods and the, the people forget how to open things. It's related to this. 
Um, there is no one program, in, 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 not in Sweden or anywhere else, that I can answer on. But what we're saying that we have to, for example, trauma surgery, there is no trauma surgeons in Sweden because the volumes are so different. You need to get people to get to work together because the volumes are too low that you can do things just you yourself. And I don't think we find the right way to do it by now. I don't know if Shaheen has a comment there on this issue uh, from our perspective. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fox. And I'm gonna probably I'm work with Tal in Örebro and I'm much involved in European trauma society as well as the visual chair there. And this is something that we are looking at and the problem goes both way in Europe. Our vascular surgeons, like you saw, are at center 100% endovascular. What happens when it's going to go open? And the other way is that the trauma surgeons, they don't do endovascular. So this is a European problem, and we are struggling with how we're going to put up our systems to meet those patients that need the open surgery when that is needed and the vascular surgery when it's needed. And we are far, far from way to answer that question right now. So it's basically institution dependent. At our center, we do have a good collaboration, me and Tal, when he was there, that uh, obviously I can do more open, going to abdomen, chest, and Tal is much more vascular. So if you're in the same room, we're gonna fix it. But neither of us can do it just alone. All right, thank you. Dr. Goh. So I just want to share about this international differences so in brazil we are now conducting a study and uh, i'm very worried about the some results i told, told this yesterday so we found about 15 percent of the cases of femoral popliteal injuries vascular surgeons are actually doing some things that are written in all textbooks don't do that <laughs> like for example you ligate the femoral vein and you use the saphenous vein from the same limb to do the arterial reconstruction. And that's a problem in Brazil. In Brazil, um, vascular surgeons are very focused on aesthetic procedures and venous procedures for economic reasons, mostly. And we are forgetting about vascular trauma. And that's a challenge to train the new generations of vascular surgeons in Brazil regarding vascular trauma. Thank you, KJ. Um, so one thing about the integrated programs, uh, the ACGME does recognize that there's been a criticism of the open experience versus endo experience and the comfortability for these integrated residents coming out. Uh, so there's been changes over and over again to programs and requirements. Um, I've been working on the PIF for our integrated residency here that we're trying to start for the last two years. And every time I get something ready for a submission, they change the requirements. And so I have to rewrite it. So that's happening around the clock. But in reality, it's a paradigm that's not going away, right? More programs are coming up. More programs are becoming even more selective. Actually, Integrated Vascular this last year was the most selective and uh, sought after residency out of all the residencies. It's the first time that's happened. And so I don't see this going away. So we can debate whether integrated versus fellowship trained is the right way to go. I mean, I was trained traditionally, just like most of the people here, but it's not going away. So either we have to embrace it and work with the integrated residents to get them up to snuff, or we will go the way of the dinosaurs. Well, I, th I think it also goes both ways, though, especially looking at um, the military population and the more rural trauma centers where kind of the advent of these integrated programs and the like earlier specialization of trainees result in us creating a generation of trauma surgeons who are used to calling somebody else to do their SFA or their popliteal repairs. And there's no vascular surgeon to call when you're deployed. And there, you know, if you are the surgeon at some remote hospital and someone comes in with an ischemic or hemorrhagic leg, there's no vascular surgeon to call. So it, it's a real, like, it's a, it's a real problem that needs to be addressed, not just on this front of the integrated vascular residents maybe have less contextualization of the polytrauma, but the, the trauma surgeons are also becoming less and less able or comfortable to manage their own vascular injuries, which in a large center you can get away with, but not in other environments. Dr. Rasmussen. Well, I, I noticed some, you know, we have some esteemed members and leaders of the AAST 
uh, past and present. Um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on why don't the vascular programs teach this? Why doesn't vascular do this and that? And we'll work on our vascular surgery PIF. And, but I'm, I, I, you know, having faced this challenge uh, what, during my active duty time, uh, watching us deploy general surgeons downrange, you know, and having, you know, half dozen or a dozen of us as, as vascular trained surgeons in the military, far too few to, 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 to deploy. In my mind, I, I thought that when we developed the trauma acute care surgery model, I thought that was, you know, wasn't that going to be the training paradigm that really put vascular trauma where it had been, which was in the hands of the knowledgeable sort of uh, people who treat trauma and are best for the trauma and severely injured patient. But it seems like acute care surgery now is, it's just not worked out. And I, again, I'm not part of that guild as much now, but I'm curious to maybe hear from Dr. Moore or, or uh, Dr. Scalia or others um, as to, is there a way to make, put this back in arguably where it really should be with the trauma surgeons? Yeah, I, a couple of things uh, that came to mind for me. One is for, uh, I think um, you were asking about the training program. Uh, you know, I think that uh, it's pretty clear that the integrated vascular training program is is the dominant training program by far right now. And, and probably the the fellowship program is going to be going away or is going to be very, very small percentage of the trainees in vascular surgery in the near future. And that's just the reality um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and then I think, Todd, to your point about, you know, when is, is trauma going to take this back over? I, I guess the way I see it is like, you know, they own the patients. Patient, they're there. Trauma patient comes in. If you want to fix it, fix it. That's the way we handled it, our program. You know, like the vast majority of, of vascular injuries are managed by the, the trauma surgeons because they can do it. They want to do it. And if they know they have backup from us, if they need it. And I think that's just they're going to have to be the paradigm. They have, you own the patient. So if you want to take care of it, you got to do it. The more you do, the more you do. Yeah. Open ended. Correct. <coughs> well, uh, I was a past president of the WST, but my views uh, are, do not represent the WST. In fact, are uh, not popular among the WST. I uh, submit the uh, tax concept was a failure uh, because we went into shift work and we focused on EGS, trauma, ICU with teams, and ultimately the so-called tax surgeon, if you look at what they do, in most centers in this country, they do colostectomies and appendectomies. So to get back in the mode of training trauma surgeons to do open vascular, and we should do a collegial, obviously, with our endovascular colleagues. It's often a hybrid approach to these things. We need to have discipline. So in our institution, we don't hire anyone who's not interested in doing open vascular work. And in fact, they are required to start the open vascular if they, quote, feel uncomfortable, can't find a femoral artery, then they can call the, the, the end of ask a person to help them. But we're never going to get back in that mode if we don't start the discipline of making trauma surgeons in this country do end of ask or work. So speaking for our own institution, um, we are there as a backup for the trauma surgeons. And I think importantly, if we do come, come in, it's the trauma fellows who will do the case with us. It's not the vascular fellows, uh, which to me is important because it is getting them experience. Are the vascular fellows being slightly neglected because they don't get the trauma vascular experience? Sure, and there's a balance to be struck probably by someone who's not me. Yes, please. So I have a question for the panel and Dr. Rasmussen. There is a discussion going on that we as trauma surgeons should do some kind of endovascular, but here, here's the problem. Those endovascular trauma surgeons that I know in US, they do have their uh, private practice or the elective practice. And doing the ACS model set up here in United States with the emergency surgery or in Europe, it doesn't allow us to do the elective part as well. So then, then we have this problem. How many cases training us to do the endovascular is one thing. Keeping on, on that, what we are trained in. in I, I got my training actually at uh, the Urbru at the same time as Tal did. Six months after I was finished with my training in vascular, I forgot everything because anything that was on the shelf, it was gone. So, so the, the question is not just training us in the vascular training for 
embolization or the stent for the minor injuries or the easy ones, as you call it, the subclavian. How are we going to keep on that, what we have learned on time? Any comments on that? Yeah, uh, well, yes, <laughs> I think you're right. Um, you know, you, you can't, it doesn't matter how much you train. If you don't do it for 20 years, you're not going to be able to do it proficiently. And so it really comes down to um, doing what you are good at and, and trying to develop a practice that mimics what you want to do. I think I also agree with Dr. Moore's point, which is that, um, and part of the reason why I, I got out of um, just doing trauma and, and emergency general surgery was because I, I felt like the gallbladder and appendectomy does not help you become a better trauma surgeon. It, it does not help you at all in my mind. So what's the point of having that and being a trauma surgeon? It's because of convenience or whatever. But I think that if you, the, the training pattern for trauma has to change if they want to develop an endovascular tool, toolkit. The current training paradigm does not work for that. The current practice does not work for that. But it doesn't mean it couldn't. I mean, shock trauma is a perfect example of how they can make that happen. It's, it's a fairly unique model, but um, maybe it's, it's uh, vascular surgeons who want to do trauma and do a residency in vascular surgery and then do a fellowship in trauma. But then they actually practice in vascular, like Paul, and then, and then do trauma as well. But I think the current system will not work for that. I think uh, since my name was called out on the last question, I mean, one, one proposal would be to have the tax surgeon take on vascular emergencies. So you, if a, there's an embolus, you know, uh, thrombos, pop the teal artery aneurysm, lice it. Do the arteriogram, put a catheter down, and start lytic therapy. Uh, do a thrombectomy of an AFib uh, embolus that's in the brachial artery. I mean, do all of acute care surgery, which, you know, a good portion of that, there are nights when the vascular surgeons operate more than the traditional quote unquote trauma surgeons because vascular emergencies. So, you know, I, I think, you know, all of these things would have to be done proactively with your system. Each system, it's all different. It'll have to be local. But I mean, one model that I've always thought about was having the tax surgeon take all of, uh, you know, ACS, which is vascular emergencies as well. And just because you start them doesn't mean you have to finish them. Start the lytic case, you know, do the diagnostic, put a wire down the popliteal and put an infusion catheter and call. It would be good for us. I know that. So um, just one thing I wanted to add, I guess, is that, you know, we when we started our integrated vascular program, what we found was that the quality of the applicants went up and the um, their skills and um, ability with by the time they finished was better. And so in my mind, that is the dominant training program. Um, so I would put this out to the trauma surgeons of saying like, why don't you have your own integrated trauma residency, like from start to finish intern year to five, six, seven, whatever, do trauma and train in trauma. Don't train to be a general surgeon, whichever that, whatever that means right now, because that right now means appies and colleagues. There's a lot to, <clears throat> a lot to digest. So I'm going back a couple of speakers to address some of the comments, but I like your idea. Great. You know, my 12 years at the same place, I've seen sort of some perspective on some of this. And I, while I'm double trained, I don't, I don't, I haven't practiced as a trauma surgeon in over 10 years. So take that, take that bias as a vascular surgeon, if you will. And, you know, well-intentioned trauma folks will come in and say, I want to do my own vascular. I want to learn how to do it. But we've seen this year alone, a doubling of our trauma activations. We have um, more and more data coming out, as my understanding, I defer to the trauma surgeons, looking at what that shift should look like. What is the appropriate number of hours in a row to work to provide high quality patient care? And what I've seen over time is I'll have a senior surgeon who has been doing this a while and will call for help. And they'll call for help, not because they don't know how to do it, but because they have like three rooms running, right? There's a spleen that's coming out. There's some sick person in the ICU. I can't commit two, three hours to an SFA repair. And that's fine. But then I'll see the same person the next week admonish the junior trauma faculty member as saying, hey, you shouldn't call vascular. You should figure out how to do that on your own. And I'll just say that juxtaposition I've always worried about a little bit. I... I view it as right now in the current state, 
the vascular attending on call is the ultimate backup attending. That that's what we are. Honestly, we get called for X percentage of vascular injuries, and it has more to do with what else is going on in the world than who's doing it or how senior they are or not, honestly, or how interested they are, because everyone's interested. And we have to, <laughs> Greg disagrees, we have to change our mindset to make sure that vascular is represented well on the COT, that when you start talking about pay call structures for the trauma attending, vascular is a part of that because we are the ultimate backup attendings and it has nothing to do with how experienced or how well-intentioned the person in the hospital is. That's my take on it. I couldn't agree with any of that more. Thank you. This has been an excellent discussion. Um, as I mentioned before, there's not a lot of vascular surgeons in the United States. I think there's not even 3,000 active vascular surgeons in the USLZ from what I saw at the SVS business meeting this year. Um, not that I'm aware of, nobody has an in-house vascular surgeon. So you need someone to the hospital. Who better than the trauma surgeon to take care of these people? I will tell you what we've done in Puerto Rico in our center. We haven't fully embraced the trauma uh, critical care for the reasons said here. We actually have the trauma team, the trauma attending in-house, taking care of trauma. There's a separate attending for general surgery. Because if not, it'll happen where Robbie's mentioning. You know, they'll do a gallbladder, something comes in, they don't want to commit. But the person who's in the hospital, you're the wall. You're the first line of the fence. You need to be able to at least start to take care of the patient. So for the training paradigms, that has to change. I agree that the, there should be some overhaul of the trauma acute care surgery. It has to include vascular. I get criticized because I can do a lot of procedures percutaneously, but I will force the cut down because I need my residents, my general surgery residents, to learn how to do a cut down, to learn how to do an angio, to learn how to do a closure and arteriotomy. And I get excited when they call me later, oh, I did this case with so-and-so skin to skin because you, know, you showed me how to do this, that's great but we need to teach them. I think it's a little condescending to think uh, our trauma surgeons can't do some of these procedures. When we started doing Reboa, I got called for every case. Now they don't call me unless there's a complication because they're facile with it. They can learn and they can keep up their skills. So I think we do need to overhaul our training and the trauma acute care system, which I don't think works. All right, thank you. We have time for one more question before lunch. Milos. I'm gonna jump on Dr. Moore's coattails here and, and maybe say something that the AAST wouldn't be too happy about. But when we, my generation especially, we talk a lot about work-life balance, work-life integration. Oh, no. How do we educate my generation that when I look around this room and I think about all the hours and the procedures done by everybody, that to be very good at this, if we're going to have a trauma surgeon that can take care of most vascular injuries, that you have to dedicate time. How do we push back a little bit and tell people, hey, you know, you, you want to tell everybody that you're a triple threat, that you're academic, that you're clinically excellent, that you're in a position of power, that you have to dedicate time. And that means, you know, to AAST, we talked about, well, nobody wants to work more than 60 hours in fellowship or in their first five years of practice, you're just not going to get the reps to become a surgeon who can deal with these things. And we're going to be in this position where vascular takes care of vascular and trauma just calls vascular. So how do we educate my generation to say, you need to give up more of your time if you want to be a good surgeon? What a non-controversial question. <laughs> Time for Lisa. We're going to have to give up some of your time so we can go get no. I, I would get rid of the phrase triple threat. I think what we're talking about here is clinical excellence. And so, you know, there, phase your career, right? We're talking about don't try to do all three phases of a triple threat in your first five years. Just be clinically excellent. And uh, the research will follow. You're going to be a natural educator if you're clinically excellent. But don't try to do, I think the, 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 over, the, the overused term is a triple threat. I think that intimidates and frustrates and, and, and somewhat mystifies some of, well, everyone, all of us. But I think phasing the career, and what we're really talking about here is, is clinical excellence and, and clinical skills, uh, broadening them. And don't worry about writing case reports or case reviews. 
or being, you know, uh, overly, especially in your first three to five years in your career, just be clinically excellent and learn new things. And uh, yeah, that would, that's how I would start that. I'm, I'm actually surprised that the phrase triple threat is still being used because when I was a vascular fellow, which is at this point a decade ago, uh, I think there was a talk about how triple threat is not something that's possible for the young, uh, young surgeon. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's possible for anybody. If you're <laughs> if you're going to be that clinically active, it means you're maybe not doing everything else unless it's, you're. It is over time. Yeah, but you you know um, you can do it all. You just can't do it all at the same time. I think if you look at a phase career, five, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, it, all phases will come to those who pursue pursue them. But I think we frustrate ourselves when you know we get a graduate out and they want to be a triple threat and they want to work six. 60 hours a week and they want to be well paid and they want it all in the first three years that that's just not going to work right so just give me interesting cases yeah. that's it. I, th I think um also your question is really about um clinical excellence right and 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 time and it's really about efficiency of time right because there's only so many hours in a day and there's only so many days in a week etc so uh focusing your time on the things that are most critical. Uh, and I think one of the challenges Dr. Moore brought up and I couldn't agree more is that if you're trying to be a intensivist and you're trying to be an emergency general surgeon and you're trying to be a trauma surgeon and you're trying to learn endovascular skills, there's just too many things. Um, and especially under a shift work um, paradigm. So you have to find a couple of those things, maybe two to be really good at and accept the fact that those other things are gonna be somebody else's job. That's what I, my, my opinion. My boss has a phrase for it. It's called pick a major. Yep. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So we have a resident session in here. I'd encourage anyone who can come in here uh, with their lunch uh, to do so. And then we have our keynote speaker at one o'clock. So please be back in here at least by one. work is being performed. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, everyone. So uh, now we're going to have our, uh, um, well, we call it, it's called a resident session, but we actually want to call it the EVTM ST uh, session uh, because it's not just residents, but basically uh, people in training uh, and their chance to present their work. Um, we have uh, five interesting abstracts that have been submitted that we're going to uh, uh, go through. Um, in order, so I would like to, uh, as the first speaker, invite to the stage. I'm going to see if I can pronounce this right. Danushka Vitarna. Vitarna. Sorry. Yeah. Good afternoon, okay. everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Uh, Danushka Vitharna. I'm a second year general surgery resident from LSU New Orleans. Um, I'd like to thank uh, EBTM for giving me the opportunity to speak. I will be talking today about a case report on. Uh, partial reboa in the setting of non-traumatic gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so we have a 46-year-old female, uh, no known past medical history. She presented to the ED with AMS. Um, upon arrival, she was tachycardic to the 150s, 160s, um, Blood glucose was normal, and while in the uh, ED, she became unresponsive, went into PEA, and at that point, uh, ACLS was initiated. Um, so at that point, she was intubated, and orogastric tube was placed uh, with return of approximately one and a half liters of bright red blood. At that point, it was suspected that she had an upper GI bleed. Um, at that point, massive transfusion protocol was initiated. Uh, trauma surgery was consulted uh, for you know, the suspected uh, upper GI bleed. Um, an arterial line, a uh, femoral arterial line was placed as well as a central line. Uh, at that point, a partial reboa was uh, exchanged for the arterial line. It was placed in the zone one 
with the balloon inflated to 20 cc's in uh, two mil increments. Uh, after placement of the partial Reboa, uh, pressures were intermittently detected below the balloon. So uh, at this point, uh, it was planned that uh, the patient was to be taken to the OR for an exploratory laparotomy with a angiogram and possible embolization once um, the patient was stabilized and had return of spontaneous circulation. Uh, interventional radiology was also consulted. Um, however, and um, you know, in, this, uh, throughout resuscitative efforts, uh, the partial Reboa remained um, inflated. Uh, unfortunately, before the patient was actually able to undergo definitive uh, intervention for the suspected upper GI blade, uh, she went into PEA, and uh, at that point, any further resuscitative efforts uh, were terminated. So altogether, including you know, CPR, uh, MTP, uh, placement of the, P ro uh, the partial Reboa, uh, these efforts totaled greater than two hours, uh, and then the patient unfortunately expired. Um, so from this case, uh, this shows a use of partial Reboa in the setting of non-traumatic hemorrhage. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, while the patient was hemodynamically unstable and, you know, did not, was not able to undergo definitive intervention for the suspected bleed, uh, the partial Reboa was able to improve the patient's hemodynamic status and also be used as a temporizing measure until the patient could undergo definitive intervention. And distal perfusion, as uh, evidenced by the pressures that were observed below the balloon, um, was maintained while uh, the partial Reboa was inflated, which is particularly important in the setting of you know, concern for ischemia reperfusion injuries, uh, particularly with um, complete Reboa. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank Dr. Smith and open up the floor for any questions. Okay, I, I don't know. I think we may have a thank you very much, and and I think maybe we have a first uh, question from Dr. Fox. Nicely presented, and thank you for submitting an abstract to this meeting and traveling to the uh, symposium. Um, when you placed the Reboa, uh, you mentioned that it was inflated to 20 milliliters. And um, so I have a few technical questions. Um, do you guys use ultrasound when you do your femoral access? Uh, yes, we do. So I think that's a good skill to have. When you get used to using it all the time, you learn a lot of things from the technology that will help you uh, use it in other settings. And sometimes, uh, although femoral access can be done without the use of ultrasound, you gain a lot of skills. Mm -hmm. And I'd encourage you guys, uh, residents, trainees, uh, to use ultrasound at every chance you can. Secondly, you don't get a lot of tactile feedback uh, from these balloons. So you should inflate it very slowly and uh, use small volumes when possible because you don't want to overinflate and cause an intimal tear. I'm not sure what you get with 20 milliliters, but I think it's pretty fully inflated by that point. Gotcha. Thank you. I've got a question too. Great talk. Uh, do you think the patient would have survived with the complete Reboa? <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. I, I'm honestly not sure. It, it's hard to say just, you know, I wasn't present in the case, but from, you know, looking at the chart and everything, it seems like they were, you know, pretty unstable to begin with. So, you know, I'm not sure whether complete Rebo in this case would have necessarily, um, you know, been better at temporizing them to, you know, be able to be transported to, and actually undergo like operative intervention. Do you know what vessel was bleeding? Did no. you do an, an autopsy afterwards? Uh, uh, that, I, yeah, I'm not unsure of the autopsy results. Um, we weren't able to uh, ascertain what vessel was bleeding. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Sam Bader, uh, also from Sweden. 
um, who will be speaking to us about cerebral hemodynamics and intracranial pressure during controlled hemorrhagic shock and resusc resuscitation with total endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta in an animal model. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, present our uh, experiment on animals. Um, my name is uh, uh, Sam Bader. I'm a general surgeon at Urbu University Hospital and PhD student at Urbu University. Um, I would like to thank my supervisor, Magnus Olivi Kruna, uh, who's attending us today. He's a professor in neurosurgery from Sweden. Uh, I'm going to talk about cerebral hemodynamics and intracranial pressure during controlled hemorrhagic shock and resuscitation with total endovascular balloon occlusion of the Rebua in animal model. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, hemorrhagic shock due to trauma carries a high rate of fatal outcome if surgical intervention is delayed. However, Rebua can provide a bridge to, def to definite surgical control. Uh, the association of brain injury and hemorrhagic shock in trauma is frequent, uh, but the use of Reboa uh, in uh, traumatic brain uh, surgery patients uh, is still contraindicated. The aim of our study is to assess changing of cerebral hemodynamics and intercranial pressure in animals without or with elevated ICB during controlled hemorrhagic shock and resuscitation with Reboa. Uh, here is the flow of our study. Uh, uh, we have included 19 animals uh, uh, divided in two groups. Uh, the first group with 11 animals with normal initial ICP. And the second group is with uh, eight animals with uh, elevated uh, initial ICP uh, up to 25 to 30 millimeter mercury. Um, uh, after um, stabilization phase for 60 minutes. Uh, uh, all the animals underwent bleeding for 30 minutes, uh, up to 40% or to 40% of their uh, initial blood volume. Um, the second group with initial elevated ICP underwent an artificial uh, elevation of ICP. Um, and then um, both uh, um, uh, main arterial pressure and ICP was monitored. Uh, we um, started the occlusion of aorta totally for uh, 120 minutes, and um, our vital parameters were monitored. Uh, here, the experimental time, the experiment timeline. Uh, the results of the study here we show in this diagram. Uh, it talks about mean arterial pressure. We see an in decreasing of uh, MAP uh, during the bleeding phase for the first 30 minutes. Uh, it went down to low levels, but before we activated Reboa, uh, after we activated Reboa, the MAP increased to high levels, uh, up to 170 millimeter mercury in animals with uh, uh, head trauma and uh, um, uh, up to 140 millimeter mercury in the uh, animals with normal uh, initial ICP. This difference continued till the end of the experiment. Here we are talking about uh, ICP. Animals with uh, initial normal ICP had a normal stable ICP during all the experiment. On the other hand, uh, initial elevated ICP animals uh, had a further elevation of ICP uh, after applying the total reboa, uh, ICP reached a maximum up to 40 millimeter mercury uh, 10 minutes after the application of reboa, then started to decrease to the baseline. We calculated also perfusion pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure. We see here the same pattern in MAP, uh, decreasing of uh, CPP um, down to uh, catastrophic levels in group two with the initial elevated ICP. But when we applied Reboa, we see that the CPP got up to high levels in both groups and then uh, uh, start to decrease gradually to normal levels. Uh, we tried to evaluate um, uh, cerebral uh, autoregulation by calculating uh, long modified uh, uh, cerebral pressure reactivity index. 
uh, the normal, if it, when that uh, PRX is under zero, then the autoregulation used to be intact. We see here in the diagram that uh, there is alteration uh, uh, of autoregulation in both groups, uh, but it's more pronounced in animals with initial elevated ICP. On conclusion, Reboa restored the cerebral circulation in animals with hemorrhagic shock with normal or elevated ICP. Cerebral autoregulation auto is affected in both groups during hemorrhagic shock and Reboa, however, more pronounced in animals with elevated ICP. Thank you. Question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do, do we have any questions from the audience? I think we have one. <clears throat> yeah, very nice work. I assume you're talking about zone one, Reboa, when you talk about our occlusion. Exactly. Uh, how did you uh, increase the intracranial pressure? Because it's one thing to put a balloon in there and increase dural pressure. It's another to have a brain injury in which your uh, barrier is broken down. So that might have more profound effects. And secondly, you showed your systolic pressure got to 140. And I think most of us use Reboa clinically keep the systolic under 120 when we think we have a head injury. Yeah, uh, first of all, we induced an artificial ICP elevation by to simulate an epidural, acute epidural hematoma. And it was we, by the help of um, uh, catheter with balloon, like a fully catheter. Uh, so we could, uh, under bleeding phase, control that the ICP reach up to between 25 and 30 millimeter mercury. Um, uh, your other, your, your second question is about, uh, um, uh, it's about uh, total reboa. It's total reboa with zone one uh, that we used in our experiment. Um, uh. If I may. Uh, Magnus Lieberkren uh, from your University of Brune, neurosurgeon. Uh, it's a very interesting, important question you're asking about the ICP as a ex extra cerebral expens expensivity or an intraparenchymous bleeding. But looking at it, it is in the time frame of what we are doing here and what you are doing with the Reboa, it's, it's the acute phase. Most patients, do, even if they do have contusions, don't uh, create high, very high intracranial pressures in the acute phase. It's coming along, which could be exacerbated by juicing the reboa and increasing the blood pressure. So far, so right. But I think if to study the effects of reboa on the cerebral circulation, it's easier way to study the general increase of ICP within the skull. And that, that's why we have chosen the epidural mo mode and to see what is doing acutely. And as you saw, we had a, a CPP of eight in, at, the, at the activation of the Reboa, which is a catastrophic ICP. So there is also a problem. But, that's short answer to your very intelligent question. Thank you very much. May I ask, did you um, see any increased bleeding in those patients with the increased ICP, or was it uh, edema? Perhaps yeah. it was too early to develop edema. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's like this model. Uh, we don't have that. The brain is intact. We don't have any brain injury, con brain contusion. It's just we did an elevation ICP, which reflects uh, the general state of the brain. We are interested mostly not on focal uh, lesions in the brain, but we are we were interested about the physiology when it be, when the brain is suffering by edema. It used to take time to develop edema in injured brain. So we can do it within one hour. It can take up to 24 hours. But what was important for us just to understand the basic physiology about uh, uh, the consequences of edema on hemodynamics when the, when the ICP is high. This, it was important to understand this mechanism. Right, thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. Thank I think you. we need to carry on uh, if we're going to keep time. So I'd like to invite our next speaker, uh, Catherine Foley, uh, who's going to be speaking about reduction of distal ischemia with p Reboa Pro uh, in a trauma laparotomy requiring extended time. Hi, my name is Kate Foley. I'm a PGY2 general surgery resident at LSU in New Orleans. And thank you guys for the opportunity pr to present here today. I have no disclosures. So this was a case of a 23-year-old male who was involved in a, a high-speed MBC, was ejected from the vehicle. Uh, the report was he was GCS3 in the field, was intubated at that time, brought into the trauma bay, was hypotensive, and initially uh, responded well to transfusion. So an A-line was placed in the right femoral, um, and chest X-ray in the trauma bay revealed bilateral pneumothoraces. So he got um, chest tubes on both sides. Um, at that time, he was being resuscitated and was stable for transfer to the CT scanner. Um, this revealed a grade five kidney lack and a grade three splenic lack. So he was brought to our trauma ICU uh, following his CT scan. And upon arrival to the unit, he got acutely hypotensive and profoundly hypoxic. Um, additional tube thoracostomies were performed and he was being actively uh, resuscitated, including MTV, MTP was activated. He had to be started on levofed and vasopressin. So resuscitation was ongoing. And at that time it was decided to place the partial Reboa. So this was placed at the side of the um, existing A-line, advanced to zone one, and the balloon was inflated. Um, so this stabilized his pressure in addition, it allowed time to wean the pressors and stabilize his ventilator significantly so that he could go to the OR. Um, so for the partial Reboa in this case, um, the catheter was advanced to zone one, 46 centimeters, and the balloon was inflated in increments of two cc's with a final volume of six. So the proximal blood pressure got up to about 130 and the distal was about 100. And the total partial occlusion time was about 60 minutes, which is, um, kind of twice as long as we like to see it. Um, so he was able to be taken to the OR, uh, remained hemodynamically stable, and in the following uh, perioperative, postoperative period, his creatinine peaked at 1.6, and he um, had adequate urine output. So his operative course, uh, he had a midline laparotomy, a left nephrectomy was performed. Um, there was massive bleeding noted from the kidney, his abdomen was packed and he had an abthera placed uh, as a temporary abdominal closure. And the Reboa at this point was taken out as he was hemodynamically stable and the bleeding was controlled. So in this case, this um, partial Reboa allowed for temporization of non-compressible truncal hemorrhage. And um, even with this 60 minute occlusion time, a partial occlusion time in zone one, um, and in the setting of a nephrectomy, there was no subsequent evidence of uh, end organ damage, particularly concern for the kidneys. Um, and importantly, in this case, it allowed for the team to stabilize his respiratory status and his ventilator, um, in addition to weaning pressors uh, prior to bringing him to the operating room for a better outcome. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you to Dr. Smith, our research mentor. Thank you very much. I think we have a question from Dr. Fox. Yeah, nicely presented. Um, you just make the point that sometimes the Reboa can be left in longer than you want. So what is your institutional practice to sort of make sure that you're monitoring that time and who is in charge of sort of progressive deflations? Yeah, so um, when they're put in in the trauma bay, I, I've, I have not personally been part of when they're putting them in an ICU, but in the trauma bay, it's always something that's shouted out as part of, you know, everything that's happening um, and it's recorded. And a lot of times the residents on the trauma or ICU service We'll write that down also. And somebody is required to stay with the patient in the CT scanner. Usually it's deflated in the scanner for a short time, inflated if it needs to be, and same with uh, bringing somebody to the operating room. So there's always continuity. There's someone that has to stay with the patient. Um, so one thing that we've written about is the possibility of just having that provider that's inserting it, like take a marking pen and just write on the patient's skin or something so that even if you do shout it out, mm -hmm. that you really know that it is documented by somebody. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, so I have one question too. So um, <clears throat> how's it work in your practice? 
the per when you're doing partial reboa, one of the things that we can find in our center is that the, the balloon can migrate if you don't have someone um, holding it all the time and, and, and keeping track of the inflation. Um, how does that work in your center? Do you is there always someone that's dedicated that's that's keeping track of the balloon, or is uh, is it done by someone that's also simultaneously doing something else? I am actually not sure how that usually goes. Um, I don't know, Dr. Smith. Do you know that? Some someone monitoring the balloon inflation so it doesn't migrate. Uh, yeah. You, you suture the balloon in place. No, sorry, we suture the catheter. Catheter, oh, yeah. So that, that the balloon shouldn't migrate. But in this patient, we didn't have the ability to do that imaging, but that was another way to monitor make sure it didn't migrate as well. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, our next speaker is Anna Stene Hutsian from Örebro in Sweden who will be speaking about um, a porcine uh, study on hemorrhagic shock uh, comparing end tidal carbon dioxide uh, targeted uh, and proximal systolic blood pressure targeted partial reboa um, in the mitigation of embolic uh, injury. So thank you. My name is Anna Stenevichian and I'm a resident in vascular surgery at the University Hospital in Örebro, Sweden. And the short version of the title is Partial Reboa and Hemorrhagic Shock, Carbon Dioxide versus pressure, uh, Blood Pressure Targeted um, Occlusion. And I have uh, no disclosures. So partial is a way to allow a permissive blood flow across the uh, occlusion balloon and thereby restrict the perfused distal organs and um, it limits the accumulation of metabolites and the subsequent metabolic acidosis, which also makes it possible for a longer occlusion time. But the definition of the word partial is not uh, yet settled, and um, clin clinical markers of degree of occlusion, metabolic disturbance, and end organ injury are lacking. Today, we use both clinically and in research settings, the uh, blood pressure, the proximal blood pressure, the distal blood pressure, intra-balloon pressure, pressure gradient, and there's also been designed special devices to uh, control distal blood flow. But none of these markers can alone provide enough information about tissue perfusion and the metabolic state at uh, the end organ. End tidal carbon dioxide has been suggested as an indicator of partial reboa since it correlates to oxygen consumption and also to uh, aortic uh, blood flow as seen in this previous study by a research group and can be useful um, when using partial reboa. So the aim of this study was to test the hypothesis if um, partial reboa targeted by entero carbon dioxide would cause less metabolic disturbance than partial reboa targeted by uh, proximal systolic blood pressure. And um, we used uh, 20 pigs that were uh, anesthetized and surgically prepared, and they underwent uh, grade 4 hemorrhage, and then uh, they were randomized to either carbon dioxide or blood pressure targeted um, partial reboa for 45 minutes. We aimed for an anti-tidal carbon dioxide level at 90 to 110% of the values before start of occlusion and a systolic blood pressure at 80 to 100 millimeter mercury. And we followed the reperfusion for three hours and collecting data of hemodynamics, respiratory variables, biomarkers, blood gases, and uh, biopsy of, from the intestines at the end of the experiments. And uh, what we could see during the occlusion was that we had a significantly higher end tidal carbon dioxide value in the carbon dioxide targeted group compared to the blood pressure targeted group. But we could not see any significant difference when it came to systolic blood pressure during the same time. And similar which results could also be seen for uh, aortic blood flow, even though not significant. And during the reperfusion, we had a um, significantly higher arterial lactate and mesenteric venous lactate level in the 
blood pressure targeted group compared to the carbon dioxide targeted group. And here we could see similar results also for other biomarkers such as uh, troponin and uh, creatinine, but not significant. So in this uh, model of hemorrhagic shock, entitled carbon dioxide targeted partial reboa seemed to cause less metabolic disturbance with uh, no disadvantages hemodynamic impact and uh, should be investigated uh, in uh, further clinical studies. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so do we have any questions from the floor? I think it seems like Dr. Holcomb has one. Yeah, it's a great presentation. Just, can I just clarify something? You used the systolic pressure above the balloon to define partial yes. reboa? Wouldn't it make more sense to define it below the balloon? Yeah. Versus you... it, I mean, I really like the idea of the untitled. It's pretty neat. But why not below the balloon? That's an idea of doing a study like that. But since it's most commonly used to use the systolic blood pressure above the balloon in clinical settings, we chose to compare with the proximal pressure in this study. Just because it's common doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very, uh, very nice work, but I think it also has a message that we all should be aware of, and that is when we include the aorta, the end tidal CO2 drops rather than increases. So when we're in the uh, operating room and anesthesia, we're, saying we're putting the rebo up, and suddenly they said, well, the end tidal is dropping, you must be doing something wrong. Uh, but I think it's important for us to recognize that we, uh, when we preclude blood flowing to the torso, we're going to have a reduction in oxygen consumption. My question, though, in, in your study, and I'm sure you're just starting this, is what's the evidence in terms of organ ischemic markers? Uh, do you look at uh, liver, kidney, gut in terms of their ischemic insult based on your randomization? Well, our primary outcome was arterial lactate levels. So it was yeah, lactate, lactate and other biomarkers. But we also looked at the uh, histo histology of the intestines. Okay, so I think we need to carry on in the sake of time. Thank you very much. Uh, so our final speaker now is uh, Paige Deville, who is going to be uh, talking to us about supporting cardiac perfusion with partial Reboa uh, Pro, uh, reduced uh, visual ischemia during extended occlusion. Hello, my name is Paige Deville. I'm a current LSU general surgery resident in New Orleans. Um, I'd like to thank um, y'all for the opportunity to come and present this today. I have no disclosures. So this patient uh, presented, he's a 28 year old male, uh, restrained driver in an MVC presented with multiple injuries. He pre-hospital did not receive any blood. He got three liters of normal saline on the way. But on arrival, he was not, we were not able to get a non-invasive blood pressure. Um, so at that time, the decision was made to place an A-line, um, obviously. And then systolic blood pressure was returned at 50. So we ended up putting a Reboa in and inflated it partially uh, at zone one, 48 centimeters. And again, mass transfusion protocol was um, initiated. So on a uh, physical exam, the only uh, positive finding was abdominal seatbelt sign. Um, and then chest x-ray obviously showed a left um, hemothorax. We put a chest tube in that immediately had two liters of blood pour out of it. Um, and fast exam was within normal limits at this time. Um, his blood pressure was still dropping, so at this point he was too unstable for any further imaging, and we took him straight to the operating room. So initially our approach was a median sternotomy. Um, at this time the Reboa was still partially inflated. We kept systolics uh, approximately about 80s, and um, systolics below the occlusion were uh, anywhere from 30 to 90. Um, we found that there was a hole in the left ventricle at the bifurcation of the LAD. Um, and so we repaired that cardiac defect, ligated the lima, and um, closed up, attempted to de deflate the Reboa in the OR, but the patient actually did not tolerate that. Um, he became hypotensive. So at that point, we immediately reinflated it to maintain a proximal blood pressure of 120. And we did an exploratory laparotomy to evaluate for intra-abdominal um, bleed. We found a duodenal hematoma um, 
moderate hemoperitonea, mostly in the right upper quadrant, uh, and then a small mesenteric injury that was ligated, uh, suture ligated. So at that point, uh, we packed the abdomen, put a, a temporary dressing of aptera on, and we were able to successfully deflate the Reboa in the OR this time. Oh, and also to mention on the exploratory laparotomy, the bowel uh, was run from the ligamentotrites all the way um, to TI, and there was no signs of any ischemia, there was no duskiness, um, no concern for any kind of um, ischemic insult. Postoperatively, his course was pretty uneventful. He had adequate urine output study at all times, never dropped, um, and his creatinine peaked at 1.05. So in summary, um, in this case, the partial Reboa was used to support cardiac perfusion um, that bridged him to the operative definitive repair and um, was able to be occluded for three hours without any ischemic insult to the kidneys or bowel or any um, sequelae that you worry about with the occlusion. And then we also had that unknown mesoteric injury that it prevented more bleeding into the abdomen um, unknowingly at the time. And that's all, any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions on the floor? Hey, Luke Neff from Wake Forest University. Also, disclosure, I work for Certus um, and involved with that company. But one of the things that we've noticed clinically is we're trying to titrate commercially available devices um, in the operating room or in the ED is uh, the fidelity with which you do that. And so I guess one of the questions, I'm assuming you were involved in that case. It sounds like you were. I was not, but... Okay. Uh, how they actually did that, you know, was it manual with the syringe? Was it a big spin syringe, little syringe? Was mm -hmm. it a rotational inflation device, which is, you know, has its own set of issues, but it does give you more control. So that would be one, one question I had. Okay. And Dr. Smith might better be able to answer that. Um, okay. And then uh, I guess the other question would just be how, was the process of setting up that distal pressure monitoring? Were you doing off the flush sheath of the or the flush board of the of the introducer sheath and and sometimes navigating a several sets of of pressure transduction devices can be a little bit challenging. So just wondered how you all work through that clinically. Right. Um Dr. Yeah, I, I have one question. Um, so, so you said that you, you're targeting your blood pressure to around the 80s, above the balloon, and then the, mm. the pressures below the balloon were between 30 and 90, I think you said. Initially, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So, so do you think um, that you might actually be doing, um, maybe not completely just doing a partial bow all the time, but more intermittent occlusion, that you're actually totally occluding at some point? Um, very well could be. I, I think... Um... I mean, I, I, Dr. Smith, do you think that there was? I mean, I don't think there was any evidence of the occlusion. I mean, based on the fact that we had an arterial line tracing, mm -hmm. we were aiming to have our blood pressure higher, but that was considered an ongoing resuscitation. So initial systolic bleeding. But I don't believe there was any evidence of the occlusion. Okay. May I ask, uh, I suppose it was a bucket handle uh, mesenteric injury, but uh, was it uh, a large artery or a venous bleeding in the mesentery? Um, no, it was just a small little bleeder that was kind of suture, suture ligated, nothing that would have probably caused anything, um, you know, detrimental. I don't think it would, he would have bled out from that, but I think um, it was just caught whenever we deflated the balloon, it was oozing. Yes. And then right. we packed the rest. And the thrust for the abdomen was negative. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, ma'am. Right. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Okay, well, thank you very much, and thank you, yes. everyone, for, uh, for presenting during this, uh, this, this resident session. <laughs> and I'd also just like, before we uh, continue, um, so the idea with these, these uh, EVTMST or the resident sessions is to get, you know, the younger um, uh, EVTM enthusiasts more engaged in these meetings. Uh, we also have another thing that, you know, if there's, there's anyone that's interested, I know because of the time difference it might be difficult, but every month now we've started this EVTM ST, so ST is for, for surgeons, in, or surgeons in training or specialists in training. We started this um, case discussion, Zoom-based case discussion forum, which we do every month. Uh, we send out an invite to everyone, and basically the idea is that it's the 
the trainees that are supposed to discuss the cases. Uh, so there's every every month there's always one trainee that brings a, a case that they want to discuss, and they have a um, someone that's got a little bit more experience with them uh, who can then help with a bit uh, of um, background information. But basically, uh, we we have 30 to 50 uh, trainees from all around the world. Uh, discussing interesting cases and presenting their view and their aspects from from you know different centers of how you deal with different different types of uh, uh, of scenarios and it's really interesting to hear uh, how everyone's doing and so if you've got any trainees at your centers that are interested in joining then just please let me know uh, and we can get them uh, involved in this and I think uh, everyone has, has got a lot to gain from it okay so uh, I think we're gonna continue with uh, the main session now Thank you. All right, thank you, David. We'll take five minutes before we resume with Dr. Scalia's keynote address. Thank you. 
All right, if everyone would take your seats, please, and look out into the hallway and tell who you can see out there to come in. Wow, that was effective. All right. Uh, next, uh, I would like to welcome uh, my boss, uh, Dr. Scalia, who will be speaking on endovascular trauma management, when, where, and why, uh, for the Pan American keynote address. Thank you. Rishi, how do you advance at this? Uh, yeah, there we are. Okay. Afternoon. Again, welcome to those people from out of town to Baltimore. Welcome to the Shock Trauma Center block away. And when Chuck asked me to do this, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, talk about what it was like at the beginning. Talk about what it was like then. Talk about what's like now. Talk about what the future is, talk about why it is you like doing this. I said 30 minutes should be no problem. And so we're going to do a little bit of all of that. And I selected the talk or the title of the talk, when, where, why, and who, and then evolution, revolution, resolution, based on a, a talk that Mike Rotundo gave here a number of years ago about damage control. And I was as I was going through that, it sort of, gelled, and, and that's how we got to that name. Now, this has been a, about a 40-year, 35, 40-year journal a journey of trial and error, and at the very beginning, there were about a million naysayers to endovascular care. The criticism was loud, uh, often somewhat personal, but the believers sort of continued to believe and as we sit here today, I think that the overriding message is that endovascular trauma ma management isn't a thing by itself. It's just a tool. It's a tool that has to fit into a well-thought-out global resuscitation scheme. And, and, and that doesn't make any, whether it's general surgery or trauma, it's all, it's got to be part of a, of, a, of a scheme. And evolution is, uh, the process of growth and development. And so we go way back, and this is, and if somebody can get one earlier, I'd love to see it. This is what I think is the first manage, uh, mention in the literature of endovascular care for trauma. It's 1972. It's the first um, paper on angiography to select people for operative therapy in uh, patients with pelvic fractures. I always hesitate to talk about history with Dr. Feliciano in the room because he's going to tell me that in 1500 there was a, the monks uh, described this, but I, I think this is it. And pelvic embolization made a lot of sense. It avoided opening the pelvic hematoma, but extra pelvic embolization um, was really hard for many people to swallow and CT scan replaced surgical exploration often. And then a couple of people from this small hospital in Brooklyn began to dream. And if you don't know who these people are, you don't know the history of, as far as I'm concerned of endovascular care for trauma. The taller guy is Sal Scalfani, the shorter guy is Jerry Shafton. And they were my uh, mentors when I was in New York City. And they really were much of the early driving force behind the use of catheter therapy for trauma. This is one of the early splenic artery embolizations. There's the coil, big ugly thing, and occluded, an occluded splenic artery. <clears throat> you see that's a 1984 angiogram. This is the post-embolization study. You can't even see the coil because all of the collaterals have filled the distal splenic artery. And in 95, we reported the first series of splenic artery embolizations with really very, very good success. This was at East in 95. The comments weren't real supportive. 
This is the sanitized version that got uh, published in the journal. Regarding the use of splenic artery embolization, this study fails to provide sufficient rationale. Uh, it won't maintain normal splenic immunologic function. We think the author, we envy the off authors for their courage. And the invited discussant, who was a prominent guy, raised his voice and was um, kind of called us a bunch of names. Sal wasn't that nice when he responded. A couple of years later in a lecture in front of 1,500 people, a surgeon wondered why anybody would use a technique that was so obviously stupid. But I licked my wounds and we kept on going. This is now the current data as to how we use splenic artery embolization. This is a couple of hundred spleens over two years seen on CT, so not the unstable people. And you can go through and you see, even after CT scan, 20% of people had an operation based on some, uh, some clinical or radiographic criteria. And in these 200 splenectomies, we had a 0% failure rate of non-operative management. Now, why is that? Well, it's a high volume center. We have a fairly clear protocol about this. And these people that had um, CT evidence of splenic injury either had an operation because the spleen was obviously, in our mind, was not going to heal. They, had a, they got a unit of blood. If you get a unit of blood, you get an operation. A and we will operate on a stable patient with a terrible looking CT scan. You can say maybe some of those people didn't need it, but I don't know. Uh, it's hard to argue with a 0% failure rate of non-operative management. Now, as this evolved, the liver uh, became the next organ that many of us tackled. And it was a little bit different because if splenic artery embolization fails, you take the spleen out, that's a little harder with the liver and the options were certainly more complicated. So embolization became a, uh, an important part of damage control and it was either pre-op, post-op or uh, used for non-operative care. And we started stenting aortas and this is now, you know, everybody does this, uh, it wasn't everybody at the beginning. And this was the 2008, uh, double AST2 as the study became called. And it was the first time I think that there was a clear mortality advantage demonstrated for endovascular care for traumatic aortic injury, 23 versus 7%. And so we're going now and we began experimenting with other areas. These were mostly case reports, right? People bragged at the bar, let me tell you what we did last week. And they were great cases, but each was only one case. And there really wasn't any coordinated effort to collect data. And we kept learning and I wondered what would be next. And I, I brought a, a couple of the old cases where I learned a huge amount. First guy is a young guy, was in a high-speed car wreck, had a positive fast, hypotension on his femoral art line took him to the operating room, took his spleen out. He remained hypotensive, took him over to the CT scanner, and I told my fellows, let me know when we have pictures. And about 15 minutes later, my phone rang, and for those of you from Maryland, my fellow was Dr. Tabatabai, and this was followed by an explosion of words. And I said, Ali, uh, Ali, here, please, I know this is hard, please stop talking. And, to, and give, and in one sentence, summarize for me the problem. And he said, the radiology attending just called me and asked me if the patient is still alive. And that's the CT scan. There's the huge aortic pseudoaneurysm just above the celiac. And he had an open abdomen. I said, is it going to be a thoracal abdominal? And I said, I wonder if we could stick a stent in this. And it turned out that the, uh, the injury to the celiac was just a stretch and the SMA was actually okay. And this was, I think, the first reported case of a stent outside of the chest for aortic injury that we wrote, I don't know, 
15, 18, I don't know, many years ago. This is a young girl that came in with a high-speed vehicular crash. Uh, this is about 2000, 2002 maybe, and it was the first time I'd seen, this is a four-slice CT scan. I'd never seen contrast extravasation look like that, and I looked at that and said, that's a right hepatoclobectomy. She had a blood pressure of 80, and I said, that's not going to work out too well. So I let her blood pressure stay low. I didn't know you were allowed to do that, but I did it anyhow. And we took her. The angio guys were there. We spun her over to the IR suite. That was one of four vascular injuries in the right lobe of the liver. We infarcted her liver, uh, took her to the operating room, packed, un relieved her compartment syndrome, packed her, and I took her back the next day and did a right hepatoclobectomy, and she did great. And so evolution becomes revolution, right? It's a drastic and far-reaching change in the way of thinking or behaving. Now, we clearly had something here, but the impediments were huge. We didn't have much support for this concept, and institutions, many of them did not want to bite. And we needed some people to step up and lead. And fortunately, a few institutions, I'm proud to say we were one of them, volunteered the kind of away we went. Now, Dr. Holcomb doesn't remember this conversation, I'm sure, but I do. This is about 2010, and we were at the military me trauma meeting. And he said, what do you think about bringing fresh frozen plasma to the desert? And I said, that's impossible. And he said, that's not the question. Is it a good idea? And I said, that's a fabulous idea. He said, fine, decisions made. Now it's just about tactics. And I have used that. I've told that story, John, more times than I can remember. And it really changed the way I started to think about doing things. Some several more conversations, and we many of us landed in Houston. And this was, I think, you know, it was the first time we got a group of people to sit down, talk about it, write it down, and plot a blueprint for the future. And that was February 2013. You can see these were the recommendations. I'm going to give us about a B. We did some of them pretty well. We did others not so well. And we talked about what it would be to develop competency in endovascular care. And there it is. This is what we thought. It seemed like a good idea. We got consensus that well, that's what we did. Now, soon after I came back from Houston on the 18th of February, Megan was my first year fellow. She remembers this. I, she told me this. I didn't remember it. I'm in the OR hallway and she's running through the operating room and I point at her and say, go get that balloon thing and bring it to OR4, and we put the first Reboa in, in, um, in Baltimore, the second or third Reboa, I think, in the country, at least in, in the modern era. And four years later to that day, we presented our first 90 cases at the Pacific Coast. This was the first of sort of the modern clinical series, six patients, results were good, we had proof of concept, and we kept on going. Now, this is the current data, and you can use this maybe as a weather vane for at least the adoption of Reboa, maybe the adoption of endovascular care. And you can see the expertise is all in just a very few institutions, and there are many people that in the last seven years have, are not even putting one a year in. And it's a little hard to understand how you can amalgamate that experience and make statements. This is the current Rishi gave me yesterday, the uh, P. Reboa stuff, and it's about the same. The, the names are roughly the same, and you know we're still putting one point something, in, in, about one a week in. And so, but it's all still in a relatively small number of institutions now. How do you fit this into a system? This was a very um, educational experience. This was 2015 AAST, and this was our pelvic fracture data, and we were terrible. Right, 80% of the deaths were attributed to early uncontrolled hemorrhage, and that was not so good. 
And we said, what are we going to do to make it better? And we rethought the way it is that we did this, remembering that you need to have a place to do this where people could get resuscitated. This is a, a, a shot from the sky over the Shock Trauma Center. It is one and a half city blocks from the resuscitation unit to the interventional radiology suite. And there was nothing quite as lonely as being there about two in the morning with a really sick patient because that's other stuff was still going on. And that just, the time it took to do it that way was prohibitive. We built the new building. I horse traded for the hybrid operating room and we got one. And I called the interventional radiologist and I said, listen, we got this new cool toy. It's just got the same equipment you're used to. Why don't you come and we'll do it here because this is going to be better than doing it a block and a half away. And they said, we're not coming. And I said, well, we're not calling. Now, hybrid operating rooms, do they work? Yeah, this is the uh, Gainesville data. And you can see while there was no mortality advantage, the process measures were all better, time, everything when using the hybrid operating room. And this is now our data of 2019, I think, American surgical um, presentation. When we collected a surgical endovascular trauma service, our own, we did more cases and we did them quicker. And you can see the time sensitive stuff, the pelvis, the liver, even the, when we used it for the extremity, there was a highly statistically significant decrease in time and we weren't a block and a half away. Now we've extended this. Um, we have started using balloons as part of the resuscitation. And we have now, um, we have now adopted this bridge balloon for cable injuries. This is in press in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, our first five or six cases all used for juxtarenal or suprarenal inferior vena cava injuries with, in this case, an 80% survival. And there's one. It's a bloodless field. The balloon's in the cava. You can see the hole in the cava. And what we did is we got hemostasis. We got the patients uh, resuscitated. And then we went ahead and controlled, deflated the balloon, controlled it and did a primary repair on this particular one. Now, catheter therapy, we talked a lot or a little bit this morning at least about taking it into a different direction. This was the original Peter Saffer data, data on deep hypothermia uh, in with exsanguination and uh, deep hypothermia was neuroprotective, it was cardiac protective. The, animals in this particular case all woke up and were uh, neurologically normal in this case after 60 minutes of cardiac arrest. The EPR trial is um, sadly we had to pause it when COVID happened. We are trying to drag ourselves back out and restarted getting the blood bank to play has been a little complicated but we are doing our best and we hope to restart it in the not too distant future, right? Ultimate catheter therapy for trauma because it's cardiac arrest, taking the patients down to, to 15 degrees Celsius, allowing their heart to uh, stay still, fixing them and then warming them on, onto ECMO. We've learned a lot. It's been a, um, even in the first six patients, um, the co ma managing the coagulation system has been far and away the hardest part of this. The mechanics of doing it turned out to actually be not so bad, but the coagulopathy has been ex exceedingly difficult to get our arms around, and we continue to struggle with that. We're, um, we're funded for four more patients, five more patients. If we can get going and don't have to relearn all of the lessons again, um, if we could just get one survivor, we would have proof of concept. Number five was really, really close. 
And then there's, of course, selective aortic arch perfusion. I will not steal Dr. Manning's uh, thunder for tomorrow, but many we are we now have new catheters that we can use for trauma resuscitation. And so now we move to finding an answer or a solution. And, and what is the problem? Well, the impediment here is we fight about who owns the case. We fight about who's going to hold the wire. We fight about who's going to get the money. We ignore the patient and the need to deliver care in a system. People have uh, many varying opinions about this, many of them with zero experience, but they're sure that they're right. And we have a thousand ways to get to know. And driving this through an institution, I'm, we have a unique setup. I had a short conversation with the uh, guy that ran, ran, runs the place, and I said, oh, what a good idea, and away we went. But it's not that even here it was a, there were some struggles, and in many places there are more struggles. And is this an issue? And the answer is yes. This is John Harvin's data from 2017, uh, emergency trauma laparotomies, and, and many of you know this data very, very well. We'd like to say we're so much better than we used to be, but we're not. And it's the time that it takes to get the patient through the system. Driving faster to knock four minutes off the pre-hospital time doesn't seem to be the answer. And the thing that was remarkable, I thought, is the variability in level one trauma centers in the United States. I'm sure we're the one with the best uh, survival, but maybe we're not. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's about early hemorrhage control. And there are a lot of these patients that if we did it better, we would be able to salvage those people. And so we talked earlier this morning about regionalized programs, which is, I just think it makes so much sense as to taking this out of the hospital into the field, starting the care at the point of injury and making it a seamless uh, continuum of care all the way through to a reintegration. We have had many discussions. We are working on this. It's going to be complicated to get it set up, but that, and to me, is the next answer. And one of my favorite slides, I am told that these are the guys in France cannulating for ECMO on the floor of the Louvre, taking it to the scene. Uh, a slide that Todd gave me that really sort of describes this arc of resuscitation. We're sort of over in the P. Reboa phase, but we need to come across on, on this arc and get to a, a metabolic solution to a metabolic problem with um, catheters and uh, drugs and all of it. Now, uh, uh, several years ago, we uh, some of us wrote this paper called Beyond the Crossroads. It was a, a it was a set of commentaries on who was going to you know, who needed to own vascular trauma. We talked about the history and the migration to endovascular care, and. Um, Many vascular surgeons, I can tell you the vascular surgeons in, in this community are not interested in trauma. They are interested in elective vascular surgery and they just don't want to do anything else. Um, we use the term lesion vision concerning for fixing a picture, not a patient. Uh, and the response was a, a bit of a tsunami. And I asked myself why. Now, I, th I thought back to when I was a resident. This was what residency training was like in the 1980s. There were no laparoscopy, no robotics, only open surgery. There were no such thing as H2 blockers. We treated um, ulcer disease with milk and Maalox, not realizing that the calcium in the milk probably made it worse, not better. It was white. It looked soothing. It should work, but it didn't. There were no beta blockers until I was a PGY2. Breast cancer had one therapy, a modified radical mastectomy. And we operated nonstop. When I was a chief resident, I did 50 open aortas and 50 stomachs. And that wasn't 
It's not like I was the, the busiest resident. That's what we did. Now it's a lot more complicated. There's so much more to learn. Everyone is becoming a specialist, except maybe us. We talked earlier about the integrated programs. And as we tried to cram more and more and more education into the same amount of time, there were casualties. And one of the first ones was the ICU rotations. There just isn't time for surgical residents to learn everything and do all of this. And the discussion around trauma training really became, are they going to get enough cases to take the boards? I will say at the University of Maryland, right, a block away, the surgery residents do three months of trauma during their five years. A month as a two and two months as a five. They get plenty of cases to take the boards. How much trauma do they know? Right? Three months. And so in this milieu, specialists, they're just not going to get enough trauma experience to be know about the trauma part of this problem. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not just about sewing the blood vessels together or putting a stent in. It's taking care of the patient. Why would we expect this to be different? We shouldn't. So this was one week ago. It's not an endovascular case, but it illustrates the point. A 45-year-old guy gets hit by a car down in the southern part of Maryland. He has a tibial plateau fracture and a popliteal injury with a cold, threatened foot. He is in a busy level two center that does a lot of vascular surgery. And they say, yeah, we're not comfortable taking care of this. So we airlift him up here. He arrives four and a half hours after injury. The non-vascular surgeon, me, I get him revascularized, at least shunted in two hours, and all his muscle was already dead in the end with an amputation. How can this be the right answer? Now, this, I think, is the beginning of an answer. And I don't, every time I, I make a list, I, I wonder if I have I left somebody off. The best I can tell, this is, these are, is the list of the young surgeons in the United States that have real expertise in trauma, critical care, and vascular surgery. I'm proud to say that many of, the, uh, many of these people have Maryland next to their name, not all. But this is a concept that we have very much embraced and are driving forward to the best of our ability. So we talked earlier about what, how are we going to do this? I have my own view on this world. I think acute care surgery becomes a mandatory two-year fellowship. But the second year can't be the first year or your chief residency just done again when we're going to call you an attending. The incremental skill acquisition there just doesn't make it worth an entire year. So we should create a bifurcated menu of options, and vascular and endovascular could be one of those options if you wanted to do a concentrated year to get, you know, how good are you going to get? Well, it, it, it won't make it good enough to do everything, but it'll make it good enough to do some things probably a lot of what needs to be done in the middle of the night, at least getting it started, at least um, at least getting it going. It's not perfect, but I don't think it's a terrible idea. Now, Dr. Moore and I are in lockstep with this. The, the double, S, double AST has not run down the road to us uh, embrace this idea, but who knows? Maybe. So that last slide, this is your job now, not mine. And we looked at this in 2019. And if you came here and you did look at our endovascular experience and you compared it to the case numbers, I'm not suggesting that's the whole show here, of vascular surgery and interventional radiology in six months of, so it would be 12 months of every other night call, I, I, I get it, you would accrue enough experience that you would at least meet the volume requirements for board exams. Can we do it? Yes. It will be a little bit, um, it'll be a little bit more complicated, but it's at least 
a thing. And this proof of concept of creating a group of people that do vascular trauma, particularly endovascular trauma. We started this with Megan and with Melanie Hain. This was the 2016 publication that, again, proof of concept. Megan and Melanie, that became Johnny and Rishi and Joe. And this is the current group, Ivan Chung, Chuck, Anna, and Rishi. And we have enough work to keep people busy. And endovascular care is going to only get more and more common. This is Anna's data from a couple of years ago. The curve will continue on a steep trajectory up. Endovascular care for aortic injury is now, it's what everybody does. Open repair just isn't done, at least in the United States, with any degree of reliability. Iliacs are becoming a disease of uh, with endovascular care. This is data from Memphis. Subclavians are becoming more and more now treated with endovascular care. I don't think we've done, correct me, I don't think we've done an op a primary one, primary open subclavian in the last few years. That's only because the patient was almost dead. And even now for peripheral arterial injuries. And so it was interesting. I, I came across this. Uh, I was putting together something for a pelvic fracture a year or so ago. And I read through this. It was a, uh, a commentary on, an, on Brian Eastridge's article. And I went through it and I said, wow. It's a long time ago. That was a pretty good idea. And then I realized I'd written it. And I'd, I'd completely forgotten. <laughs> pretty good idea. All right. So endovascular trauma care. When? Much of the time. Maybe not every time, every time, but much of the time. Where? It's got to be everywhere. Why? Because it's a better idea. Who? We're still working on that. That's an evolution that will continue. And evolution will become revolution, and revolution will become resolution. And we'll go to the top of the slide and start all over again. I, I really like this quote from Roger Sherman. It's, uh, we're privileged to, to be able to do what we do for a living. This is the, earth, the young Jerry Shafton, who died several years ago. Uh, this is for Jerry. He's the one who started this, and he is the one that... I think has really made this able to happen. So it's it's a fascinating story. I've been there from the beginning. You know, we've never embraced it as much as we should have, and we need to understand where we've been to chart the future. This can't, this has to be a trauma project. It's different if it's trauma. And, you know, I get called almost, not every endovascular case, but many. Of them, and it's not because Rishi doesn't know how to what plug to put in. I have no idea about that. But what we talk about is is this a good idea? Not how are we going to do it, the mechanical skills. That's what's important here. Jerry handed it to me, at least back in there. And now this is my generation handing it to the next generation. Please don't screw it up. Chuck, I hope that's something close to what you want to thank you for your attention. Uh, in the name of the EVTM Society, uh, Dr. Boris Kessel, that is uh, I couldn't come here, is the president. We have the vice president of the society but I will speak this time. Um, we want to thank you, Dr. Scalia, for hosting us here, giving the inspiration for us uh, younger generation to do these uh, things. And you and, of course, your colleagues and for the, everything you're doing and the scientific work and the clinical work. And we would like to give you from the society this Oscar, uh, the wow. Oscar of status. <laughs> Which is real gold, not. not. But, 
<laughs> could be. It yeah, could be. Yeah. That's but very thank kind you very you. much. And thank it's you. an honor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. So uh, Dr. Morrison is not here, but uh, I'll be moderating the next session about um, endovascular and vascular surgery. And we'll start with Dr. Davidson, open deployment of endovascular devices. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for inviting me to be here. Uh, let's see, which one moves the... Oh, just the big one. Yeah. The big one, that's mm -hmm. easy enough. Yeah. Uh, I'm AJ Davidson. I'm actually active duty Air Force. I'm stationed out at Travis Air Force Base um, out in California. Um, I also am a visiting assistant professor at UC Davis, which basically means the Air Force voluntells me to go there. So about 33% of my practice is there, and that's where I see a lot of uh, my trauma. Uh, this is just a standard DOD disclosure. Of course, nothing I say of the views of the Department of Defense or Air Force. Um, and unfortunately, I do not have any conflicts of interest or disclosures yet, but I'm always on the lookout. Uh, so the objectives of this talk, I just want to briefly discuss the history of open, open deployment of endovascular devices, where we currently are at with regards to open deployment of endovascular devices, and where we may be headed. So historically, this is really kind of the first uh, open deployment use of these endovascular devices, and it was used for advanced aortic aneurysm repair, particularly with debranching. So essentially, it'd be a woven or PTFE graft. Endo access would be uh, achieved through that graft. There'd be a covered self-expanding stent that would go into the target vessel. Uh, and you'd finish with ligation of the artery and closure of the graftotomy. Uh, here's an example of a renal artery essentially debranching or bypass using that technique with the graft on the iliac going into the stent graft into the renal. Uh, here's another example of a debranching of the arch anatomy. And then just here's an in situ picture of that technique being used for the celiac or SMA. So as things progress, kind of part two of this history, Gore actually came out with a hybrid graft in the early 2000s. This was essentially a PTFE graft combined with a constrained covered self-expanding stent. You can see it here, designed for open deployment with that ripcord device that uh, many of you know, may know on the end of the delivery device that's just pulled. And then you can see it constrained and expanded. And then here's just, again, a little mock-up of that. There's a little arteriotomy that's made. The stent is placed directly into the targ target vessel and deployed, which would then subsequently be sutured in somewhere else from a donor site. Uh, it was unfortunately taken off the market in the mid 2010s due to demand. There just wasn't much need for aortic debranching. And even though they tried to market it for dialysis access, it just, there wasn't market share for it. And so it was discontinued. So with this device, it still requires one anastomosis and it doesn't necessarily restore inline flow, but blood does have to come from somewhere else or i.e. wherever you place the the anastomosis for the PTFE or woven graft. So the next sort of evolution is what if we move the remote access site closer to the area of injury? Again, here's an example of this. This isn't a case I was involved in, but you can see the artery transection here. This currently has a shunt in place uh, with the remote site being prepared here with just advancing a stent graft into that with the goal of crossing over the site and deploying it. Still has an arteriotomy that needs to be closed. Uh, but there's not an actual anastomosis. Uh, here's a case that I was actually involved in with as a resident. It was actually Tim Williams' case. Uh, this was uh, achieved through an SFA. The remote site is just distal off the screen, and we bridged this transected gap with a stent, uh, which ended up being used as an extended shunt, which uh, I'll get into some here later. So it begs the question, what if we get rid of the need for remote site at all together? Uh, Dr. DeBose kind of covered a lot of this early research we did back when I was a general surgery resident just looking at putting the device itself into the artery. Also was great when we thought about deployed settings or austere environments where you wanted something small, easy to carry with you and getting rid of that delivery device, getting rid of that wire, getting rid of even fluoroscopy needs. Um, and so this is just, I know he showed our old cartoons, but this is actually a video just because I think a video is easier. So we made the video show, demonstrating this technique. 
There you see us removing off the delivery device, threading a free needle onto it, placing it into a vessel, taking that needle through the side of the arteriotomy, which then kind of recreates the vector that would normally be uh, with the delivery catheter, and delivering it into the artery. So I kind of skipped over most of the, the data that Dr. DeBose has already presented, but we looked at what if we use this as an extended shunt uh, and comparing it to uh, basically classic Argyle shunts. And we had them out at 72 days, or excuse me, not 72 days, 72 hours. Uh, and the patency was similar, uh, yet you had better flows through the graph. And this just kind of demonstrates, you can see clearly that the flow through the stent is superior to that of the shunt. Uh, but then it, again, it kind of begs the next question, how does this technique compare to sewn PTFE anastomosis? And as it's been brought up, how does it work if it's infected? So here's some of the new data uh, we recently had. This is another uh, swine study. We took 14 animals, made an injury in the iliac arteries, uh, placed on one side a PTFE sewn interposition bypass, and on the other side, essentially the DSER technique. We got flow measurements. Uh, at baseline and at the conclusion of the study. We infected it with Pseudomonas and MRSA, so essentially just bathed the stent and the graft uh, in these bugs and let it sit. Uh, after seven days, the animals were anesthetized and a duplex ultrasonography was performed. Uh, and then at 14 days after that, there was a terminal procedure which also consisted of angiography. Just some additional points here. The animals were all allowed to walk. No, we use regional heparinization, but no systemic heparins, no antibiotics that did get aspirin. There you can see the devices and the same surgical team, which was our research residents, did all the cases. Uh, here's again just a little video of that repair, and you'll see our two residents here essentially placing this across the transected artery. There you can see it constrained in here between the two of them. They're deploying it. The rip cord is essentially pulled through, and then there's a conclusion. Um, and if you look at the data, uh, all of them were patented at seven days on duplex, suggesting that they do pretty good in the short term. But interestingly, look at the failure at 21 days. Nine of the 14 PTFE had either thrombosed or uh, basically had a disruption of the suture line where none of the endovascular stents did. Um, and if you look at the failure of the interposition bypass, one anastomotic blowout, one pseudoaneurysm, and seven thromboses at 21 days. The flows were similar at baseline placement and after harvest. Placement time, I will say that this is pretty long for DSER, but that's going to be clamp on to clamp off, and that's with preparing the device and against with our two research residents doing this and over time they get better. I can do it in about five minutes or less. For in terms of gross infection, this is pus at the time of the site. You look at, again, DSCR, these stent grass had more evidence or slightly more evidence, not statistically more evidence of gross pus at the area. Here's just an example of the stent graft at harvest. You can see the purulence present yet again that stayed patent uh, throughout that 21 day process. Uh, and then looking at histology, between the two, there's a little bit more necrosis, which would expect from that radial force. But even microthrombus present at the anastomotic margin, you can see how much is present in those PTFE bypasses. And so, you know, where are we in terms of this open deployment? The remote site can certainly be removed closer to the site of injury, in some cases eliminated altogether. Um, if we look at these infected PTFE interposition bypasses, uh, certainly the risk of a suture line and infected field is a primary, primary risk of delayed failure that is avoided with DSER. Uh, and again, DSER is a sutureless repair, appears resistant to thrombosis and anastomotic failure, particularly up to 21 days. And it seems to be safe to be used as a prolonged temporary vascular or a repair, even when placed in a contaminated field, may give some additional time for an individual to have their other injuries treated and recover prior to definitive repair. Beyond that, what we may expect from a traditional shunt or PTFE. Where are we going? I think if we optimize delivery systems, 
moving beyond these case series we've published here and there to larger data sets? Uh, and can it eventually be used as destination therapy? I don't think we know, but I think it's a potential. And so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? I'll just ask one while Please. he's walking up. So post-operatively, if you were going to do this in a patient, would you just be putting them on aspirin alone? What would you do? As I would probably anticoagulate them as quick as I can. Again, in the, in the animals, I wanted to see thrombosis if it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So especially in translational research, I look at it as kind of like a proving ground. So we wanted to make the animal more susceptible to thrombosis to see what would fail. And um, again, in humans, I would probably put them on heparin as quick as I could. Okay. Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, I had actually read some of your papers when I was a vascular fellow and then found myself uh, trying to reconstruct a brachial artery in a connective tissue disorder patient that kept falling apart, falling apart, falling apart, and we ended up uh, using your technique. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'm curious in your experience with the animals, though, um, like in that particular setting, we were uh, uncomfortable with the idea of like leaving that stent floating around. So we tacked it in, in a couple places. Um, so were you securing the stent graft at all? And what, how much, um, overlap between the ends of the stent graft and the ends of the, uh, ar intact arteries are you generally using? Good question. We shoot for about a centimeter and a half to two centimeters overlap. And then we did two tacks, two okay. tacking sutures. So usually six O getting a little bit of stent, uh, with the vessel wall. Awesome. Thank you. Hello, uh, Rico Hoenkamp uh, from the Netherlands. So Europe, Europe is also here. Um, uh, first, I would like to thank uh, I speak to Mastodons uh, from, from the States, but I can inspire you also in Europe. We actually also do, do quite a lot of progress. So, so there is still hope in Europe. But I have a question for, for you especially, because I think this is, this is a great example for, uh, for trauma surgery. Um, but I'm... I think the infection rate can can be quite high. So I really see the largest uh, proof of concept for long-term shunting, actually, I would call it. But, but I think if the patient is stable enough or the infection rate is too high, would you consider if you have time for more biografting or autologous uh, graft uh, harvesting? Yeah, it's an, it's an excellent question. And hopefully, you know, a few years down the road, I'll be back here presenting more data. But um, there's certainly roles out there for salvage of particular stent grafts that are infected. So, you know, can we use some of those lessons that we use on sort of the vascular side in the trauma side, such as antibiotic beads, debridements, tissue coverage, et cetera? Um, I don't think we know. Um, and then two, I've, you know, now dealing with a lot of traumas and kind of being a trauma affectionado as a vascular surgeon, the idea of sort of saving vein for when I actually want to use it uh, it appeals to me quite a bit. And so for something like this, where I can place the stent graft, you know, they can undergo multiple debridements. They can get their, you know, fixation by ortho if they need any nerve reconstruction. And I feel very confident that that's not going to fall apart and it's going to stay open. And then later I can come back and do my definitive bypass with the vein that's still there, potentially with tissue transfers, et cetera. But, you know, my plastic colleagues usually aren't very excited about trying to get that tissue flap on early necessarily. And I think this, again, buys you some time. Um, but again, I think more data is needed. We need more patients to see what works. I think I feel very confident using it as a prolonged shunt. I'm not sure what is going to happen beyond that, but it certainly is interesting. Oh, thanks. I appreciate okay. it because I think it's really useful for transport also in the armed forces because it's a really much more stable shunt. It keeps you also a little bit more, more at rest in the night. So much appreciated. Last question. Just looking into the future, let's say 20 years, Dr. Davidson, as I'm sitting here listening to talk, I'm hearing about flow rates and I'm hearing about patency rates. 20 years from now, assuming this proves out, why would a surgeon in the middle of the night ever sew a blood vessel? Why not just do it this way? Uh, it's a good question. You know, there's this whole debate on training and, you know, I'm young enough and naive enough not to know the answer, but, <laughs> I, you know, I think there's something to be said for eliminating the surgical anastomosis. And um, I think that that's never going to go away completely. But I think in some of these, again, with infected fields or complex wounds, that just eliminating the suture line has some potential to benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. McGee talking about the POP Save It trial or score. Dr. 
Adua. And thanks again for the opportunity to present today. Yeah, these are my disclosures, not really relevant to this topic. So um, popliteal artery injuries comprise about 20% of all lower extremity vascular injuries, but modern civilian series uh, show that the amputation rate is around 15%, and this is the highest of all peripheral vascular injuries. So um, when thinking about uh, uh, popliteal artery injuries, um, you know, one of the major uh, scoring systems to, was developed to uh, think about when primary amputation should be the treatment of choice was the mangled injury severity score. And um, the problem with this is it's somewhat subjective uh, to measure at the time the patient presents and that multiple recent studies have shown that even at very high scores, some patients can have limb salvage. And so the question is really, uh, and, and these, these papers have really said it's time for a revision to the score and to other scores because they're really insufficient to determine which patients should undergo primary amputation and which patients should undergo attempts at limb salvage. And um, so uh, there's really a need for a better reporting standard than just this score. And so the question is really, is the uh, aim of having a score that determines when primary amputation should be attempted really a um, worthwhile or clinically relevant question. Um, I think that primary amputation probably is more akin to the Juster Pot, sorry, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart rule, which is you know it when you see it, which is a life over limb situation when a limb is basically already amputated or when the patient has such severe hemodynamic instability that uh, you don't have uh, time to revascularize that leg and that leg needs to come off for the patient's survival. So, um, that led us to this question of really the, um, sorry, maybe the primary question should be, what are what is a way to determine, to, to risk stratify which patients are likely to get amputation, even with attempts at limb salvage? We've previously shown that very, very few patients in America at the modern uh, level one, level two trauma centers actually undergo primary amputation. The vast majority undergo attempts at limb salvage. And the reason for that is that you don't have time really to make those decisions. And that um, uh, if you don't revascularize a wide array, you're gonna lose a leg. And so what we wanted to think about was, is there a way to come up with a scoring system that can risk stratify patients um, based on initial presentation at the time when they're in the ER? and develop a score that's sort of akin to the AAST trauma um, scores uh, that like for pancreatic injury and every other injury, determine what's like what's the risk. So you can communicate between providers. So the popliteal, uh, pop save it score, which is um, developed at uh, 14 different centers in the West Coast. Um, we're branching out to other centers, uh, enrolled patients between 2007 and 2018, about 500 patients. And we looked at the these um, four, initially these, um, these uh, risk factors, and this systolic blood pressure less than 90, associated orthopedic injury in the ipsilateral limb, and lack of pedal Doppler signals, and when that pedal Doppler signals were not available, available or Doppler signals were not recorded, lack of pulses. Now, we actually revised this score subsequently in a 2.0 version to make it slightly easier uh, um, where we included blunt mechanism and gave everything a score of one. So just easy to calculate, um, four independent risk factors. So um, we developed that score based on those patients, those 500 patients. We wanted to look at it in a separate data set using the, the prove it registry, which uh, everyone I think know, here knows is from the AAST. It's prospectively collected data on uh, traumatic vascular injuries from 14 different level one and level two trauma centers. We looked at the years 2013 to present. We included anybody who had a, sorry, the, the study includes anyone with a documented arterial injury to uh, reduce the risk of bias. And we included, um, in, um, we, we questioned whether or not pop save would accurately risk stratify patients for amputation in this data set. So we included all patients with pop popliteal artery injuries and prove it. We excluded patients who had missing data so that we could not um, calculate a pop save score, meaning they didn't have data on orthopedic injury, systolic blood pressure and Doppler signals or, or uh, pulses. Um, and then we, what we found was that um, here in the blocks is the actual amputation rates in the data set based on the pop save it score. So 4% for a score of zero, 10% amputation rate score of one, 23 for two, 36 and 88. So uh, 
the amp actual amputation rates increased stepwise with an increase in their pop save score by one. And then the green line here is the predicted probability of amputation based on our previous data set. So as you can see, they kind of go hand in hand. Now, interestingly, in, pop, in the prove it data set, they really didn't have Doppler signals available. So the scores really were one lower than they would have otherwise been most likely. So as you can see, it's sort of a, a phase shift there, but, but the, it relatively approximates reality there. And then we looked at the uh, area under the curve and ROC, and we kind of just wanted to look at different levels of maybe the score of two, score of three, um, or less. We uh, settled on less than two, uh, less than two, just as a, um, a way to look at sensitivity and specificity. And the AOC, a, sorry, AUC was about uh, 0.67, which is not fantastic. But again, when we're trying to not differentiate yes, amputation versus no amputation, but rather have a, um, a stepwise increase, this is actually not bad. And so at a, at a cutoff of two, we found the sensitivity was 67% and specificity was 57%. And really what that means, I think, is that you can't tell me, um, and, and we went back to even at the score of four, um, that those patients should not undergo vascular, vascularization because 12% of those patients still were able to salvage their leg. So I think, again, this kind of gets to our point, which is that really... The, the idea that you should have a threshold for when to, when to consider limb salvage is probably not the question. It's really how do you communicate that risk to the patients? How do you communicate that risk when, when studying this problem across centers, just like the double AST scoring system? So in addition to their pop save score, we found that the patients who underwent amputation had much higher ISS, as you'd imagine, lower hemoglobin, higher INR. Um, and interestingly, the ischemia time and concomitant vein injuries were not different between patients who were amputated and those that were amputated. So one of our one of the big questions, I think, is whether or not vein injury is an independent risk factor. We found that basically it was not. Obviously, the study has limitations. It's um, uh, similar to those that use retrospective application to prospectively collect a data set. That's a um, methodological issue. Um, and there's obviously treatment differences between institutions, but obviously there's 14 different institutions. We try to um, smooth that out over all of those. Uh, there's really poorly collected pedal Doppler data in this data set. And I think Dr. Fox was speaking earlier to the importance, I think Dr. Duo was as well, of actually using Doppler um, at the time the patients present because it really is critical. Having no Doppler signal is significantly different than having a Doppler signal. And it makes a major difference in terms of the timing and, and the, the the severity of the ischemia. And then um, it's a trauma patient population, they have uh, pretty poor follow-up. But we did know that of the patients who had um, limb salvage, uh, only one developed a delayed amputation. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and so in conclusion, traumatic popliteal artery injuries are associated with a high rate of amputation. The pop save score combines these four different independent risk factors. They are independent. Uh, systolic blood pressure less than 90, associated orthopedic injuries in the ipsilateral limb, lack of preoperative pedal Doppler signals, blunt traumatic mechanism. And pop save score is an effective risk stratification tool for major amputation in patients with popliteal artery injuries. And it may be a helpful reporting standard for popliteal vascular trauma. Thank you, I'll take any questions. So this was a big, big um, uh, project with a lot of different people here, who are some of which are here, and I wanna thank them as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just to clarify, we're, we're not talking about the mangled extremity here, right? We're talking about a, a popliteal artery injury light, right? Because we all know with the LEAP studies that were done back, there, there's more to this than just saving the limb. So I'm assuming this talk was really about a, a relatively simple popliteal without all soft tissue injury, nerve damage, and the like. So all patients who had popliteal injuries of any kind, including mangled extremities, were included. And obviously, mangled extremities are a small subset of patients who have popliteal injuries. And so I think that those mangled extremities are going to be very high score. Um, they're not going to have, they're oftentimes not going to have pedal Doppler signals. They're going to, have, for sure, by definition, have orthopedic injuries. They often are hypotensive. And so those are going to be high score patients. But even of the mangled extremities, there's mangled extremities and there's mangled extremities. We all know that like some mangled extremities are salvageable, some are not. And um, anyone that was that at these centers at these times were included in this study. Uh, 
nice work, uh, <clears throat> Greg, but as you point out, those ROCs aren't exactly uh, comforting. Uh, I'm curious uh, of uh, your uh, the role of tibial nerve injury. Because if you have an avuls tibial nerve at the level of the popliteal, I would assume you're going to end up with an amputation. Yeah, so that's a good, that's a very important point, and and it's something we talk about all the time in uh, acute limb ischemia patients. What their neuro exam is, because we know if they have a lack of motor, then that's due to ischemia. In the trauma patient population, I think this is really difficult to tell. How do you know who has a nerve injury that's the cause of their paralysis of their foot? versus an ischemic injury without a nerve injury that's the cause of their paralysis of their foot. And I think the reality is you don't know, unless it's a complete amputation, then yes, they have that. Um, but in the absence of that, you don't know until you operate on them. And sometimes you'll find that injury at the time of the operation. So I think it's a, we, we, we had considered talking about nerve injury as a, as a um, reason or as an independent score. But the reality is you don't know that at the time of presentation. And um, it's, it's hard to use that as a, um, as a means to withhold treatment. I think that what Dr. Moore was saying also fits into what I was going to say, which is that often these patients have terrible, like Gustillo three fractures, they have nerve injuries, but I think where this is really useful is that the vascular reconstruction is almost like the gatekeeper for limb cell. Correct, yes, exactly. Like if we say, no, this is not a reconstructable vascular injury, the ischemia is too far gone, everything grinds to a halt. But if we make the effort to revascularize, that opens the door for orthopedics to say, in a week and a half, I guess it wasn't salvageable, uh, or to come in and look at the nerve and say, yeah, that nerve is, is gone as well. Um, so in that sense, this is not just about the vascular thing, but it's also starting the process of salvaging in a multimodality fashion, uh, the limb. Yeah, that's exactly right. So in this study, and I didn't, just for the sake of time, didn't talk about it, but um, just briefly commented on it, which is that uh, at these institutions, only about two or three patients out of 500 did not undergo some kind of revascularization attempt. So it's very rare that those patients didn't undergo some attempt at limb salvage, at some attempt at revascularization. Now, obviously, um, it's just exactly like Rishi said, which is that if you don't revascularize an ischemic leg, you're going to end up with an amputation. Now, if you revascularize an ischemic leg that is injured, you may still end up with an amputation later, but um, at least you have that option for limb salvage. And so I think I'm not advocating for one thing or the other. I'm just telling you what has happened at these institutions. And I think that, that the reason why we thought this score is important was not as a means to say, if you have a high score, you should withhold treatment or you should withhold revascularization. I don't believe that's true. And that's not actually what happened. What we're trying to say is, um, I think MESS is a good score retrospectively to look at. It's really complicated. It's got a lot of different points. But I don't know that it's um, useful to say, if your score is X, then you get a primary amputation. I don't think pop save it is either. But I think pop save it is an easier way, you know, four, zero through four, to say, what's your risk of an amputation just like a uh, you know, double AST uh, score of five liver injury says you have a really high risk of, of, of you know, death, basically. Um, just a quick question. Um, do you have data on long-term outcomes, chronic disability, chronic neuropathic pain in these patients? I get a lot of these patients that come back to my clinic uh, running the limb program here saying they, they're done. They're done with the pain. They want an amputation. Yeah, no, I know. I agree. I think so. That is a very uh, difficult um, thing to study. Um, I 100% I, I agree with you. I think that functionally, oftentimes, the healthy person does better with amputation. Um, so I, I think that that's true. Um, but you don't necessarily know who's going to be salvageable and who's not. And then ideally, you'd like the patient to make that decision uh, as opposed to a paternalistic point of view. Um, and so... I'm also often very surprised at which patients actually can walk and do well. And like, I'm sure you've had that experience too, like where you thought there's no way that's going to work. And then it somehow works because the orthopedic surgeons fix the leg and then plastic surgeons reconstruct the nerves and then somehow they're able to walk again. And it's like shocking. It just, you don't really know. And I think treatment and care is going to improve over time. But I think it's useful to be able to say, oh, at our center, 
uh, you know, a score of four has a 50% amputation rate versus your center, and a score of four has a 90% risk of amputation. So we can compare apples to apples across centers. I think that's the point. Chris Ramos, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Do you have any data? I know this is all retrospective, but do you have any data on the location of the popliteal injury? You know, an above popliteal injury is much different than behind the knee. And also the degree of soft tissue, in, uh, soft tissue injury. Obviously, the repair is completely uh, dependent on the soft tissue coverage over the repair. Yeah, to, so we did collect P1, P2 P versus P3 location of injury. Um, the sort of subset analyses looking at those things were not really super fruitful. Um, but I do agree with you. Obviously, the degree of soft tissue damage is going to change a lot. Um, and again, I, just I think to a lot of the different points here, which is like mangled extremities are one thing. Injuries, popliteal in, isolated popliteal injury is a different thing. I think that's exactly the point, which is if you have an isolated popliteal injury without an orthopedic injury, in a patient who's not hypotensive, in a patient who doesn't have um, a blunt mechanism, you know, then they're going to do a lot better, most likely, than a person who has a blunt injury, who's hypotensive, who has an orthopedic injury, and a popliteal injury. So I think that's kind of the point, which is that as you add up those things, the risk of amputation goes up and up and up. Thank you. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Next up, we have Dr. Rajani talking about post-implantation care following endovascular management of trauma. Thanks, sounds like some business going by. <laughs> Um, I spoke to you about open conduits this morning and I talked about endo conduits this afternoon. I, I don't have any relevant disclosures for this. So much of this talk, the beginning part is procedural. It's logistics. How do you take care of a stent graft? If you want to tune out for about eight to 10 slides, by all means, be my guest. If you'll indulge me towards the end, I think maybe some food for thought about if we're asking the correct question about what it means to have a stent graft in you using the A word as an example of what we've learned about the A word over time. So just talking about routine care, you know, I think we all took our open care uh, initiatives and translated them to endo. We all took our endo elective initiatives and transferred them to endo emergent initiatives, meaning, you know, you take care of the patient the same way. You resuscitate them, you probably put them in ICU, they get Q1 hour neuro checks and vascular checks and so forth. But perhaps there's a world in which an SFA stent graft gets a different level of post-operative care um, attention than an open, open reconstruction. We don't do that. We, we put them all in the ICU and we watch them. But, but I think there are some different things that we need to think about. One of the things that comes up, certainly we've talked about it briefly, is what do you put them on afterwards? There's no data on this, right? There, there's almost no data in the, in the elective sense about what the best recommendations are for an SFA stent for peripheral artery disease. We wrote a paper about 15 years ago looking at prescribing patterns after lower extremity intervention, and they're all over the map. I mean, people do all sorts of different things. It's important to remember for every one SFA stent we put in, there was probably a hundred or a thousand PCIs done that same day, right? So when you look at coronary literature around how long a person needs to be on antiplatelet therapy, it's just much more robust than what we have in the periphery. The carotid stent population being the notable example. I don't think we're going to get meaningful series, quite honestly, looking at single antiplatelet use, dual antiplatelet use, anticoagulation, in trauma interventions that's gonna help guide this. I, my own personal practice is most trauma interventions, we're not using dual antiplatelet therapy, especially if it's a bigger vessel like the axial subclavian segment, we're just, we're just doing aspirin alone. I think we've shown preliminarily in, in a variety of different data sets that axial subclavian stent grafts tend to do reasonably well in the long term. And if they do occlude, most of the time it's relatively insignificant from a clinical standpoint. You gotta take care of the groin puncture site afterwards. You have to think about things like heparin reversal. There is nothing more, more embarrassing, if you will, than doing a really fancy subclavian stent graft for a gunshot wound and then have to deal with something like this afterwards. So good groin care is key. It's important to remember that these patients are often coagulopathic, right? So your usual practice patterns around how to handle a groin may be changed a little bit. When I started doing TVAR for trauma 12 years ago or whatever it was, like we did cut downs and, and we've transitioned absolutely to percutaneous proglide now, now potentially the Manta device. And so 
thinking about pre-closure, even if you're not doing an aortic stent graft, if you're putting in a large Viabon, like we saw earlier today from Dr. Dua, thinking about pre-closure beforehand. These are lessons that we've, again, learned from our Impella colleagues, leaving those sutures in place, thinking about leaving the sheath in place afterwards, which is obviously not standard practice for most vascular surgeons, but leaving that, that sheath in place until, um, until the, the coagulopathy is able to be reversed. And then we, I'm not going to belabor this point because we discussed it this morning. I, I am a fan, as Rishi mentioned, of, of thinking about the hematoma. When you do a stent graft for arterial trauma, it's very reassuring and the world gets better, but it doesn't manage two things, right? It doesn't manage the vein and it doesn't manage the nerve. And so thinking about the nerve and the vein after you put a stent graft in, I think is really important. So in patients who have neurologic deficits, that are not consistent with a gunshot wound through a cord, but rather a praxia from having an adjacent hematoma. After doing a case like this, I will advocate for making a small incision, evacuating the hematoma. And, I, and I, I've, I've gone back and forth on this in my mind because I think the concept of leaving that virgin plane for your brachial plexus colleagues does have merit and not having created a redo operative field for them. But I think the onus is to get rid of the hematoma early on to make sure that the nerve is not under continued compression. But I, I think that's a, a, an area ripe for conversation as we think about these things. And this is a patient that I've, I've presented at this meeting before who had persistent paresthesias and weakness in his hand that did get better after, after, opening, up the, um, oops, after opening up the hematoma. So what does surveillance mean? Stop me if you've heard this before, but we, we don't know. Like when it comes to endovascular trauma, we don't have large data sets. Um, the series that Joe mentioned earlier um, really showed a patency rate of 84%, and that's probably underreported. There's a lot of folks who just don't go to the same hospital if they're going to go back at all. But I would say the bigger reason it's underreported, and everyone in this room who's done this knows this, I'm just as likely to find an incidental occlusion as I am to find a symptomatic occlusion. The, the reality is the upper extremity is obviously very resistant to uh, chronic ischemia. Collateralization is the, the norm as opposed to the exception. And so what the true incidence is, what target lesion revascularization, what TLR actually looks like, I think remains to be seen. And so it's hard to make recommendations about surveillance when we don't even know what necessarily the natural history of occlusion is. I'm going to transition here for a second. I want to talk about how we should be thinking about this problem, because I think we tend to focus it down to, is it open, is the leg saved, is the limb saved, and so forth. But I think there's consequences that we don't talk about as often about endovascular implantation. So if you think about TVAR for blunt thoracic aortic injury, the top graph on the right is a representation of the aortic diameter of every patient who presented at Grady Moore Hospital over a 10-year period with an injured aorta. Okay, and you can see that it's a, it's a pretty standard bell curve about what you'd expect. The red box were the commercially available devices at the time that the patient underwent for much of the history of what we did, right? 28 millimeter was the smallest device we had until we started to see the Zenith Alpha come up with the 22 treatment. It actually think went down to 18, if I remember correctly. Yeah, the green box on the bottom is what happened over time. And that was all really cool, right? We started to really see devices be tailored to what we were trying to accomplish. We saw smaller aortic diameters able to treat down to people with 17 millimeter aortas. And this is great. We've expanded who we can offer this to. And for the most part, it worked out well. This is a paper we wrote a couple of years ago that differentiates aorta specific complications by what you had your TVAR put in for. So the four major criteria, you can see trauma, penetrating aortic ulcer, aortic aneurysm, aortic dissection, and we had median follow-up about three years, but for many patients, it was out to five or six years. And that's not a typo. Over the time period that we saw here, no patient with an aorta transection who underwent TVAR had an aorta-specific complication over that entire time in our center. Like, that's great, right? So it makes an argument that surveillance of aortic stent grafting really shouldn't be a one size fits all. You should be tailoring it based on the initial indication because compare it to dissection, right? Where about 50% of people may have false lumen perfusion. They may have to go back for secondary stent grafting or branch stenting. 
This is in the era that preceded petticoats and all those other things that sometimes in fenestrate into grafting that's become more common. But the initial indication should drive what we're doing. And I would argue that most aortic stent grafts now do really well. The exception, I mentioned earlier the Cook graft that came out that treated down to a smaller diameter. I think many of you know what happened with that graft. We saw an increased incidence of thrombus formation, particularly in the smaller sizes. And so maybe we had gotten some wax wings, we'd gotten a little too close to the sun and we paid for it. But when you start looking at, and this is a series we did a couple of years ago, at the drivers for thrombus formation inside a stent graft, inside the thoracic aorta, and we've all seen that picture at the top right. We don't think too much of it and we say, that's fine, that's what happens. But there are potential sequelae of that. And the biggest thing that we found that defined who got thrombus or not was gender. And we found that, that women, you can see on the Kappa-Meyer curve, were losing aortic lumen size at a higher rate than men were. And that was independent of having a smaller aorta. This is controlled for overall aortic diameter. So what does that mean, right? Because we've sort of gotten to this point, and we've talked about it. If you're 18 and you're in a car crash and you tear aorta, you're probably getting a stent graft, right? But if you're an 18-year-old woman or a man, based on these numbers, there's a reasonable chance that you're going to have something wrong long-term with your aorta. We don't know if that means coarctation-like syndromes, if it means long-standing hypertension, because we don't study that part of this very well. We don't study what it means to have a stent graft in your body. I'll close by showing you another study that we did that, that took patients who had TVARs. And, and just looked at folks who had follow-up CT scans and based off of CT alone, measured the LV wall thickness over time. And it turns out if you have a stent graft in your heart, you're in, your, in your aorta, your rate of LV wall thickening compared to healthy controls is higher. You start to get a thicker and thicker LV wall from that stiff stent graft sitting in your aorta and your heart having to beat up against it over the course of the next few years. And it's, we, we, primarily focus this group into young patients under the age of 50, which I'm glad to report is still young. But looking at what does it mean over 10, 20, 30 years to have an aortic stent graft in, and what does that mean for your overall cardiovascular physiology? I think these are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. I think surveillance is one thing and sort of post-implantation care, but I think we have to really start thinking about post-implantation care along a long continuum and continuing to drive physiologic evaluations of what it means to have these devices in over time, because much of our focus for obvious reasons is, did you survive? Is your limb still attached? And did you have procedural complications in the first 30 days? But there's so much more that we can learn. Thanks, happy to take any questions. That was really terrific, Ravi. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering about the gender differences that you see, um, if it's because the aortic size is smaller or if it's because of hypercoagulability or both, yeah. and how do you manage that? Do you change your surveillance plan? So we independently corrected for aortic diameter because that was going to be our hypothesis too, is that it was primarily a diameter-driven thing. Um, and this is all, all the, the Kaplan-Meier curves and everything else you saw were born out of um, uh, analyses that corrected for a diameter. We also collected information on uh, menopausal state and oral contraceptive use, S really small numbers, so it got hard to, to comment, but couldn't find a difference based on um, the current hormonal um, you know, where that where where an individual was in their current hormonal um, journey, if you will. Hi, thanks so much. I have a question for you. I'm curious about the evacuation of the hematoma because it's mm -hmm. one of my big things that causes chest pain in me when we do these endovascular stents grafts on a lot of these patients. And having personally done that experiment where I decompress somebody's major venous injury by opening their hematoma, do you have a recommendation about timing for that so that it's not to disrupt what might be, you know, kind of stabilizing clot and kind of that balance between the neuropraxia and the venous injury. I mean, I think that timing is probably like it is in most places. I'm in the operating room. I'm going to take advantage of being in the operating room. I, again, when I've done this and it's only a handful of times, I'm not taking my hand in and scooping, right? So I think just the, it's almost a fasciotomy, if you will. I, and I say decompress the hematoma, but I think somehow releasing the pressure over the site as opposed to truly digging the blood out please Dr. Yeah, i just would rise to say that females are are different than males <laughs> right stating the obvious uh and, and well beyond their hormonal status and their menstrual cycle 
Melania Kibbe's written about this and talked about this quite often. It includes the response to drugs. The endothelial biology, the glycocalyx, et cetera, is, is fundamentally different, probably much more important than the size of the aortas yeah. uh, that you had. So all those unmeasured things, really interesting data. Thanks. Thank you. We actually just published this um, in PAD. Mm -hmm. So we found that uh, for in annals of vascular surgery with, in men and women, they were given exactly the same antiplatelet. Women, so obviously not trauma, but women it, with PAD, their wounds heal less, even though they've got less comorbidities and they have higher amputation rates, which makes no sense. So we thought maybe they're being undertreated or something, but it turns out using TEG that actually women um, respond significantly less to antiplatelet medication. So we're just undertreating all of them. Yeah. Which and so that's actually the part of the next grant that we're doing, but that's probably what's going on. Yeah, and the the many of the clinical trials that we revolve on either don't report what the demographics look like, or they're not reflective of real world populations. Fernandez, hi Ravi, excellent talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the portion on the surveillance because I agree that we kind of translate what we do for bypasses or stents for PAD, whatever intervention we do, um, our follow up, and we usually use duplex scans. And to me, it's a great way to get the patients to come back, Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, gunshot wounds tend not to come back, but at least the blunt people do. And what I've seen is usually if they don't have a problem, they don't come in. They usually come in if there's a problem. But we've run into this patients where years out, they're getting their yearly duplex. And then one year they come in with a thrombose, axosa yep. nothing happened, no symptoms. You're like, what's going on? Um, but... I was going to ask what were you were doing for those, and my second question is on the aortic injuries, because we're seeing these patients now 10 years out, and they're young. We don't want to keep doing CT scans every year. There's literature suggesting, in our experiences, if something's going to happen, it's going to happen within that first year. So we usually do our first CT scan. We don't wait for the month. We do it as an patient, and then we follow up that first year. But after a few years, I'm just doing a chest x-ray. I'm seeing them yearly for a physical exam and if I have any questions then I'll do an ultrasound uh, a CT scan because it's not like the belly where we can do for EVARS duplex scans yeah. so what are your thoughts yeah we rely I, I I think you have a great point this idea of what is the added value of a forced vascular follow-up for duplex and and what other problems are uncovered yeah it's not uncommon someone will come in and say what about my crany can I go get that taken care of or something like that and we rely heavily on duplex absolutely we um, for peripheral trauma I think for the thoracic aorta you know, the SVS has new recommendations on what both um, early surveillance of non-operative aneurysms and late uh, surveillance looks like. And it it continues to drive towards fewer and fewer scans. But I think within trauma, based on the data I showed you, that there's just different outcomes. If you had it done for an aneurysm or done for, for transection, I, I would put the onus on us to consider our own internal guidelines, our own way of thinking about this. And yes, I, I think scanning every three years to every four years may be appropriate early on, but we've got to we've got to cut down on the number of scans that young folks get. Thanks, Two Dr. more questions. <clears throat> well, I, I know Kyle likes uh, controversy, and I know I'm asking this question to the wrong uh, group, but I argued, and Chuck and I spoke of this when we were in Denver. My question is: uh, Is open repair really obsolete? If you have an 18-year-old uh, with a centimeter cuff beyond the subclavian, uh, it's a piece of cake. Uh, I mean, it's a two and a half centimeter interposition graft. We published a series uh, 15 years ago, 21 consecutive torn orders, partial left heart bypass with zero paraplegia, zero interoperative deaths. Now, I'm not saying the tear across the base of the innominate should go have this, but I'm saying a simple little tear just beyond the subclavian, should an 18 year old be considered a candidate for a graft in a position? Yeah, I'll, I'll turn it back on the same conversation that we've had two or three times today. There's not many cardiac surgeons in this room, but I think some of the similar conversation that we had about training and expertise hold true for that specialty as well. It is a chip shot case, but I, I would, encourage you to find a cardiac surgeon who's done an open aortic transection in the last five years. I don't know any. And so what we have viewed as having good outcomes, open surgery, I don't know how able to be replicated those may be going forward because of limited experience. Now, I think the argument is fair that it's a pretty easy case for them given what cardiac surgeons do otherwise. 
but their field continues to move towards more and more catheter based technologies. And I, to answer your question, I absolutely agree that there are young patients who should undergo repair, but I think it's, we have to keep in mind that the learning curve for cardiac surgery is probably changing as well when it comes to open aortic surgery, particularly for this indication. And so I don't know the answer to that. I think if you have someone who does it and has done it and does a good job, yes, selected patients should absolutely undergo open repair. Well, by the way, that series I uh, referred to was all done by trauma, trauma surgeons. Mm -hmm. In but, fact, the cardiac surgeons used to ask us to train the cardiac fellows to repair torn aortas. That's how far we've uh, gone in the last 15 years. I think we'll have a particularly hard time finding current trauma surgeons who are comfortable doing an open thoraco. That, that ship, unfortunately, I think has sailed. So, Ravi, great talk as usual. So, you know, the, the complications you talked about, that uh, graft um, infolding, I think one, is a, one of the photos was graft infolding, and then the graft uh, inside tooth thrombosis, both of those problems really come down to stent graft design. Yeah. And... When you think about you know these different complications, you think about screening patients. I think it really depends on the particularities of the stent graft use and the and whether or not that's on IFU or not, and how new that stent graft is. Because as you mentioned, you know the the, the particular graft you were talking about uh, was only on the market for about a year or so before they started seeing these complications in the smaller size grafts, and all other. Most other grafts don't have those complications. When you use the graft on IFU, uh, at least grafts that have been on the market for a while on IFU, they really don't have those complications. And you don't, you know, we very rarely see problems. But then I think just to Dr. Moore's point too, that we have had two patients in the last couple of years, they're 16 year olds with 14 centimeter, sorry, 14 millimeter aortas that didn't meet any stent graft size. And we elected not to treat those with some kind of shoving a stent in there but rather doing an open, and they all did fine. But I think that if you had a stent graft that could fit in that aorta, probably would still do it endo. So I think it really comes down to how new is that technology and how well studied is it before you decide you know, what the surveillance is going to be. I think wonderful points, Greg. I think, and I'll, I'll call on AJ a sec in a second because I think it ties into it, right? We, this room takes care of vascular trauma. And many times we jury rig or use devices that are designed for non-trauma vascular. And we figure out a way to make it work. But then over time, we develop things that are beneficial and driven straightly to the patient population. There's probably we're, we're nearing probably the level of technology that we would need to create a biologically de uh, biodegradable stent graft, quite honestly. It certainly exists in the coronaries. There's complexities with creating it for a large diameter, but there's almost near, no interest, right? Because it's a niche product that wouldn't see much use outside of aortic transection. I think, you know, and so to, to AJ, like, my God, go to Gore and tell him, I want you to make me a new Viabon that deploys with the string in the middle, right? Or something like that. that. Yeah. But like, how do we engage with industry to make them see that niche products for trauma are worth investment? Because it's still a relatively small part of the pie. Like we're still trying to figure out how to, like you said, squeeze the technology we have into the patients that we're, that we're presented with and that we're taking care of. A corollary to that is, you know, when Gore, for example, uh, is one of the companies, as you know, that, that develops stent grafts for trauma, uh, decided they wanted to do more trauma patients. They just made two smaller sizes. Right. And then literally their market share went, basically took over because every patient, every trauma patient had one of those two sizes. And so I think that that's the, the corollary is if you can just make your product slightly different for this patient population, and you really can corner that market. Yeah, but the, the, I love the back and forth. The, um, the, the cook was market driven, right? We want a device that treats down to 18 and the, the, div, the diameters that got thrombus were those small diameters. It's why when the Terumo device came out, the lowest diameter was 24. You know, we, it wasn't felt necessary to try to push that envelope again. I, don't, I think that's, that's our job to look again, out for the Centigraph design. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Last Oops. question. All right, thank you for a very upsetting talk. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if we should start incorporating echo 
into our surveillance. If you're seeing LVH as a result of this, should we start following these patients 18 years old, let's say every three years you get an echo and figure out what your function is? Yeah, you could. You also have that CT scan <laughs> that usually is gated and goes through the heart. And so that's what we've started doing is really thinking about what does the LV look like? It's a poor corollary. I don't need anyone in the room to say that's not a really good way to do it. But you're right, Rishi, maybe that prompts an echo as opposed to routine echo use. Thanks. Oh, Thank sorry, you. Dr. Moore. Sorry, just another point that I'm sure you're aware of, and the audience should be aware of, is that there is a high risk of hypertension. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be followed as well. Yep. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Wonderful. So the next talk and the last talk is the retrohepatic cable injury and its management by Dr. Efron. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Chuck and the committee for giving me a talk that has lots of p-values and no emotional evidence involved. <laughs> so really bad. Just this is my cava injury is bad slide. It has a high mortality. The retrohepatic cava injury is is, is frequently seen if you take all comers in 20% maybe of the cases. I don't know that that matters when it's sitting in front of you. Um, continues to have the highest mortality of all the areas of the cava. Um, I think saying 100% mortality is a bit dramatic, but in many series, uh, it is reported as such. The mortality is really multifactorial. The injuries usually is not a high, a large energy transfer in order to uh, sort of get to that area. Um, the IVC itself behind the liver is deep in the abdomen. It's well protected. It is very difficult to get to surgically. There's a huge likelihood of associated injuries uh, that, that are gonna come with this as well. And obviously it's a large conduit, massive blood flow. And there needs to be, if it's going to take any amount of time, there needs to be uh, an understanding of, of maintaining that flow uh, while you're trying to address this. In most people, uh, we're talking about an 8 to 10 centimeter uh, uh, length of the, uh, of the vessel, although I dare say mine is probably a little longer than Rishi's, um, attached to the liver along its entire length. Awesome. <laughs> IVC. <laughs> The caudate and the right lobe of the liver, uh, they've got those horrible short branches and never underestimate the caudate's ability to make your day worse. Um, the super pedicava um, should have a little bit of an IVC segment, uh, but it's short, if at all. And there are those people who also decide to, to have their, their liver fused to their, their diaphragm. And so getting distal control ends up always being a challenge. Diagnosis. Well, if it's stable, we make it on imaging, right? If the patient is stable, it's often a surprise. And we sort of get that look on our face going, oh, crap, what are we going to do with that? If the patient is unable, uh, unstable, it's often a surprise because we're actually there in the operating room for something else and the blood starts pouring. And then we say, oh, crap, what are we going to do with that? I mean, it is very uh, it, it is very variable how we find it. It's often really difficult to prepare for um, a priori in the OR. These are just some great pictures came from a journal from the, the American Journal of Radiology. If you look at the top two, these are blunt injuries. Uh, the liver is also injured. The one, injured, the one in the right upper uh, uh, corner also has a large splenic injury. Um, as associated injuries. If you look at the IVC itself, it, it's eccentric. It might be squash. It may lack uh, uh, filling. Um, and the patient may be okay. You know, you have to sort of be able to make your decision. And the gunshot wound there, you can see it's a beautiful trajectory. And this is in the, in the lower image, right down through the middle of the liver and then through uh, the uh, underlying vertebral body. My dad was a terrific clinical surgeon, and he used to talk about the masterful art of surgical inactivity. We're going to treat patients, not necessarily Im images. And so the first thing that you have to decide is, should I touch this at all? If you've, decide, if you've identified this on imaging and the patient is okay, you have a minute. You may have a minute to be able to decide. And, and frankly, uh, you may actually not have to do this. While it's a high volume, 
It's a low pressure system. And the body is a self-sealing tire. We just have to figure out how to optimize its ability to sort of do that. You can pack it in the short term. That actually sort of kicks the can down the road, but it actually may be definitive as far as uh, that particular uh, injury in, in and of itself if you have to manage the other uh, surgical uh, uh, necessities uh, while you're exploring. If you have to repair, you basically have three options. You can actually, um, you can primarily close it if you can get to it. You can patch it if you can get to it. And, and there is, we talk about this a lot. Uh, well, not a lot, because it doesn't happen a lot, but we do talk about this when it comes is, uh, is stenting a, something that is actually fairly uh, realistic and attainable. If we're gonna repair it, we have to sort of, again, keep in mind that we, we're gonna need at least a minimum movement to, to, to sort of, uh, be uh, uh, conducive to life. One thing about packing as you do it is if you make that decision, you might sort of have found yourself in a situation where it's, it's bleeding like mad. This is not the time to take down the entire liver to confirm your diagnosis. Packing is really something that you have to do. You, you rely on the liver's attachments. So before you unroof that, is always worth uh, trying to pack the, the liver and see where you, you end up being, especially if it's something that you suspect but don't 100% know. There are a lot of people who have sort of put together algorithms. This is one from uh, Kenji Anaba. Uh, it's as good as any when you actually talk about this. And again, it get, goes into the opportunities uh, to sort of go down. If you go down to the right there, um, if you are able to get packing control, you actually might get down to the, uh, the part of the algorithm that uh, averts you from actually having to do anything, or if you have to do something, you actually have to prepare. If you actually have to go forward and your packing is not uh, control, uh, controlling the thing, you really have to be uh, willing and able to go big. So what are the things that we then talk about facilitation for this? Well, there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff that's sort of written about and talked about. You heard a little bit about the bridge balloon from Tom earlier. We can talk about, we'll talk about that in a second. There's the option for veno veno bypassing where you can have hepatic isolation and be able to sort of get the field as dry as possible to not only identify the injury and figure out how you're gonna fix it. We talk about shunting through, through that area. Um, that's probably written about more than there are survivors. That's that old joke. Your ability to sort of mobilize, I think, is extraordinarily important. As I get older, I much more favor resectional debridement for exposure, um, although I think, you know, it depends on where that injury actually is. If you've got a, a cut right down the middle, I think diving down into the middle may be the, the correct, uh, uh, the correct uh, option. But if you are talking about something that you're having to get at behind the right lobe or anywhere is into the right lobe, you can't get to it unless you, you get the, the liver out the way. Every time you try to pull it away and open it up, it's working against you. And so uh, I have really started to favor um, some bold resectional debridement, especially on the right side. For that, I tend to use universal stapling. We can finger fracture, but I think the advantage of the staplers is you don't have to stop and and, and uh, uh, do a lot of uh, ligation around the things that you have. It all depends on what the, 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 uh, the, the laceration tends to look like. Don't sleep on the Alice clamps. I think Alice clamps are super important, especially helpful are the Judd Alice clamps because of the way that they actually oppose together. They're not as pokey, they're actually flat. And so even when you get control and you get down to there, there's a little bit of using the force because the sucker doesn't always get it out of the way to be able to get the edges of this thing. And I do think that the Judd Alice clamps give you a slight advantage on that, especially if you're pushing it against the, uh, the uh, um, vertebral body to maintain the, uh, uh, the hemostasis in that location. Please, uh, Dr. Moore, the name on the slide is just so that people can see how they look this up. This is not to sort of uh, have any kind of disrespect in, at all. Look at the date on the picture of that, 1977. Great idea, a balloon to actually include the area with the ability to shunt above and below. Um, this is a great article that I think people should read. I think it describes not only the, 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 the ability of this catheter to maintain flow, 
Um, but it also describes a, a nice case, you probably can tell more about it, of, of a liver resection for a cancer that, that uh, actually, yeah, it helped, it seemed to help tremendously on this, you know, because you just, I assume it's just that one snip too far that you can expect to get into it. Uh, and uh, so you have a controlled stabbing instead of one that came in from the street. Uh, and it can be just equally as, as awful. Try as I might, I can't get one of these. Uh, but I can't get this. This is a bridge balloon. Uh, this is coming out of one of the articles looking at it. It was originally uh, um, developed as such to aid in the temporizing of SVC tears for our cardiologists who uh, just pulled a little too hard in changing pacer leads. Um, and you can imagine, you know, what the room looks like when that goes off, but it can put the balloon up here and tamponide the SVC long enough for the cardiac surgeons to roll around and put a few stitches into that. Uh, and it works very nicely. It's about an eight centimeter balloon that actually can be deployed anywhere along the IVC. It does have a drawback. There's no shunting. So once you do it, you got to move. You got to actually, it, it buys you a little bit of time, but you actually have to have a plan in place uh, to, to um, get going. The other uh, problem with a balloon like this is if it spans the injury itself, especially if there's a gunshot wound, you have no, no idea what's going on on the other side of it. And so there's another down, uh, uh, downside to that. Veno Veno bypass is nice. It's very neat when it works. It is very difficult to uh, get in, uh, in process unless you actually have time to plan for it in the middle of the night. These are the kinds of things that you have to think uh, about really, really early. Um, and it has you, it has the uh, ability, to be honest, to, to actually um, completely dry the field or mostly dry the field, especially uh, all, all of these things that you, you're you going to want to really um, also include a Pringle uh, maneuver to sort of get, get the, the blood flow out. And it gives you an opportunity to look not without some sort of dissection or resection at both sides uh, of the uh, at the entire lumen of the IVC, usually with a little bit of suction help as well. The Schrock shunt seen here with using a chest tube. You can use a chest tube. You can use a uh, endotracheal tube, which has a built-in balloon, which is nice uh, down uh, between the, uh, the the infra uh, hepatic super renal cava. You can actually put that in by um, by palpation. Um, it's nice. It's some telling you something that we actually have to MacGyver these things, and there's no purpose-built uh, shunt for these things, uh, probably because there's no market uh, for these things. And so, you know, the, the big things you have to really be careful about is placing them via the eight. First of all, you got to open up the chest. So now you're actually adding a gr another uh, battlefield to this to a patient who's already an extremist. You have the, the maneuvers are not terribly hard. Um, you know, much of the cardiac surgeons don't want to think that they're the, they want to think they're the only people who can put a purse string into the atrium. Uh, that's not a very hard thing. The hard thing is making sure that it doesn't go down the IVC, I mean, the, the, the hepatic veins, um, and also that you actually cut your holes correctly because you actually have to custom cut holes actually to allow the, the blood to shunt back into the heart as well. So there's a little, this is, again, you can't do this you have to practice this a little bit. You have to practice the maneuvers probably the same way that you had to practice your first uh, uh, trauma thoracotomies so that you have a better idea uh, of where these, uh, these things need to be made. Uh, in the spirit of this conference, you know, this actually, this is a paper that was uh, put out by uh, the uh, vascular service at University of Maryland. Raj Sarkar and his group looking at if you actually took a bunch of measurements on a bunch of IVCs and you actually said, okay, if I were to design different size stents, could we actually design stents that could be deployable? And the answer is absolutely yes. And, and they came up with, it's a pretty cool study. They came up with um, three different sizes that will get to 95% of your need if you wanted to stent the IVC uh, in these injuries. I mean, uh, the IVC gets stented for some bud carry situations. I think that that's a little bit of a different beast. I have no idea how, what to tell you with all the bile that'll probably drip over the top of these things. I mean, I think that's a whole different story as well. Uh, but I think it is a, a very interesting uh, potential thought. I personally think that, you know, the, what puts this in the hand of most trauma surgeons is a two balloon system 
that is shunted that is put in from below where you can put one above the, the, the liver, one below or the, a balloon below the, the liver uh, in the IVC and have some sort of shunt uh, beyond that. Why? Because as trauma surgeons, we can actually take out parts of the liver and we can actually over sew things. And I think it has the potential to put that in the hands of people who are less experienced, which we have talked about a couple of times here, which I think is, is, is a, a, a worry. So in conclusion, the extremely challenging problem, calling for senior help is not a failure because you really get one, maybe two shots at these. Um, and a, another pair of hands that just knows how to retract well is invaluable. If you have to, less is often more in the early phase, but if you have to go big, you have to actually decide before the patient is crazy coagulopathic. Um, you want to know where your equipment is. Uh, we talk about, oh, get me the bridge balloon. And sometimes on the weekends, nobody knows where that actually is. So we sort of, you know, that's a, that's a very important thing to, to sort of have ahead of. And you really want to have your options for these thought out uh, well ahead of time. Thanks. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, you begged my comments. Uh, <clears throat> That paper, actually, it's called the Moore Pilcher Shunt, as you probably know. I developed that as a chief resident <clears throat> after watching an 18-year-old die of a retropathic vena cave wound. I said, there's got to be a better solution to that. It was actually commercialized by USCI and sold for five years, but it, there wasn't sufficient evidence. I hate to be so dogmatic, uh, but my argument is, for large retropathic vena cave wound trees at this time, the only way to save them is vena vena bypass. And uh, Dr. Lawless is in the audience. He can testify. I uh, saved a patient about three weeks ago at Vena Vena Bypass with a four centimeter tear in the retropathic vena cable uh, at, at, uh, from seven, segment six up to the right hepatic uh, vein. And you didn't have a chance to emphasize, but I think critical also to Vena Vena Bypass is drainage of the portal system uh, with a third arm into the venous vena system. It's a very simple technique, and if you can do ECMO, you can put people on people on vena vena bypass very quickly. Packing. David, great talk. Um, when you showed uh, Kenji's uh, algorithm, it says something about toracotomy and subcostal toracotomy, all these things. I'll, I'll, I'm just going to make a comment for the folks that are younger than us in the audience that uh, have not seen this enough. I have not opened the chest unless I'm doing a shunt, which I did three in the last 15 years, but I have not opened the chest in the last 15 years to get this to control. If you scrub a few times with the transplant surgeons, you're going to learn that you can have access to the, uh, uh, you can have distal control and access to the uh, intrapericardic IVC through a pericardial window. So basically what we do is we make an incision in the central tendon of the diaphragm, open the pericardium, look to the right, the, the vena cava is right there, you put a clamp and that clamp stays on top of the liver, doesn't even bother you when you're trying to rotate the right lobe of the liver and that avoids a big thoracotomy or an sternotomy. No, no, well, you go, you go behind it, but you, you have the clamp initially and then you can rotate the right lobe to address the, the, the injury. So it's a, I, I totally agree with you. And I agree 100%. It's not a very difficult thing. I think in the middle of the night, though, with somebody who's less experienced doing that dissection, it's, it's not the time to do your first one. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and I think that that, you know, and, and if, if you've got a patient who's, we all know the patients where you're mobilizing the right lobe, you've got to take it all the way over and people, they, that's where they put the brakes on and they get scared to be able to, to do that. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's actually one place where, for example, I think uh, courses like ASSET become so important, not as, a, not as a taker, but as an instructor, because you see it again, you see it again, you see it again uh, before you have to, to go, you know, crazy on it. Well, and the and point that should be discussed is uh, it's for a preferable to do a trans documented control of a super hepatic vena cava if you have the potential for a false right hepatic vein. If you do the heating maneuver between the liver and the diaphragm with a clamp, 
you'll release torque bleed. Yep. So the best thing is assume you drop torque on the red netting and you control that through the diaphragm. And again, it's not difficult. Yep. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. These are big problems. They need big incisions. Uh -huh. All right. And and so I've not had the opportunity to work with a place that has right heart bypass. Technically, it doesn't sound hard to do, but there's other people and stuff involved. I've never really had the stuff. But I did have a scalpel, right? You can do a sternotomy. You get into and get control of the suprapatic vena cava several different ways. It's highly variable, just like you are in length. The... Um, <laughs> Sorry, you did it, man. I, yeah, I couldn't, couldn't resist. I totally respect it. I own it. Yeah, you own it. And you just do total paddock exclusion, right? There's no other tubes. You don't have any other equipment. And you take the artery, you take the veins, and then you can roll that liver to the midline. Everything's a midline structure and fix the hole. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to skip the panel discussion because we're late. Thank you. So we're going to keep going with the next session, uh, endovascular and vascular surgery, and our first talk uh, by Dr. Dubose on solid organ embolization for hemorrhage, why, when, and how. I don't think. Hey, Chuck, is Joe here? Again, my name is Joe Dubose, and I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk about solid organ embolization for hemorrhage. And they give me the tall order in six minutes of talking about the why, when, and how. Uh, these, are, these are my disclosures, none of which uh, will pertain to my talk today. Uh, and it's a tall order, but I think we can break these down and get to some of these answers by breaking these down to the specific organs we're talking about. And let's start with spleen very quickly. Uh, there's several studies that have demonstrated that embolization is increasingly utilized in spleen, uh, sal splenic salvage. In fact, this one uh, recent study in 2020, looking at the NTDB data, found that there was a 369% increase in the utilization of embolization from 2007 to 2015. We know that this can be done with a very high clinical success rate, 97% and a failure rate of only 3%. And, and we know from the other data that there's likely significant benefit to angioembolization capabilities. Uh, ben Zarzar is a luminary in this area of examination and he showed in 2014 that early angioembolization, irrespective of hospital uh, use rate, was associated with improved splenic salvage. Uh, it, a more recent examination by Shahab and, and their group utilizing TQIP data showed that every hour and delay of angioembolization was significantly associated with an increased 24-hour mortality. So I think it's clearly an important adjunct to employ and utilize uh, in splenic salvage efforts. Let's talk about the liver a bit as well. Another organ that is commonly uh, utilized for angioembolization techniques and in, in an effort to optimize outcomes. Um, it, it may be of greatest use, however, in those patients that are unstable or with active bleeding. And this one study reported in 2020, what they found in a matched comparison of patients who underwent embolization or did not, but with the, with the entire cohort being stable, there was no difference in mortality or transfusion requirements for four to 24 hours. However, um, when you look at a, a, a cohort of patients that are unstable or where AE is actively employed for either radiographic or clinical hemorrhage control, uh, aggressively, what they what studies have found in, in Matsushima studies in 2020 demonstrated is that embolization is significantly associated with improved 24-hour mortality. So it clearly has a role. It's a matter of patient selection for liver injury. The kidney has really a significant absence of data as the final kind of solid organ to throw into this mix. It's, it, I have many images where it is proved of use, but there's almost no data looking at embolization uh, for renal hemorrhage. Uh, and that's a, a real gap in our knowledge base. I think when we're talking about solid organ embolization, we have to acknowledge and all appreciate the potential complications that can come from angioembolization, access complications, embolization specific complications, and device limitations and malfunctions. Uh, the most common, of course, is the, the groin pseudoaneurysm. This is an extreme example of that, but it's just one of a myriad of complications that we have to understand and mitigate the risk for when employing this uh, technology for hemorrhage control. Uh, I think in this, the setting of splenic embolization, one that's not very discussed very often is the, the potential uh, risk for the pancreas as a um, casualty of war, at least at the distal tail of the pancreas. 
This is just one example of an embolization. You can see the coil uh, coils in place there and a, a large pseudocyst from the ischemic uh, distal pancreas that occurred uh, relative uh, to the utilization of proximal uh, splenic artery embolization. So we need to appreciate that anatomy and understand that risk. It, this is also true in the liver. Uh, embolization in the liver should be performed as distally as possible because uh, ischemic necrosis in the liver is a significant price to be paid in the context of a critically ill trauma patient. And no one demonstrated this better than Dr. Scalia and Dr. Stein in their review of these instances where they found a major hepatic necrosis following angel embolization occurred in about a quarter of patients, which significantly increased morbidity and mortality. And obviously there are always mishaps that can occur. This is just one example. This was a patient that was transferred to our facility after uh, liver embolization. Unfortunately, the coils got away from them and they placed them in the common hepatic artery, making the entire liver somewhat ischemic. Fortunately, uh, we were able to grasp these coils and remove them and restore perfusion to the liver. But you can see that e with employment of any of these technologies, untoward events uh, need to be guarded against and we need to have strategies to man manage them when they do occur. So putting all of it together for solid organ embolization in the context of a very fast talking six minutes, the use of angel embolization and splenic trauma has increased. AE has a high success rate and low complication rate. And the likely key elements that influence angioembolization success include selection, uh, particularly for patients with vascular lesions or injuries or bleeding from solid organs, early utilization in unstable patients, and most importantly, a consistent and collaborative approach to utilization. There are a lot of data gaps that remain, including the timing, optimal timing of angioembolization, the type of embolization agents that we use, coils versus some of the liquid or uh, thrombogenic uh, lesions. What skill set is required? Can vascular surgeons like myself do this? I, I have routinely demonstrated that to be the case, as does the group of shock trauma. But it's best done probably in a partnership with a, a combined team of stakeholders. What environment is required? Does this require an IR suite, a hybrid room? Can it be done with a vascular C-arm? This needs to be studied. And then what follow-up imaging do we need to, to uh, uh, undertake in these patients uh, to determine success? And how do we determine success? So thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope I at least glossed over the why, when, and how of solid organization and provided some fuel for subsequent discussion at the meeting. Thank you. I think we'll give out an award for the, uh, the most timely and timed uh, right on the nose talk. So um, if there aren't any questions, uh, maybe we could save those. You know, we have addressed some of what Joe uh, talked about in previous lectures and we can bring them up uh, as part of a panel discussion afterwards. But maybe we'll just move to our next speaker, um, who is Deb Stein, who's going to speak on the management of vascular injury at the thoracic outlet. Deb, Great. nice Thank to see you. Thank you. Thanks so much for the invitation to be here, particularly Dr. Fox and Dr. Kundi for the uh, invitation. I have no uh, financial disclosures. I have a Huge disclosure that I'm incredibly intimidated about talking about this topic in this room with these individuals. <laughs> and I'm not a vascular surgeon, I'm not an endovascular surgeon, but I'll try to give you a little bit of philosophy about how we take care of these patients having done this for a while now. And I always think about when I talk about like what's the thoracic outlet is what lives there. And we talk about what lives there, obviously the, 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 um, the structures that we are most concerned about are obviously gonna be the subclavian arteries and the common carotid arteries. I'll leave the veins to my colleague, Dr. Tanos, who's gonna be speaking after me. And I think that there are a couple of philosophical questions that we should ask ourselves that help to guide our decision-making early on when these patients present in our trauma bay. The first one is, and I'll go through why I think this, is that blunt trauma is different than penetrating trauma in this area. And uh, I'll go through again in, this, in a minute, but why that is. The other thing is, what are your resources that may or may not be available to you in any given day, time of day, day of the week? For example, do I have access to a hybrid suite? Do I have access to an endovascularist? my new term, um, do they have the appropriate equipment, equipment that they might need to adequately address these injuries in uh, rapid succession, and if especially when a patient is hemodynamically unstable? And then lastly, obviously, which is my patient, right? Is it this person on the left-hand side who's clearly going to be dying from their injury any minute now if I don't do something versus somebody who really looks quite okay but may have radiographic findings concerning for major vascular injury. Very, very different patients, very, very different circumstances. And so I think those three questions are really important as we kind of walk through this. So the first thing we'll walk through is why is blunt injury and penetrating injury so different? 
Well, if you think about how protected those structures are in the bony thorax, it's really hard to injure your common carotid artery or subclavian artery, subclavian artery in a blunt trauma without significant other injuries. It's just, right, I mean, that's such a well-protected area. And so often, almost always, these patients are going to have significant competing priorities, their brain injury, their pelvic fractures, their liver injuries, whatever else. So you have to kind of prioritize where is a subclavian artery or common carotid artery prioritize in, uh, in your spectrum of things that you need to be dealing with. And I would argue to you that blunt common carotid arteries, artery injuries are functionally blunt cerebrovascular injuries and should probably be treated as such. I'm not going to go into the huge body of literature on how we manage patients with blunt cerebrovascular injury, but clearly the major risk in these patients is going to be stroke. That stroke is going to be embolic or thrombotic. Those patients should be treated with antiplatelet agents plus minus anticoagulation, a debate for another time, and really don't require any significant surgical intervention, in my opinion. Um, again, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the, blunt, the blunt subclavian artery injuries are very often in association with major bony injuries, specifically musculoskeletal injuries, in which oftentimes these patients basically have internal four-quarter amputations or thoracoscapular dissociations, which can come in all different flavors and severities. And so I think the key thing in a blunt um, subclavian artery injury is you're asking yourself, number one, are they hemodynamically unstable from that injury itself, which I would suggest to you is actually relatively rare. What else is going on with the patient, their brain injury, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, is the hand acutely threatened? Because oftentimes, as we know, the subclavian artery is super well collateralized around the shoulder. Oftentimes, the patient can have a complete thrombosis of their subclavian artery, and you, they are not manifesting any signs or symptoms of ischemia, which obviously changes your decision making with respect to how soon you have to intervene or if you have to intervene at all. And then is the arm working? Right? Do they have such, such severe brachial plexopathy or brachial plexus injury that is it even worth, and we talked about this earlier with respect to the popliteal artery injuries, is it even, quote unquote, worth revascularizing this, this extremity, especially if it's not acutely threatened? Penetrating injury is totally different, and I think we all will recognize that, or it's usually, right, there's an 80-20 rule here, right, 20% of everything I'm saying here is completely wrong, but 80% of the time, right, these patients are going to be grossly unstable. Um, chest x-ray is unequivocally your best friend. I will freely admit this was a chest x-ray of a patient of mine that I completely misinterpreted, and I started in his neck, and I needed to be in his, in, behind his clavicle. And you can see here that massive chest wall hematoma where he did not have a lot of neck hematoma there. And so again, using where do you see blood collecting, really helpful in determining where you're going to make your initial incision, which is the first real decision making uh, you have to do once you decide you're going to operate. Dr. Feliciano has certainly taught me that Foley catheters are unequivocally your friend for gunshot wounds, right? Sticking it in the hole, blowing up the balloon, and so there's not external bleeding can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. Uh, when you're talking about carotid artery injuries, <clears throat> please try, if you can, to get some evaluation of whether or not the patient is manifesting any signs or symptoms of stroke. Because if they've already had a stroke at the time that they, that they present, your management really might change. Common carotid, not so much. Internal carotid absolutely changes your management. And for subclavian artery injuries, remember that your pulse exam can be very deceptive because obviously the patient can maintain a palpable pulse even in the setting of a complete transection or thrombosis of their subclavian artery. Anomalous artery injuries, obviously, you can have or combined injuries, and you can have they basically can present as either common carotid or subclavian artery injuries. Your approach to all of these things is going to obviously depend on what your resources are. So when we talk about about open approaches. It's all about getting there, right? And this is why. These injuries are so difficult, particularly the subclavian artery. The common carotid artery injuries are pretty straightforward if you're going to operate on these patients. An anterior sternocleidomastoid incision extended down to a sternotomy if you need proximal control. But that's pretty straightforward. The real controversy, and I would love to hear what people think about this, is how do you get to the subclavian artery emergently when you really need to? I, having trained at the, at the University of Maryland, trained with Dr. O'Connor and Dr. Scalia, I'm a huge fan of median sternotomy, even for left subclavian artery injuries. I think it gives you the best proximal exposure and the best proximal control. I then typically will extend that over to a clavicular incision um, and resect the clavicle if needed. You can, always, you can always wire it back in if you need to or want to. That tends to be my preferred approach, but freely admit that the literature will discuss a high anterolateral thoracotomy particularly for left-sided injuries. It's just not my personal favorite approach. I've never done a trap door. I hear they're super morbid. I see Dr. <laughs> I see Dr. Coimber shaking his head so we can get rid of the trap door incision. But this is really like you're taking your best guess. And I remember, I think it was Dr. Feliciano saying, you know, every now and then you just have to make it, if the first incision you make doesn't work, make another one. 
and you keep making incisions until you get to you get to where you need to go. So, but that can be one of the hardest decision making, I think. And I think the one real mistake here is to put a patient up on their side. And I think we'll all agree that once you put the patient up on your side, not only have you burned your endovascular options, but you've also burned your ability to act to access different incisions. But what do you do once you get there? <clears throat> proximal and distal control. I think that balloons are absolutely your friend. I'll show this to you in a second, but um, balloons for proximal control, particularly for subclavian artery injuries, so that perhaps you don't have to open the sternum, you can do something else. And then once you get there, you find your injury and you have your control, knowing your options with respect, are you gonna bypass? What conduit are you gonna use if you are gonna bypass? What, are you gonna shunt the patient? Or are you just gonna ligate the vessel, which obviously in the setting of particularly the subclavian artery is certainly an option, uh, particularly if you're, if you're using a damage control approach. Your endovascular options, <clears throat> um, again, I'm not an endovascular surgeon, so I would welcome a commentary on this, but this is if you go to the literature and ask what the literature says. Uh, endovascular balloon occlusion for proximal control is incredibly helpful. Uh, balloon expandable stent grafts or self-expanding endoprosthetic stent grafts. There have been some criteria proposed for subclavian artery injury, so an injury segment less than three centimeters, partial disruption of the arterial wall or pseudoaneurysm. And then my favorite word in medicine, contraindications. I don't believe in the word contraindications. I believe in a bad risk-benefit ratio, um, but would be are classically described as vessel transections, brachial plexopathy from he with hematoma, or concomitant injuries that are causing contamination. But I would suggest to you, and I think we, everybody in this room will agree, that hemodynamic instability is no longer a contraindication because Rishi can probably get there quicker than I can. <clears throat> well, ch at least Chuck can. Um, <laughs> this is a great picture. Thank you, Rishi, um, for sharing this with me. This is a great picture. I heard Joe DeBose talk about this technique several years ago. I think he called it a flossing technique whereby you access the femoral artery and you access the upper extremity and can actually uh, put stent grafts in for patients that have complete vessel trans transsection. So I think that that's obviously from a standard of care perspective. If you can do it and you can do it quickly, you probably can still do it quicker than we can get in open. Again, I think that most of our carotid artery injuries <coughs> are basically blood supervascular injuries. We all know how we feel about, about taking care of those patients. Most of the time, they do not require intervention other than any plate or anticoagulation, as I stated. I really think that we should be reserving stent grafts for enlarging pseudoaneurysms or worsening dissections, and then obviously coil embolization for pseudoaneurysms that have a, a short a, a neck that is amenable. For the common carotid, there are some, um, there's a couple of case series on this. The common carotid artery is pretty easily accessible, and so I don't think we know uh, with respect to whether endovascular options are better than open options. I don't, I certainly don't believe, have any reason to believe that they would be worse. Uh, in one study, very small study, though te technical success was 100% with similar morbidity and stroke rates as uh, with open procedures. So I will finish up there. I thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer any questions. I wonder if we should um, move to the next talk sure. and save questions for the end of this session uh, and sort Sounds of pool them. Is that all right? Great. Yeah, of course. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker, Dr. Tenus, will uh, talk to us about vein ligation versus reconstruction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fox, Dr. Kundi, for the invitation. Thank you also for uh, placing me after the three smartest people I know, Dr. Efron, Dr. DeBose, and Dr. <laughs> Stein. Uh, I can only fail, but we'll try it. So my topic is venous ligation versus reconstruction and trauma. Uh, I do not have any disclosures, uh, apart from the fact that I am not a vascular surgeon. And I learned today that many of the authors of the articles that I relied on to answer these questions are sitting in the room. So uh, my apologies for any misinterpretation, but I think I un understood your data right. So. Uh, Historically, and I had to go to the expert to get more answers, uh, Dr. Feliciano, but, uh, and I definitely advise everyone to read his paper about the history of venous trauma published last year. Uh, historically, up until the end of World War II, uh, veins were ligated uh, if they were injured, and especially extremity veins. Uh, actually, if you ask any trauma surgeons, when I, asked, when, I asked when I told people what I was preparing, trauma surgeon would tell me, just tie it off. What's the topic about? But then if you ask vascular surgeons, they tend to say, well, wait a minute, there's a little more nuance. Uh, it wasn't until the Vietnam War that uh, if you look at the registry, about one third of all venous injuries were repaired. In modern times, one of the first articles to actually tackle the question was written by Dr. Scalia out of Kings County Hospital Center. 
they examined 79 venous injuries of the lower extremities, 48 of which were ligated, 31 were repaired. And there was no real difference in post-operative morbidity, rate of fasciotomy, or interference with daily activities at discharge. There was very similar um, lack of edema at, the, at discharge for all these patients. Now, the arguments for venous ligations are many. And uh, this slide is a little rich, but I really wanted to tackle each one of them to see if they're valid. So one of the major arguments is the significant rate of early occlusion of repairs. In truth, though, if you look at uh, the rate of early patency, uh, less than 30 days from the repair, you realize that they're actually pretty acceptable for major veins of the lower extremity and for the different types of venous repairs. So they range between 70%, 60% and 100% which is pretty acceptable for most people. Another argument was the lack of long-term patency, which is patency more than 30 days after the operation. But here again, looking at six reviews between 1985 and 2002, the rates were pretty acceptable for patency uh, for the common femoral, the femoral, and the popliteal. They range between 60 and 100%. One feared complication of venous repair is the DVT, whether at the site of the repair or at a different site, just from violating Virchow's triad. But if we compare ligation to repair, the rates that are present in the literature for DVT are actually tend to be a little higher for ligation than for repair, and they are pretty acceptable. PE is another feared complication, but that really hasn't been proven to be related, uh, to be associated with either ligation or repair. Perhaps the most convincing arguments are really arguments based on common sense, which are that Ligation of the vein tends to lead to a speedier operation, certainly is something to use in unstable patients. And what, if you have other life-threatening injuries or competing injuries, then you really don't want to be sitting there trying to repair a vein that you know may not result in any uh, benefit for the patient. There's also no proven significant difference in limb edema and civilian trauma. Now, on the flip side, the arguments for venous reconstruction, and these are arguments that I found mostly in papers written by vascular surgeons, Dr. Williams here, I can see him. So it's uh, basically minimization of blood loss and venous congestion of the arterial repair to make sure that your arterial repair is more successful. It is postulated that even a brief period of venous patency may, may mitigate early effects of reperfusion by allowing collaterals to form. Also, there's anecdotal evidence that late recanalization after uh, thrombosis of the initial vein repair is present and can help. There's also a higher ri risk of limb edema and need for fasciotomy with ligation and military trauma that was refuted by Guys et al. in 2020. Uh, so the thought behind that was that the blast injury that is usually present in military trauma leads to more limb edema if the vein is ligated, which is why it's an argument for repair in that case. Now, consideration for repair. If we choose to repair the vein, what uh, should we be thinking about? <clears throat> Timing of the venous repair versus the arterial repair is an important factor. Um, interestingly, most vascular surgeons will recommend that the vein be repaired before the artery, once the artery is shunted, if there's brisk flow in the artery, in order to make it more successful to the, for the arterial repair to stay patent after it's completed. It starts with a gentle venous Fogarty balloon thromboembolectomy, emphasis on gentle. Uh, usually for primary repair, up to 50% narrowing, narrowing can be tolerated. And if, uh, if that's not possible with the primary repair, then using an autogenous vein graft harvested from the contralateral side is advised, but also synthetic materials is also possible. Tempor temporary venous shunting is an option. There's not a lot of data about the patency of these shunts. Uh, it is there, but it's not a lot of it. And uh, it is something that can be used in unstable patients. I had to ask a friend for help, for help for a good picture of that, Dr. Scarupa in Florida. But uh, this uh, is a popliteal injury that he had to uh, tackle in 2021. Um, this patient, 35-year-old male, uh, gunshot wound to the popliteal area with injury to both the artery and the vein. Both were shunted. There was a really good flow in the popliteal artery, so the vein repair was performed first. Uh, contralateral... Uh, saphenous vein was harvested, but it was too small to use as a conduit for the popliteal vein, so it was used for the artery, while the PTFE graft was used for the vein. The patient did very well with the no real uh, life-limiting complications, well, walked out of the hospital. So 
going back to the literature to answer this question can be a little confusing. Uh, I highlighted these two papers because they are often quoted and many, some of the authors are sitting here, so uh, I did not mean to put people on two sides of the field, but uh, it is uh, interesting just looking at them because, you know, if you look at the article by Bayerli et al., uh, which looked at the, uh, the popliteal vein ligation versus repair in trauma patients using data from NTDB, uh, they did recommend that uh, venous ligation and venous repair had equivalent rates of fasciotomies and limb loss. So they really didn't see any evidence for, uh, for, the, uh, for repair being a better option. On the other hand, if you look at the paper by Matsumoto et al., which also looked at data from the National, National Trauma Data Bank, they recommended uh, repair versus ligation. They recommended repair because they saw that there was a higher rate of um, fasciotomies and limb loss in patients who had ligation. This is all using the same data or the same data sets. And the reason for that is that this remains a challenging question. There's no real clear grading system for venous injury. Uh, the NTDB data lacks a lot of granularity as it relates to venous injuries. And there's no uniform protocol for repair or post-operative management, which limits the ability to study that question. There's also a lack of late follow-up data for patency and patient outcomes. So in conclusion, the best argument I can give for venous reconstruction uh, is to do it when there is a major lower extremity vein and there's a concomitant arterial injury, especially if it's an isolated extremity injury and the patient is stable, and if it's technically feasible and you have somebody who is trained to do that. In cases of upper extremity vein or veins below the popliteal level, or if the injury is very destructive and the patient is unstable, then ligation may remain the better option. But shunting is an option in these cases as well, if it's possible. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Very nice, uh, very nice talk. And I think your summary slide nailed it, at least in my experience. And maybe we'll have questions at the end of the session. Our next talk is on venous bypass uh, for chronic iliocable occlusion. Uh, Kanjan, you, uh, thank you for giving this talk to us. Uh, good afternoon again. Um, I wasn't exactly sure why Chuck asked me to give this talk. Uh, I assumed that it was because he wanted me to make a fool of myself giving a talk about something that no one else does and no one believes in, and that kind of went out of favor 50 years ago. But all right, um, venous bypass surgery. Uh, we'll talk about the relevant anatomy, some of the literature, uh, which is extremely sparse, uh, cases and indication and conclusions. That literature being sparse thing, that's a common theme in pretty much everything I talk about. So it makes it a lot easier to write talks. Um, so the relevant anatomy, as we know, starting in the foot, they're paired uh, pedal veins, paired tibial veins. They, they follow the arteries. They come up to uh, typically paired popliteal veins to uh, the femoral venous system, the deep femoral venous system, the common femoral system, and it follows it up to singular veins, up to the vena cava, back up to the heart. Um, so looking at some of the literature, a lot of it is old, but this is kind of the um, basis of why we treat things like post-thrombotic syndrome, which is really uh, the chronic disability, the chronic swelling, the indurated skin, the venous ulcers, all these things that we find in patients with chronic DVTs. Um, so this study by uh, Khan et al. in 2008 showed predictors of post-thrombotic syndrome was really proximal DVTs, common femoral, iliac, cable thrombosis. And the presence of post-thrombotic at one month has longer uh, or worse long-term outcomes. Um, looking at Duquettes' study from 2001, they looked at almost uh, 1,200 patients, all, all with proximal DVTs, all true with anticoagulation. Recurrence of DVT at three months is 5.1%. And the iliofemoral DVT system has a higher rate of uh, recurrence compared to fempop or tibial, which is why we focus much more on this segment. When you look at the quality of life for people with post-thrombotic syndrome, uh, quality of life is lower than patients with unstable angina, COPD, 40% of proximal DVTs will develop post-thrombotic syndrome if not managed and, and monitored long-term, which is why this whole idea of um, being okay to ligate the popliteal vein, I question it because these patients, given the next 20 years of their life, may not be okay with that decision. 75% uh, of the cost of DVT treatment is related to post-thrombotic syndrome, and a lot of these people end up with permanent disability. And I tend to focus a lot on the permanent disability things because I see people at end stage. Um, 
these are things that can occur when you look at CT venograms. In people with chronic uh, venous occlusions, this is actually a pretty good situation because they've offloaded themselves with an, a native palma procedure, right? They've had their own internal bypass created, and these people tend to be pretty compensated. So when they don't form these cross pelvic collaterals is when you have the problem. So this is my disclaimer on the, on the literature. Um, it's really an opinion. Iliac vein stenting, extremely widely used. Depending on where you are in the country, you'll see a ton of this. Uh, the literature on venous bypass is sparse and is very low quality. So uh, this was uh, one of the first reported cases of the Palma procedure. It is actually the first reported case of the Palma procedure in someone with chronic venous occlusion. So uh, they underwent a Palma procedure following uh, post-traumatic vein occlusion. Uh, it's a 43-year-old male who had venous wounds, massive edema, pain after a gunshot wound to the abdomen and pelvis with a common femoral or common iliac vein ligation on the left side. Um, they performed the Palmer procedure within a couple days of elevation and compression. Swelling went down. The patient went on to do well. Uh, in the same year, this was described uh, using PTFE for a Palmer, which is a cross uh, femoral femoral vein bypass. Uh, this is a patient with end-stage renal disease who had a femoral loop graft in place. Um, and uh, they had disabling uh, venous claudication and edema from this graft that they needed in place. If they already have a thigh graft, they're pretty much out of options. So they did a cross uh, femoral PTFE bypass. And you can see on the last side of this slide, uh, that's an arteriogram performed where the venous bypass is filling well because it's got an AV fistula or AV graft in that leg. Um, this was published not too long ago out of uh, China. Uh, they're talking about doing a, creating a back table bifurcated graft using PTFE grafts um, in a pantaloon type of fashion. To do a bifemoral to cable bypass, this is actually my preferred way of doing these things as well, uh, using 12 millimeter ringed PTFE grafts and uh, fashioning a back table uh, bifurcated graft. Helps with venous ulcers. Uh, this was described out of India. Um, it was a technique, a hybrid technique, where they performed an endovenectomy of the common femoral vein. Um, and repaired the vein. Unfortunately, they had no data uh, in terms of outcome. They didn't mention anything about patient demographics or anything like that. Uh, so Camarota and his colleagues uh, a few years ago published their series of 31 patients doing the same procedure and actually having data to back it up. Um, the problem with the first iteration of their technique is they had 88% major complication rate doing this. Five iliofemoral thromboses, four major wound bleeds, four wound infections, two common femoral vein uh, stenoses, one iliac vein rupture, these are terrible outcomes. Again, why my mentors tell me not to do this surgery. Uh, they modified their technique, and after they modified their technique, combining endovenous uh, revascularization, in addition to open proximal inflow in the common femoral and profunda veins, uh, their results became much better. 7% wound bleed, 7% infection, 0% thrombosis, 0% reintervention. This is a case of mine uh, not too long ago. It's a 43-year-old male with a long-standing history of left-sided post-thrombotic syndrome, chronic pain, swelling, venous ulcers, uh, that just don't heal. He's a truck driver, long distance truck driver. This is a this is a population that gets this a lot, it seems. Multiple failed iliac stents in the past, multiple failed recanalizations, had two failed palma procedures. And uh, the arrows kind of indicate what we're looking at here uh, with the failed stents. Uh, this was my venogram, underwent venography, tried to recanalize it. You see the massive hornet's nest of uh, veins in his groin and pelvis and the occluded stent. So um, underwent a... Uh, uh, left common femoral vein to inferior vena cava bypass using a 12 millimeter ring PTFE graft and a permanent ipsilateral AV fistula in the groin. I don't know how to play this. Um, that's actually a video. So this is a video of the uh, CT scan afterwards um, at his follow-up, three-month follow-up, and you can see the bypass is patent, and it's filling on arterial timing just because of the AV fistula, but his leg swelling went down, his venous ulcers have healed, and now he's a year out, totally healed, has not recurred, which is unusual for the man. This is another thing that I've picked up, which is um, because of my masochistic tendencies, I suppose. A uh, 21-year-old female with severe abdominal pain, lower back pain, pelvic pain. She's had prior mal surgery. So this is a patient with multiple abdominal compressions. She had a venography with provocative maneuvers and intravascular ultrasound. She had basically nutcracker syndrome, which is compression of the left renal vein, and May Thurner syndrome, iliac vein compression. Um, came here from Ohio, actually. Uh, so these are venographies. Uh, showing the left renal vein flow is really going into the ascending lumbar veins and the renal lumbar veins. This is the intravascular ultrasound showing a 79% stenosis of the renal. 
This is the intravascular sonography of the iliac system, seeing the extensive cross pelvic collateralization, and she had an almost 80% stenosis of her common iliac vein. Both led to severe pain when we performed provocative maneuvers in the uh, venogram. Surgically, this is what we did. We identified that the renal vein um, was actually compressed in two locations, one by the SMA, one by an uh, unusual course of the renal artery crossing on top into the hilum. So two points of compression there that we detorsed the kidney and uh, reimplanted it, moving the whole kidney down. Uh, this is the iliac vein that we repaired uh, uh, surgically, where uh, you can see the common iliac artery crossing over the common iliac vein, and we anteriorized this using a bovine panel graft, like Dr. Rajani mentioned earlier. This is our my go-to for uh, venous conduits for these patients because it's such a high-flow system. Uh, she did really well. I just have a problem with putting stents in young people. Uh, so with iliac vein stenting becoming more commonplace, venous bypass surgery will become more necessary. Uh, and carry a high rate of morbidity and perioperative complications. These surgeries really should be performed places where we do them a lot. I mean, for example, I think for these cases, we've done 54 in the last two years because you're coming from all over with these chronic stents being occluded. So um, thank you very much. Now for the final talk of the session, we'll have uh, Dr. Simon Faher from Israel will speak to us about TVAR for penetrating aortic injury. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for making me have this opportunity, Chuck. Thank you very much for having me here. I must say on a personal note, I'm uh, a vascular surgeon from Israel, but grew up in Maryland. Um, my father working at the University of Maryland and me in my high school years playing in the the corridors of the shock trauma in the university. So it's uh, quite a closure for me and an honor to be here and share some of my experience. Um, we're going to be speaking about a subject which is um, maybe a little bit controversial. Um, I will try to share with you my, how do we work here? I have no conflicts of interest. Um, up until this spring, I've been a chief of vascular surgery at the uh, Mayer Medical Center in Far Saba in Israel. It's about an 800-bed hospital with a lot of trauma. Um, a lot of my free time is spent uh, lately promoting EVTM and trying to increase the um, knowledge and exposure of young surgeons, anesthesiologists, vascular surgeons, uh, in the endovascular trauma management techniques. With my friends and colleagues, Tal Horror and Boris Kessel, we had a EVTM Israel Symposium, and among other guests in the crowd here, including Chuck, and um, some other international guests, and continuing doing some um, work in the education committee of the EVTM internationally, um, helped publish the chapter in the book that you have received today, The Endovascular Management of uh, Blunt Aortic Trauma. Um, today I will be speaking a little bit about our experience, my experience in the Mayer Center, where we did have a few cases of penetrating trauma, in which, um, as you see, uh, there is a bullet um, actually just creating a pseudoaneurysm of the descending thoracic aorta. In Israel, um, we do live in a bad neighborhood, and you hear a lot about of our, our military um, problems. However, in, just as in the States here as well, a lot of the civilian and domestic trauma is on the rise, and we do have a lot of um, trauma, penetrating trauma, gunshot wounds as such, and uh, we are having to deal with that. I initially... Um, let's see, I don't want to go... So I just wanted to bring in this case where the patient had a solitary bullet and was um, had no other co-injuries, comorbidities, was stable, and he was brought into our hybrid suite in which we performed TVAR um, quite successfully and simply and went home without any other complications. This was an interesting case of a doctor who came into the ER and said that I've been stabbed and I'm bleeding. Um, he was fully conscious, stable, saturation was normal. And um, in the CT, this is, we see this very um, impressive, um, actually the person that stabbed him and the entry point was above the left clavicle. 
and the screwdriver um, actually arrived and penetrated the descending aorta, as we see a very um, impressive uh, hole, which is covered by the tamponade of the hemothorax. So him being stable enough, we've transferred him to our um, hybrid suite, and we, um, along with the resuscitation that we were performing, we were able to do a successful T-bar of his descending aorta and um, sparing his left subclavian as well. So um, we, we believe that the T-bar, um, along with treating him in his acute situation, was just part of the treatment. Afterwards, he had some um, suspected bleeding and reduced hemoglobin. And we went on to do a um, thoracotomy and drainage of his um, hemothorax. It was very nice to see the stent graft from the outside. Um, no other injuries were found, and the follow-up of two years was uneventful. So when I was um, uh, trying to find some more information about penetrating trauma in the literature, there's very few um, reports. Most of the reports are case reports to Japanese uh, case reports citing um, TVAR in a 15-year-old boy with penetrating injury and bilateral hemothorax. Uh, was treated by a gore excluder as well. And um, another case reported in 2021 with um, TVAR treating an enlarged pseudoaneurysm um, of the thoracic aorta, which was um, caused by a penetrating crossbow to the chest cavity, an interesting case. So we all know the advantages and the disadvantages of TVAR. We've had some speakers today, and um, it seems to be the state of the art for most blunt um, trauma. The Cochrane database um, that have gone through some meta-analysis and cohort studies throughout the years, which have been updated up till 218, have found that um, um, less parapegia, less mortality, and decreased hospital stay, but there are no randomized control trials to determine the decreased morbidity and mortality. Um, this is a multi-center retrospective study that we know from Joe DeBose um, with um, a very um, extensive look at the different uh, treatment types and the different grades of the blunt trauma, CT angio for diagnosis in 95% of the cases with 50% of um, TVAR and acute um, aortic reality. Uh, Aortic-related mortality was very low in all of these cases and not related to um, the TVAR. He concluded that TVAR was um, protective against aortic-related mortality and a decrease in complications in TVAR, um, but need for prospective long-term studies. When it comes to penetrating thoracic aortic uh, trauma, there are not really any guidelines that have been published, and so we are basing this on several um, reports in 2011, Mitchell um, from Mississippi stated that emergency procedures on the descending aorta um, in this age can be treated endovascularly. TVAR is the treatment of choice for acute surgical emergencies of uh, thoracic aorta, whether blunt or penetrating. We know that um, in penetrating trauma, we are dealing with grade three or grade four and most frequently is due to projectile, gunshot wounds, or stab wounds, while most of the um, injuries are lethal and more than 80% of the patients will not um, survive to the emergency room. Another interesting article out of South Africa published in Mediastinum lately, um, assessment of penetrating trauma of the um, aorta was similar to blunt. However, CT angio obviously only for those stable enough. CT angio for penetrating trauma due to, is quite problematic because sometimes there are um, uh, foreign body effects on the, on, the, on the CT itself, which makes um, diagnosis difficult. In a hybrid suite, we could use catheter di directed uh, angiography as well. It might be performed instead or in addition to the CT angio. Our hybrid room could um, allow for endovascular solution in a patient which could not undergo CT angio, and the pathology that we could see could be more complex because we are looking for um, possible aortocaval or aortovenous fistula, and the hybrid suite could be an ideal environment to combine endovascular treatment 
as definitive treatment with the open procedure decreasing morbidity. Um, it's also possible to combine, as with our case, a T-VAR and a thoracotomy for drainage of massive the uh, hemothorax or for exploration for a pulmonary injury. As in conclusion, T-VAR evolving to become a treatment of choice not only for blunt thoracic aortic injury, the improvement of our endovascular skills and technology in our hybrid room will allow T-VAR in selective patients with penetrating trauma, and T-VAR in penetrating um, thoracic aortic injury can be considered as a definitive treatment or as a bridge to surgical treatment, even in penetrating trauma. Thank you. Thank you for a nice, uh, very nice talk and some um, excellent case uh, presentations. Chuck, I guess we'll defer to you and um, the uh, meeting leadership if we should uh, just take a short break maybe, or however you want to do it. What's that? Sure. Are there any questions for the last group of speakers? Uh, so on Dr. Tannis's talk, uh, Todd, I agree with you. His uh, summary slide was excellent. So a quick case we had recently. So uh, it's a junctional injury, gunshot, uh, uh, common femoral artery and vein. Patient comes in peri arrest. I get proximal control by uh, by opening the chest, getting the aorta. Get him up to the operating room, rope out the iliacs, then get then get the artery and the vein out. Vascular surgeon comes in, puts the artery back. Um, he's bleeding. We pack him. We bring him back two days later. And now, and you guys, you gentlemen, both know these vascular surgeons, and they are excellent. Um, they're looking at the leg, they think it's phlegmasia, right? So the, um, and the patient is not perfect, right? A young guy, not perfect. I say, leave it ligated and just let him be. They, and I made the mistake of taking a vote in the room and I was outvoted. <laughs> at, so they're gonna put, at the same moment, there's an active shooter in the building, 10 feet below us, there's a shooting and there's a guy that has an open artery. I have to go down and leave and surround myself with cops when uh, we're dealing with the active shooter. What, what would you have done? Forget the active shooter. I mean, it was a bad day. <laughs> it was a really bad day. Look it up. This really happened. So uh, you get the picture, right? The, uh, we barely got this patient alive. Um, it's the take back. Um, should they do the vein or not? I think we should ask our speaker. Yep. Anthony. Yeah. So uh, it's a great question. Uh, so the question is, should we reopen a vein that was ligated? Uh, and uh, the, there is no real data to back this answer, but there is anecdotal evidence that if the vein is reopened and repaired within 24 hours of ligation, there is benefit. Beyond that, the risk of DVT, PE, and also rethrombosis of the repair is very high because the cascade of coagulation has already started. And the same for the IVC. So that's the question that comes up with the IVC sometimes. So it's all anecdotal evidence, but there may have been some benefit. So what, what did you do? Did you fix it? it? Yes. What would you do? I, I would uh, fix it. Okay. Yeah, yeah that didn't work. I, I thought you were going to call and tell me that you, then there was a code. And, like you went downstairs and then you heard them starting CPR in the OR, and they had lost so the patient. So that, that, that is the way it eventually ends. Yeah. The patient doesn't. It's, it's a tough. five-hour procedure. They put an AV fistula. They didn't get a fistula. Yeah. Two days later, the patient does. The, on the other hand, the patient uh, with the shooting, he did <laughs> Dr. Lawson? Uh, th thanks, Todd. I barely recognize you yeah. with face on. I'm you were here on your cap. face, so it's love. <laughs> I'll clean anyway, up um, You know, I think this conversation around venous repair is really one of these, this is a, more of a rhetorical question, but a comment, um, is an undiscovered country. We're really kind of good at doing a lot of arterial stuff and these endovascular tools, which we've got, have been wonderful. But I'm so puzzled by venous occlusion and venous thrombosis, and I reflect on some of these patients, the thoracic outlet talk, I call it thoracic inlet, and particularly with like people with high flow dialysis access, mm -hmm. 90% of them can have an occlusion of, and they don't get a swollen arm, but there's that small subset of people that do. And I don't know when to treat them. I had a dear friend who had thoracic, you know, vein occlusion, 
she got her first rib resected and lysed and became symptomatic again. And when it happened on the other side, she just blew it off mm -hmm. and has been asymptomatic. And I just reflect on the last case that I, 26 year old guy gets shot in the leg, transects his artery in his vein. I, res I ligate his vein. It's cool. I'd like it his vein because it's bleeding like hell. Um, and then I take a segment of his vein and repair his artery. I think, boy, am I really smart? I did this through one incision. And what does he do? Shows up six months later with basically a swollen leg and a venous stasis ulcer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was his biggest symptom post-op. I mean, it's just so I, I don't know when to do it, what conduit to use and, you know, and when not to. I uh, I agree. I think some of it is you know we we don't we don't know um, collaterals. You know how it, like you know I know in our wartime experience if there's a lot of penetrating injury associated with the venous um, you know trauma that we feel is taken out or injured collateral circulation. So the the great saphenous is gone. Um, aspects of other aspects of venous drainage have been compromised by the uh, significant penetrating injury you know, does that make it worse? And I think in those scenarios, if the patient is hemodynamically uh, able to have it repaired, then we sort of refer to that as a watershed repair, you know, that's a watershed segment and we repair it. But um, I agree, not everyone becomes symptomatic by any means. I, I don't know. It's a good and question. Speaking to that point, I had a recent conversation at a meeting with Dr. Komorota speaking about this three venous thoracic outlet. And his answer was, you can't make an asymptomatic patient better. Right. Well, and I think that's the value of waiting. You know, I think it even goes to the uh, pop save it score and trying to, I think you, staging some of these decisions are useful, you know. So in the Sheldon's case, you know, um, if the patients, I mean, elevate that leg, get them to a better time and see if down the road they can be repaired. And then, you know, if they're really symptomatic, a month or two later, then there, there are other options that can be, um, you know, tools in the toolbox that can be used if they become symptomatic, if they're that subset that do, but some don't, you know, um, and, uh, the same with arterial, you know, limb salvage, um, you can't often, you can't make that decision in the first operation or the first two or three days, but it declares itself later, you know. Yep. I just would like to make two comments regarding the excellent talk of Dr. Deb Stein uh, regarding the outlet injuries. First, uh, when she asked about how to decide the surgical access for proximal control, sometimes patients are too stable and we don't, uh, we need to, to decide based on injury mechanism. But sometimes you, you do have a CT that allows you to Oh, I only need proximal control. For these situations when patients are stable, now we are doing um, a upside, upside down T is partial sternotomy. Mm -hmm. So we do a transverse and then a longitudinal partial, partial sternotomy that allows access to, this, to the branches of the aortic guard. And it's very important to tell the anesthesiologist what you are going to do because sometimes they put the central line through the left. And when you need to ligate, to divide and ligate the left uh, brachiocephalic vein and you get with that catheter cut, it's not a, a beautiful <laughs> sight. So, a tip is always to get it from the right side. Thanks. Good comment, Greg. Yeah, I was just. That's great. Um, You're just picturing cutting across yeah, the yeah, anomaly. I've, I've seen it. I've seen it before too, and I'm like, oh, eight French no, resuscitation. No. Um, but uh, as was highlighted by several of the speakers earlier, I mean, venous complex venous reconstruction is complex. Mm -hmm. It is substantially more technically difficult than arterial reconstructions. And very few of us who do a lot of open vascular reconstructions are really that technically gifted at that specific skill set. You know, your uh, previous uh, uh, chief emeritus um, was well known as a, as a complex venous reconstruction guy. And I think if you don't do it all the time, you just, there's certain technical issues that come up that if you don't do it all the time, it's not forgiving <laughs> because it's a low flow, sorry, uh, high flow, 
low pressure system. And so the rate of thrombosis is going to be high if you don't do it perfectly. And, and very few of us are technically adept to do that all the time. And I mentioned delayed repair, but actually delayed repair can be more precarious because they will have developed collaterals and then you reoperate on them and you'll destroy their collaterals, right? Or you'll get into that collaterals that they're forming on their own. And that can be precarious one to three months later or longer. Yeah, Greg, I agree. But I, I would also argue that, not argue, but I would say that we don't even try, <laughs> right? So we, you talked about it in your presentation. We have a vein injury and sometimes we like it and sometimes we decide to repair it. But when we repair it, let's be honest, here intern or junior resident whip stitch this closed real quick, right? And we tolerate a degree of venous reconstruction that we would not never tolerate in our arterial reconstruction. Similarly, we have completion studies for arterial reconstruction, Doppler exam, ultrasound, angiography, that none of us do anything for our vein, right? So you highlighted the venous reconstruction rates as being better than what we historically think. But part of the reason they're not great sometimes is because we don't put effort into it, right? It's it's the annoying part of the case that you have to do. The, the lowest level trainee in the room gets to work on their suturing skills. We make saphenous vein, as I mentioned earlier, try to conform to a femoral vein or a popliteal vein. And I bet you, while I agree with Greg's points, I think if we all focused on it as a major part of the case, the outcomes may actually be a lot better as well. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I think this uh, has been a great day and uh, we still have time for a 20 minute break. We're not going to stress the time. The closing remarks are going to be very quick and brief, so we don't need 10 minutes at the end for that. But I do want to make sure that people have time to mingle with the sponsors a little bit because they have really supported a very nice meeting for us. And um, if there's anybody that still wants a banquet ticket, uh, we might still have some left. So just please see Lada uh, before the end of the day so that she can make that arrangement. When do you want to start the next session? What time? Just uh, what? It's, Rishi, uh, uh, three, four, 20 five. minutes or now? 15. Top of the hour. Let's say top yeah. of the hour. 1600. Thanks. Okay. Nice job. <laughs> It's good to meet you. Have you enjoyed the day? Good. Uh -huh. It is. 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 <laughs> and all of that really did happen. I know it's interesting. That Greg came up and talked about you know, those those primary things that not just for the needs, right? I mean, so for so it was very uh, important. Yeah. Really good. Five, six hours. I mean, this is the exact same thing. Yeah. 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 No, it wasn't easy. Right. Right. But he was steering to his own. Yeah, he was just a good Well, that's pretty case, bad. You know, what I might say is that. Six minutes. Get him on physiological side. Then it's like, those secondary things. I was rocking a hard place to shoot. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, good to meet you. We're re-trauma surgeons can actually sell it up.
Good afternoon to everybody, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. I'm honored to be here and uh, to moderate this session. I'm Dr. Anna Maria Gerardi from uh, Italy. I'm an interventional radiologist, and I'm uh, honored to moderate with uh, Dr. Yosuk Matsumara. Sorry for pronunciation <laughs> from Japan. And yes. the session is about the uh, hybrid operating room. We immediately started with the first talk with the Dr. Uh, Takahiro Kinoshita from Japan, effect and the cost effectiveness of the hybrid emergency room for severe trauma. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to the, uh, this conference. It is a great honor to uh, present my current work. And yeah, so I'm actually uh, working as AI data scientist in Philips, but none of the Philips product will appear in the presentation. So in 2011, uh, we have installed Angel CT in the trauma resuscitation room. It consists of sliding gantry CD scanner and self-propelled shear. So now we can conduct uh, CT scanning, uh, direct surgery, and then vascular treatment on the same table without any patient transfer. As the concept is based on the combination of examination and treatment in the same place, we named this room the hybrid ER. So let me share a video of pelvic ring fracture patient who are treated in this room. <laughs> And this is the result of CT, so there are no intracranial uh, hemorrhage, but we see multiple rib fractures and open book type pelvic ring fracture with a massive retroperitoneal hematoma. Thank <laughs> you. 
uh, we have reported the uh, survival benefit of this system in 2019. It was single center historical control study included severe brown trauma patient only, and we compared the outcomes. And first, uh, the time to take CT scanning was reduced from 26 minutes to 11 minutes. The time to uh, start a surgery or endovascular treatment was decreased from 68 minutes to 47 minutes. As a result, the 28-day mortality was decreased from 22% to 15%, and deaths from exsanguination became less than half. And after adjusting for potential confounders, the hybrid ER system was significantly associated with better outcomes. So the next question is the cost. I received a lot of questions related to cost, and as you expected, this is not free. And I uh, tried to uh, evaluate whether this system or health benefit from this system is worth capital investment or not. And this is a kind of simulation study, and I use Markov model, but uh, here is the, uh, like to uh, uh, explain it simply, that there's the probability of deaths in conventional ER group, it is P0, it is the kind of like raw data, uh, derived from raw data, so the patient is uh, transferred to the conventional ear, the patient survives with the probability P0 and dies with probability of one minus P0. And probability P1 can be calculated using P0 and adjusted odds ratio. So th these are the difference between the two groups. And uh, the first, second, and third year mortality was uh, extrapolated from previous literature. So now we can calculate the expected life years uh, in these two groups. For cost, we can directly calculate the cost related to the hospital admission and follow-ups. And importantly, I uh, calculate the installation cost of two million US dollar divided by number of patients who are who use this room in the amortization period and add it only to the hybrid years uh, group. So now we can compare the cost a benefit and effect benefit, uh, difference. And this is the result, the incremental cost effect ratio de defined by the incremental cost divided by health effect was 32,000 US dollar. And it was lower than willingness pay threshold in Japan and far less than the United States uh, threshold. So we concluded that hybrid ear system is cost effective technology. So in summary, hybrid ear system can shorten time to uh, CT scanning, surgery, and then vascular treatment, reduce exsanguination, and decrease 28-day mortality, and it is worth the capital investment. Thank you for your attention. Any question from the audience? Okay. Good afternoon. I, I've been following this. Dr. Kornber showed us this uh, kind of technology from uh, from Japan some number of years ago. I'm just wondering out loud. So it's very expensive to retrofit a trauma slot, a trauma room with a CT scanner and a uh, and an IR situation. But I'm just wondering. I mean, Dr. Kornber has an idea. If in the United States now we should just build them this way. Right, not try to go back and rebuild them because it's very expensive, but maybe we should just build our trauma slots now at a minimum with a CT, one of these CT scanners. What do you think, Dr. Combra? Great presentation, uh, awesome results, congratulations. Uh, I think that the last piece that we were missing was the survival piece, right? We knew about the time to CT, we knew about the time to hemostasis, and finally, you guys accumulated enough data in Osaka, uh, which is probably one of the best trauma centers in, in Asia, to show that uh, survival is great. So congratulations. <clears throat> I, I think, uh, Shell, to answer your question, <clears throat> and I've seen probably 10 of these systems yeah. in different uh, universities in Japan. Um, I don't know if we need to build them in the United States that way, if we were to build them. I don't think we will ever build them. I don't think this system works here uh, because in a bed night in your trauma center, in my trauma center, in John's trauma center, you get three or four at the same time. 
and then you need to have three or four of these <laughs> and you only have one, <clears throat> how do you decide? So in our systems, those this, this will never work because <clears throat> you don't have more than one. Yeah, occasionally, but, but then when you have four and three needed, then you have a problem. I just want a comment about it. I don't, we just built one in our center in Sweden. We use it for the emergency room on one side. So the city is not empty. This city functions a normal city from one side. Once you get a trauma, and I hope in the future, all unstable patient, you open, close the other side. So I'm not sure if the cost effective is calculated here as a normal CT that can reduce the price. But what does the trick here is not the CT because we have CTs uh, 30 seconds from our resource room. What the trick here is the, is the angio capabilities. It's the yeah, stop but, the bleeding capabilities. But also it's, it's a gentry CT. It comes to the No, patient, no, the so CT comes in and out. Yeah. So that's fine. Yeah. But if you have three mm -hmm. patients that need the resource, then you don't have it. The CT is not the issue. The issue is the vascular control and bleeding control part, which is really nice. Yeah, just uh, you step back a little bit and think of our, and, and Tom said this in one of his, in his presentation, he had a little map of ED and IR, you know, a block and a half away. And if you're designing a new hospital today, there's no way you would design the way we do it every night where you go to OR, IR, CAT scan, and they're in four different places. It's stupid, right? And plus, it's dangerous for patients. That's that, I mean, it's stupid. That's publicly obvious. And it's dangerous because transports are dangerous for these critical patients. And so everything we can do, maybe it's not this, but everything we can do to bring the providers to the patient rather than the patient to the machines, I think, is, is the step, right? And, and Raul, I know you would agree with that. How we do that in each hospital, I think, is going to be very different. If you're building a new hospital, we should do something like this, right? If you're in an old hospital, like many of us are, figure out how to decrease the steps and the miles that you take the sickest people in the world at 2 a.m. Okay, thanks. Dr. For Kino, any comment? <laughs> yeah, so it was well, much easier for me because I didn't need to like answer any questions. But anyway, so uh, so the mass casualty is a problem, of, of course, and it doesn't happen that frequent in uh, Japan, and it it uh, is a kind of usual uh, situation in the United States. But the, the important thing is that to find out the person who can benefit from the system before you accommodate patient in this room. And we tested the heterogeneity of the treatment effect across severity. And we found that this system is beneficial for the patient whose ISS is more than 25. So not for the mild, moderate patient, but for the severe patient, probably for the severest patient only. So if you have like several patients at the same time, you need to pick up the like most potentially life-threatening patient from like these uh, like trauma patient and include them in uh, that patient in this room. And this should be the kind of additional thing to the traditional normal MRC uh, department workflow. So this is my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Next presentation is uh, Haley Bat to Trauma Hybrid Oral Pathway, Start IR Process. And Dr. Laura Murat, please start the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks, Chuck, for inviting me to come give this talk. I'm going to talk about our helipad to OR and STAT IR process that we have in place in Houston. These are my disclosures. So I think uh, everyone in this room recognizes the importance of hemostasis in the management of a critically ill patient. And this was a paper that was published several years ago from our group in Houston, looking at the median time from injury to death. And uh, it's 99 minutes, which doesn't seem like that long of a time. But when you think about the amount of time we know it takes to get from the scene of injury to definitive hemostasis in the operating room. You look across all the major centers that have published data on this and it's way more than 99 minutes. So as a group, we have to figure out ways to achieve earlier hemostasis 
And it's not just driving faster to the hospital, right? It's got to be the implementation of processes of care within the institution uh, that can help improve this time to hemostasis. So one of the things we've done in Houston uh, is the hybrid OR, which we'll talk about. But other groups, it's not just a Houston thing, have looked at uh, the impact of delays in hemostasis on patient outcomes. And this was a study from over 10 years ago, but a big study looking at uh, IR times and delays. And so, again, this is not news to anyone in this room. We all know that delays in hemostasis impact mortality, but it impacts mortality significantly. So a twofold higher rate of mortality. We've also uh, shown this at our group in Houston. So when we delay that time to intervention, we really have a negative impact on uh, patient survival. Certainly the American College of Surgeons uh, Committee on Trauma has recognized that these delays are uh, barriers to improving patient care. And so one of the new requirements uh, for the ACS uh, site visits is that level one and, tra and two uh, trauma centers have to have qualified radiologists available within 30 minutes. So that 30 minute time mark, again, is really trying to push the envelope and ensure that patients are getting adequate hemostasis in a very short period of time. So we were lucky enough uh, at Herman to have a new hospital uh, built and opened uh, in early 2019. Uh, where we had a trauma hybrid OR that we designed that's dedicated for use by the trauma team. And this is a, a picture of that. And when we had this uh, room available, we were able to implement a couple of new processes that have really helped us improve our time to hemostasis and improve patient outcome. So the first process we started was uh, STAT IR using the trauma hybrid OR. We met with our radiology colleagues and came up with three agreed upon indications for a time when they would come in no questions asked, uh, and show up in that STAT uh, IR process. So the three indications we developed were Reboa in place for pelvic hemorrhage, active extravasation in a patient that was requiring a transfusion, and then if we were already in the OR and we were packed uh, typically for uh, hepatic bleeding, but it could also be for pelvic hemorrhage, then it was STAT IR. So just to roll back a little bit, our typical OR process or IR process before this happened was the resident would page the IR resident on call, the IR resident on call would review the images, the IR resident would then call their attending, la, 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 la. You can imagine that process alone could be 45 minutes before you get a definitive answer from IR saying, yes, we will come in. And then the team had to mobilize and set up the room and all these things. But with the stat IR process, the page goes out, no questions asked, the team shows up, the hospital invested in having uh, an IR uh, radiology tech in-house 24-7 to support this process. Uh, and it's made a huge difference uh, in terms of our patients. So this is just a graphic of our first 107 patients that went through uh, with this process. You can see the breakdown there of what the indications were. More than half were for pelvic hemorrhage. The rest were liver. Uh, majority of those uh, were therapeutically uh, embolized. And then you can see our survival rates of 72%, despite a very high median ISS in this group of patients of 41. And uh, most of the deaths in this group that did die were secondary to traumatic brain injury, not from non-compressible hemorrhage. The second process we were able to implement was helipad to the trauma uh, hybrid OR. We have our own air ambulance service that's operated out of the hospital. Again, we came up with a list of criteria. So patients with penetrating trauma, a positive fast, and an ongoing requirement for blood transfusion. Uh, the phone call is made from the flight crew to the trauma surgeon on call. They have our cell phone numbers. We answer and we say yes, and we activate the helipad to OR process. The picture below is what happens. We show up in the operating room and there's an anesthesia team with a cooler full of blood, and uh, it's significantly decreased our time to the OR from a median of 34 minutes down to two minutes. And then hospital arrival to surgery start time has gone down from 59 to 27 minutes with a decrease in patient mortality as well. Uh, again, I just want to say that this is Vizient data from 2021, where uh, the green bar on the 
uh, far side of the screen there. So very high volume trauma center with very low observed to expected mortality index. And I think a big part of why we've been able to make these improvements is because we're decreasing our time to hemostasis through some key processes. So again, I think we have to continue to push care into the pre-hospital setting blood products, Reboa, others will talk about those topics later. But I think the goal here should be to shorten the time to hemostasis by either having a direct to OR process with hybrid operating capability and a stat IR process to achieve those goals. And with that, I will close. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Thank you for a great presentation. I have one comment and one question. So back to the, the previous talk about the ER hybrid rooms, there is another thing that uh, you didn't mention is that the personnel that has to come down there. Narrator but, dialogue, no button, exiting narrator. That, I don't know, that was not me. So, so th that, that's something to take into the calculation that uh, for, for the IR interventions, you need to have assistance from not the ER nurses or the, or the OR nurses. You have to have another uh, person. And my question about your uh, presentation here to go back to Dr. Coimbra's question, you are a high volume center. So during a night you should have at least one or two or three patients that are in need of that hybrid room. And how, how do you manage that? Thank you. So obviously the trauma surgeon on call controls that room. And um, if we have more than one hybrid case that needs to go, it either gets delayed or it gets pushed to a second hybrid room that is not under our control. So we do have other hybrid rooms within the hospital. Uh, the other hybrid room is controlled by the neurosurgeons and the neurovascular guys. So sometimes they will let us use it if we really need it and vice versa. Sometimes there will be a very emergent non-trauma case that needs that room. And if we're not using it, you know, it's there to help take care of patients, not just trauma patients. That being said, most of the time, uh, you know, it works out okay. And we're able to share uh, that resource with other uh, services within the hospital. I have um, two sort of two separate questions. One, what's the level of uh, training or expertise on your helicopter? It must be paramedics. So we have one paramedic and one flight nurse. Okay. So, uh, and I would say they're very skilled. Sort of critical um, with, care with flight Critical paramedics. care. So most of the flight nurses are former critical care ICU nurses. Uh, they're all trained in fast examination. They transport ECMO patients. I mean, they, they're a very experienced crew. The other question is, have you ever gotten a patient on your endo table and wish the patient was on an open table? So we've had oh, yeah. scenarios where we rush a patient, we get them on the endo table, and now they, they just need a laparotomy or a thoracotomy, and a lot of the endo tables, in fact, many, if not most, of the endo tables aren't really good open tables, and we yeah. just need to get the imaging out of the way. Well, we do all of our, we, anything emergent that comes in at night, we really we use that room. So even if we don't think we're going to need endo, we still use that room. So we have it set up to to be an open operating room as well. I think with the hybrid uh, process and the helipad to OR, it is not often that this happens, but sometimes it happens that they really didn't need the OR at all, right? So part of setting that up is having the reverse be able to be true. So if the flight crew misinterpreted the FAST exam or it was really a tension pneumothorax that was causing the hypotension, not a bleeding you know, to death thing in the abdomen, we can hit pause. And you, just because you're in that room doesn't mean you have to make an incision. And so if we do the, you know, workup like we would in the ER, we say there's nothing to do here. We have the reverse process in place, which is we pull the patient off the table, we take him to the CAT scanner, and then we decide what we need to do. Fortunately, that doesn't happen very often, but... Or a great talk. You know, this concept of uh, OR resuscitation is not new. In San Diego, we started this, this uh, OR resuscitation protocol in 1996. In 2007, we studied our most lethal injuries, penetrating aortic injuries, vena cava, and hearts. And in JVS, we published our aorta data. And just by going from the field to the operating room, um, it took us 14 minutes to get our finger in the bleeding vessel. Um, 
whereas if you are in the trauma bay, as you showed, 34 minutes for us was 39, so even longer. And our survival increased by 20%. So, you know, I would encourage everyone to consider developing internal criteria for OR resuscitation because this really makes a difference in survival. A short question from my side. Uh, who perform uh, interventional uh, uh, procedures in your hospital? Surgeons or interventional radiologists? It's a combination of both. Combination. So and, but depends. they are on call? Yes. So if it's purely for embolization, um, it's the interventional radiologists that are coming in to do that. But the trauma surgeons are facilitating getting the patient up to the room. And typically, we're at least establishing the vascular access. So we're putting the sheaths up okay. while the radiologist is coming in. And then they're actually doing the physical yes. embolization. Because it should be convenient to, to think in a, a system in which interventional radiology is 24-7 uh, available. In a, in a center with high volume like yours, for example. Yeah, it's no. they're readily available and they have been wonderful collaborators in this process. Mm -hmm. We certainly couldn't do it without them. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, we move to the next uh, uh, speaker. I invite uh, Ravi uh, Rayani with the hybrid oper operating room utilization at the trauma center, be balancing uh, gunshot wounds and uh, elective cardiosurgery surgery. Good afternoon again. So I will say the only disclosure I really have is I have no idea what I'm talking about on this because if y'all can help me figure this out, I'd really appreciate it. I will, I will highlight some parts of our journey, but I think there's a lot of work to be done around this. Um, we've heard a lot about this already, right? Fixed imaging suites are clearly important for modern trauma care delivery, but they're a limited commodity. And no hospital wants to have a fancy multi-million dollar operating room sitting empty waiting for someone to get shot through their aorta or something like that. Um, elective surgical practices and acute surgical practices obviously have different priorities when it comes to what does the day-to-day -day look like, but increasingly no single hospital system can exist off of one or the other. There's got to be um, a collaborative plan that, that, that allows both types of care to be given. So what does that mean for the hybrid operating room? You know, from a trauma uh, perspective, we've heard already, it is not safe, it is not ideal to be wheeling patients around the hospital. You've seen a lot about um, the value of a single spot where somebody comes into the hospital and soup to nuts is able to have all of the um, trauma care they need. My new favorite acronym in the world is definitely THOR. Um, I, I very much appreciate that one. But predicting which of the four patients that come in at one time most benefit from that environment remains difficult, even in the best of hands. And, and honestly, I think from a trauma perspective, usually a major city gets one trauma center, right? Or at the most a few, there's probably for every one major trauma center, 10 major heart and vascular centers that can offer advanced cardiovascular care. And I don't think it's a great argument, but there is an argument for Trauma centers should probably be really, really, really focused on trauma. And I get that. But <clears throat> from a cardiovascular perspective, being able to maintain that elective volume really does maintain OR utilization in a background of having trauma requiring high-end hybrid imaging systems and so forth. And complex cardiovascular work is really good for your case mix, mix index. Additionally, we've seen this across the country if you're a trauma center of excellence, it's not like the ambulance drivers send everything else somewhere else, right? Aortic volumes increase, neurosurgical uh, uh, stroke volumes increase, PCI volumes increase, complex structural cardiac work has to become a part of what you're about because it all drives from the same system. And so, you know, everyone agrees that the hybrid operating room is the best place and an important piece of both modern trauma care and modern cardiovascular care. And so if you only have one, how do you do that, right? How do you make that work? What does that look like? And this is the part I have no idea because there are very difficult considerations sometimes around how to handle this. If it's in between cases, is there an automatic bump process? What does that set of criteria look like? If I have an elective four vessel, some complex aortic case or a T car or something that would really benefit from being in the hybrid room, is that automatically bumped to another day 
if a trauma patient comes in who would benefit from that singular room? Who decides that? Who decides who gets bumped? Who decides who does the bumping? And then just as importantly, we've touched on this, is the room even staffed to bounce between those two entities very well? Because I would say that being able to be a good nurse for a trauma case is different than being a good nurse to support TAVR or some complex structural case, just the level of understanding and how to make that work. And do you need to swap staff out? Is it the same staff that's staying there? And I, I would say that even well-meaning people can't solve these things. And so bear with me for a second. The issue is, again, like we've discussed a couple of times, we're trying to take this piece we have a hybrid room and sort of mash it into a couple of different places, whether it be trauma care or cardiovascular care, and it's not patient-centered. So what if we look a little bit more closely about what the two services would really like out of a room? To me, the ideal trauma hybrid operating room, and Dr. Rasmussen was just asking very timely questions, functions really well as an open room. It has a table in there that you can do all sorts of stuff on. That table has attachments for whatever self-retaining retractor you want that don't get in the way. It's easy to clean. <laughs> Having had like bad trauma cases go in our cardiovascular room, I think we can all appreciate that sometimes the room can be hard to clean afterwards. It's durable. There's a lot of bumping and acute stuff that's going on. It tends to move at a quicker pace. And I would say that the endovascular capabilities probably are different than what you want in your heart and vascular room. Conversely, the ideal cardiovascular room tends to focus more on the endovascular components than the open components. When our trauma surgeons use our heart and vascular room, the first thing they do is complain about the lights, right? Because the lights were an afterthought. All of the money and all of the thought process went into the imaging system, and it was less designed to be a, a useful room for open surgery, and it was designed to be a room that led complex cardiovascular endovascular work. So you have all these systems. They can be hemodynamic monitoring, fusion imaging, having a cardiopulmonary bypass machine in the corner that take up room and they take up money. And so what do we do? I hate to be the ones to tell you this, but I think you have to have multiple hybrid rooms. I think we are at the point in American healthcare where we have to drive this conversation for our patients. And we just heard from a place that does, but I would postulate that most major trauma centers do not have rooms designated for complex elective work and rooms designated for hybrid trauma care. I think that number is increasing. And we talked, uh, I think Dr. Holcomb asked about if we're gonna build these, let's build them like this from now on. But we have to be the proponents of telling our hospital administrators, sorry, this is why you need another room. And so they, the two teams definitely need different environments for care. And we have to recognize that even in a trauma center, quote unquote, a healthy cardiovascular service line, is really important. It, it drives the mission of the patients that are coming through the doors. It helps the hospital with financial, um, by increasing case maintenance and elective case volume. And we have to figure this out. So what do we have? Our Heart and Vascular Center does about 800 operations per year. It's complex aorta, it's TCAR, it's complex limb cell, it's just all the stuff you'd think, but it's got a lot of cardiopulmonary support like we heard about this morning that benefits from here. It's an epicardial lead um, extraction. It's complex hybrid PCI and we're working on our center of excellence accreditation. We have one hybrid operating room that we use for heart and vascular services. Our overflow is the cath lab. Compare and contrast that with our, our Marcus Trauma Center. It's the only level one in the area. We are now up to 11,000 activations per year. That 1,000 operations per year I made up and should probably be ignored. And when we do endovascular hemorrhage control, right now it's one of two places. It's in the IR suite, which great people, great technique, great technical ability, but isn't the best place to resuscitate someone, or it's in the operating room with a mobile C-arm, which means you're sacrificing something in terms of resolution and all the other wonderful stuff we heard about. So we're gonna have to build another trauma, a trauma hybrid room. That's the only way this is gonna work because I think if you try to squeeze the square peg into the round hole, it just doesn't work out for anyone. And I think those service lines have now established that hybrid operating rooms are the standard of care in the modern era. And now we, we have to support it as providers to push on our administration to really see the value of multiple hybrid rooms within a, sim, a single system. Thanks, happy to take any questions. Question Everybody from the audience? Yes. 
the other thing we found um, useful is emergency, I referenced this earlier, uh, emergency vascular mm -hmm. cases. So lytic cases that come in. So as far as, you know, we are fortunate to have a few of these hybrid rooms, but we keep them, we're consciously keeping them full throughout the day without not the elective EVARs or the PMAGs or the complex endo. We usually have a endo room that is for emergency, either emergency vascular um, or for trauma. And I think that helps. There's ways to keep it, um, mm -hmm. to strike the balance. Uh, we will do fasciotomy washout in there, you know, sure. for, because that'll take a half hour, 45 minutes, but you got to, you keep the room full. You couldn't do that if you have one hybrid room. So I think that uh, to the degree you can, I think having, uh, having multiple, and I think you can make that argument and you can keep them busy. You can keep them full. Yeah. Um, is my observation. And then I think making them functional, the, the table, you know, when you get a patient in there in the hybrid room who needs an open, you, you sort of mm -hmm. realize they actually need, they need an Omni or they need, you know, they need the, uh, an open, maybe they need a Thorcot. It's the tables, Chuck and I were just talking, you know, the endo tables uh, and setup are just still not ideal for open cases, lights, as you referenced. So I think trying to talk to, um, you know, when you're putting in a hybrid room, try as best you can to truly make it hybrid so that open cases can also be done there. Yeah. Thanks. We have done a fasciotomy washout in our one hybrid room. So yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah, thanks for, for, for the excellent lecture. Uh, actually, I would like, like to add an extra comment on it because in Europe, uh, for, for the polytrauma patient, actually orthopedics are also directly involved. And the choice of the table, actually what Todd says, because you know the floating table is for hybrid, especially for endo, is most optimal. But if you switch to open surgery involving bones, yeah. uh, the floating table is not optimal, especially when there's omnitract on the table for car carbon. So I would like to add also, if you treat a polytrauma patient, it's not only trauma, yeah. that means endo and, and open, but the bones are apart and then you need a sta stable table that, that you can also move the legs. So that I'm embarrassed to say this cover. in the rare cases that trauma cases do go in the hybrid operating room and orthos involved, they, they want the mobile C arm brought in. Yeah. Yeah. But as a vascular surgeon, I also say, because I treat the whole patient, if it's a normal table, like yeah. a, it's an orthopedic table, I don't like it because I miss all the imaging because all the metal is on the table. That's right. Thank you. Hey, great. Yeah. Great talk as usual. I, I, um, I think we often talk about hybrid rooms, like it's a, like there's one hybrid room and, and you know, you can do anything in that hybrid room. And the reality is they're, you know, it's just like anything else in life. They're so different, right? Not every hybrid room is the same. We have, for example, a hybrid room that is specifically built for complex aortic surgery and doing peripheral cases in that room is endo peripheral cases, super, super painful. It's just not designed for that. The way the positioning of the table is, you know, the, the way the, you know, the whole room setup is basically. So, you know, but on the on the other point, you know the the table like was mentioned is really everything when it comes to doing both open and endo. So we specifically designed a table or had a table for this room where we can do all, all the complex open surgery too. So we do a lot of open aneurysms and open abdominal vascular cases in that same exact room, no problem. Carotids, T cars, etc. But um, but you know you may need a second if you're going to get a second room. You may want that second room to be slightly different or designed in a way that it's slightly optimal for something else, right? So that's maybe slightly optimal, more optimal for lower extremity or slightly more optimal for trauma so that you can have a combination of those two different things. So maybe you don't get everything you want in one room. You're never going to get it actually, right? Yeah. So, and the other thing I think is that the design is so critical because you'll find that there's some hybrid rooms or you cannot get the lights. There's there's three lights, but you cannot possibly move them. It's impossible to move them to actually see the patient at the same time you have the imaging there. Um, and you're like, how did this room exist? Who designed it? Um, but going to places where they actually have a, a hybrid room that works really well, yep. and you know, looking at them, talking to the engineers who built it, actually makes a huge difference in the planning of a new room. So we, you know, I recommend anybody go out and visit some centers that have good ones. And then, you know, learn about what, what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Be involved. You know, if your place is building a new hybrid room, be involved as the provider. There is weird stuff that will happen if you're not. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Chuck Fox and hybrid ORs. Should hospitals invest in fixed facilities versus purchasing mobile equipment? Okay, so uh, we'll shift in a little bit about uh, you know investment. And really, it's what Greg said. We have to define what we mean by hybrid rooms. So it could be fixed or portable, but really it has to have highly trained operation operating room staff and an inventory of endovascular supplies that allow us to do the job. And the reality is only about a third of all US hospitals actually have a hybrid room. So someone finally said this was a bad idea to go five blocks away with a patient in the middle of the night, but the administrators are really gonna want data. And so data basically showed in this study that a hybrid room may actually improve outcome. But the transition has not been easy. We still have to operate in a main operating room and still offer endovascular interventions. And so we've learned to work on the left side of the patient, We've learned to recognize where the pedestal is going to be so we can move our portable C-arm. We've learned to tuck the arm so that we can image from top to bottom, and it has not been easy. So the challenges in the operating room still continue. There are a lot of communication delays. There's unfamiliar operating room staff. Some people leave to get supplies. There's a limited field of view. And all these are the challenges of not actually having a hybrid room, but you've got to have something to get started to prove to administration that you've got some kind of asset that's useful. So hybrid rooms obviously bring resources to the patients and some of us are fortunate enough to have a room and as we've already heard from the prior talks, they don't solve all of the problems. But you can show administrators that by having an endovascular trauma team or that you will have people that are on your backup call roster that will can't come in at all times of the day to do these interventions will help drive the revenue and convince them that there's some return on the investment uh, because a, op uh, a hybrid operating room is going to be a several million dollar investment over the portable things. So we can speak to what our advantages are, which are obvious, but the administrators will be less likely to find that appealing. But the surgeon can control pedals. We can do fusion imaging. We can control the gantry. We can control the table. So obviously advantages to us that allow us to do the procedure quickly and safely. But there's also technical advantages to having a nice room uh, for the patient. These rooms typically are 700 to 1,000 square feet. The table uh, does a lot of different features and you don't have to communicate that to anesthesia. You control the table movements. Also, we've learned to do transradial approach, which reduces our access site complications. We can do cone beam imaging in our hybrid room and the 3D rotational angiography really allows us to do much more sophisticated things electively. But you still have to design your room to the mission. This is a room in Afghanistan. It's a tented facility. It's obviously small space. You've got to have mobile equipment to do the job depending on what your mission is and where you are. And this is one of the uh, deployable medical systems. And there may not be enough rooms just for a dedicated space. So you've got to have some portable equipment and mobility is a necessity. Sometimes we are going to be called to the room to help another colleague who's already done a dissection and cannot find an injury like this carotid injury that was down in zone one, and you're going to need to pull a C-arm in and use some of that equipment. So you can't always depend on just doing everything in a hybrid room. A mobile equipment list is important to have. Uh, Stacy Plotkin had written a nice paper with Greg and I and Todd uh, about an endovascular toolkit. And it's a great illustration of some basic things that you can just have available if your institution is just starting up and you just wanna have a mobile list. So you can have a carbon table, a portable monitor, a power injector, a small laptop ultrasound, and an IVIS machine. Consign your inventory and you're looking at a four to $700,000 investment. And that's gonna be much more appealing to administration over a several million dollar investment. You can also convince them that this is helpful because it's patient centric. It reduces length of stay. You can do minimally invasive surgery and there'd be marketing advantages to that. And you can recruit talent when you can do more things. Um, there is a big capital expense with the hybrid room. So that's gonna be a pitfall. There is duplication of resources because you can't always go to IR. 
you may be able to put the patient in the hybrid room, but you still have a long walk if you've got to go to cardiology or radiology to get the things you need. And then there can be management of workflow, staffing, and billing. For example, if your cardiology section is supplying the supplies, but the OR is billing for the procedure, then the administration is going to have a nightmare on how to recoup that return on investment. But you can tell them that um, the capital uh, uh, return is approximately 5.6%. This was a study that looked at the number of hybrid rooms in the US and what that market uh, is bringing in in terms of revenue. And it can be a lot of money and you can show them all the potential services that could use a room. We only have uh, one single room at the capital region, um, but we are using um, other services to share the room so that it doesn't just stay idle waiting for a vascular trauma. This is a market share by specialty and still cardiovascular has the biggest market share, but the, you can do fluoroscopic uh, lung biopsies, you can do spine surgery, neurosurgeons can use it for brain imaging. So there's a lot of different services. And then in terms of a vascular service line, you can just show them practically 70 to 80% of what we do now involves endovascular interventions. This is the construction at the cap region. We can do fusion overlay and CT scans are very helpful and then do uh, 4D imaging or at least a 3D rotational angiogram in a hybrid room. And you have to remember that you cannot do a lot of these things with portable equipment. So it really depends on what your institution wants to do uh, with their investment. So I'm about out of time here, but I will say if you are planning to do selective in embolizations and get into very tortuous uh, vessel beds that you really need to consider, you know, how much radiation, how much contrast, and how much struggle you're willing to put up with if you decide to go the way of a portable or a mobile system. And uh, it is possible to do these thoracic repairs with the C-arm, but they're um, in modern day uh, imaging, it's so much easier to do it in a hybrid room. So it, in summary, the portable equipment is useful but you have to customize it around your needs and goals. There are pitfalls to implementing this, and the best way to proceed is to develop a good business plan, recognizing that mobility is cheap but has limitations. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the audience? So I have the question. So oh, now the shock trauma has a hybrid or but sometimes uh, the, the trauma patient is overlapped with the cardiovascular surgery case, right? So if, if the elective case is overlapped with the emergency case, um, do you still use the, the mobile C-arm? Yeah, sure, we can use the mobile C-arm. Uh, we do have two hybrid rooms now, so uh, it's unlikely that both of them uh, would be unavailable. And usually one room is uh, just on reserve for trauma cases. Um, so we don't usually have that issue. Okay, okay. an observation for my side, only an observation because I think I completely agree that uh, portable CR may be a backup uh, machine when the hybrid room, for example, is not available, but it's not a solution. When you have a hybrid room for trauma pa patients, you have to use uh, hybrid room because uh, the, the facilities are completely different and uh, you can do uh, everything. Uh, all that you, you showed is, uh, is a true fusion imaging, combi MCT, uh, embo, embo navigation, uh, everything. And uh, it, all these things are impossible to do with the portable CM, are only the backup machine in my opinion. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I got the question in that, but it's a no, good no, it's, it's a comment. It's comment, a good but, point yeah. the, that you're making that you have to know your limitations and then yeah. proceed carefully into the right room. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I think that we are uh, the time is over, so we can uh, conclude the session and then we can move to the next session. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, it's the last session started.
realizing that we're standing between you and drinks. All right, our first talk uh, this afternoon is going to be by Dr. Graham Nickel, catheter based super saturated oxygen therapy. I thank the organizers for inviting me to share our ongoing work related to catheter-based supersaturated oxygen therapy. This work is being performed by my collaborators, David Salcedo and Jim Menegazzi at the Applied Physiology Laboratory at the University of Pittsburgh and myself. My disclosures are as follows. In particular, I note that this work is supported by Soul Circulation from San Jose, California. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO both improves hemodynamics and oxygenation and has been shown to be highly efficacious in refractory cardiac arrest in a single center randomized trial by Yiannopoulos and colleagues in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where patients who had refractory cardiac arrest were randomized to ECMO or standard care, and the ECMO group has significantly greater survival. Similarly, Reboa improves hemodynamics and is associated with good outcomes in patients with hemorrhagic shock without penetrating chest injury. Greater coronary perfusion pressure is associated with a greater likelihood of resuscitation after cardiac arrest in humans. So it seems plausible that a balloon-based therapy may be beneficial in patients with refractory cardiac arrest. A balloon tip catheter placed in the proximal aorta during ongoing cardiac arrest has been evaluated in at least nine studies in porcine models of non-traumatic cardiac arrest and shown to have improved coronary perfusion pressure and improved short-term outcomes. And at limited case reports in humans, a balloon in the proximal aorta improved coronary perfusion pressure and was associated with discharge alive without neurologic deficit. What about oxygenation? Well, supersaturated oxygen therapy consists of highly pressurized oxygen driven into solution so that it can be given with intravenous fluid via a purpose-built sheath and delivery catheter to a hypoxic heart and then recirculated in the patient's blood back to the console for reoxygenation. This has been shown to decrease microvascular dysfunction in porcine models of ST elevation myocardial infarction. And supersaturated oxygen significantly reduced infarct size in patients with STEMI. This figure shows the median infarct size with in blue versus without in orange in patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction. The Bayesian posterior probability of superiority was 97%. SSO achieved a 6.5% absolute infarct size reduction. This compares favorably to the minimum clinically important difference of a 5% absolute change in infarct size, which was established by trials of stentine versus fibrolytic therapy. So we initiated a feasibility study of balloon in the order with SSO, BASO, which in essence is Reboa and SSO in a pig model of refractory non-traumatic cardiac arrest. The animals were sedated and instrumented. VF was induced by a single transthoracic shock. This was untreated for five minutes. Standard ACLS was performed to achieve restoration of circulation and VF was reinduced 30 seconds after restoration of circulation and standard ACLS was repeated. This figure shows interim results from our work. BASO appears to maintain coronary perfusion pressure versus control throughout the resuscitation period. As well, BASO appears to coarsen up VF versus control theoretically making it easier to concern, convert out of ventricular fibrillation. But then the COVID pandemic hit, which has interrupted our work. So we are continuing to enroll animals to evaluate the feasibility of BASO in refractory cardiac arrest. So in summary, multiple methods are available to improve blood flow and oxygenation. Use of a balloon tip catheter and SSO 
in refractory cardiac arrest is technically difficult, but feasible and potentially efficacious. Device modification is necessary to increase ease of use, and this needs prospective validation in animal models before translation to humans. I regret that I am not able to be present to answer any questions that you might have, but I am available via email to discuss this novel therapy further. For the sake of time, we'll go ahead and move forward with the uh, next talk, Clinical Data Strategies and Reporting of New Vascular Innovations, Dr. Rasmussen. Great, thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to uh, present uh, my experience with two technologies that I hope will uh, serve as case studies uh, for us. I think aspects of these two technologies that I've worked with over the last uh, 10 years, had the privilege of working with over the last 10 years, I think aspects of this experience apply to, to data gathering uh, for many of the innovations that we've discussed and some of the innovations that uh, have yet to come from this group. <clears throat> These are my disclosures. Um, I do independent consulting for some of the groups. Um, I have patents in this area, and I receive publishing uh, royalties uh, from those publishers related to educational material. So as this group knows, and I think was probably in some ways a, f a founding uh, aspect of EVTM uh, altogether, the, the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars resulted in a ton of medical innovation and product development and especially in the vascular and resuscitation space. One of the innovations that was needed uh, that came from data during the wars was innovation needed to control hemorrhage, hemorrhagic shock from non-compressible torso, hem non -compressible torso hemorrhage. Um, there was another innovation that really was called for uh, from the data from this, uh, from this wartime experience, and that was an innovation to advance vascular injury repair and improve limb salvage, so restore perfusion to limbs uh, with arterial injuries primarily. Um, and in this instance, it will be a new vascular conduit that I'll talk about. Um, this is data that I think some of this has been presented uh, or is known by this audience. Uh, roughly one in, uh, you know, one in four KIAs during the wars, U.S. In, uh, service members who died in action died from potentially preventable causes. 90% uh, of those were from non-compressible torso hemorrhage and shock. And as been, has been discussed uh, today earlier, the Harvard uh, paper said that there's really a similar imperative in the civilian trauma centers where uh, as up to 40 to 50% of patients presenting with hemoperitoneum and shock to civilian trauma centers die. Um, so in this instance, the innovation that we'll talk about and clinical data strategies and uh, is, is Reboa, resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. And the second set of data that I refer to, and I'm not sure if this audience understands this, some I think do, but compared to the World War II dictum of arterial ligation and amputation, uh, uh, life over limb, uh, there was no real ability to, uh, to, to repair arterial injury in World War II, the current tenants of tactical combat casualty care, medevac, forward surgical assets make vascular repair common in modern wartime settings. So we now have the opportunities to save both life and limb. And in this context, I want to talk about a new biologic conduit that is being studied for trauma, which is the human acellular vessel. So the first Reboa device, as this group knows, and we've talked today, uh, was, was approved via 510K pathway in 2015. The urgencies of the wars, and really prompted by the DOD, uh, resulted in a 510K path. This was efficient. It was an expedited um, access to the product and the in innovation. But ultimately, this pathway to, to uh, FDA approval and clinical access failed to produce the kind of clinical data and clinical training that accompanies a typical ID IDE product, like a new stent graft or a new balloon that comes out into our endovascular practice. If it's approved by 510K, this data did not accompany uh, the, the, the initial approval of this, and it, it's relevant to what I'm going to talk about in the subsequent slides. User feedback was pretty swift. It informed the need for tighter aortic control, uh, iteration of this device, and partial Reboa uh, to extend occlusion times and to mitigate uh, distal ischemia uh, beyond the balloon. 
uh, and tighter aortic control uh, for, for that, uh, that approach. So fast forward really a brief three or four years, uh, the uh, partial Reboa catheter was, uh, was developed uh, intentionally uh, for, partial Revo uh, for partial aortic occlusion. Uh, this was a versatile catheter that was approved uh, in coordination with the FDA, the DOD uh, in 2020, so a relatively short time period. Uh, this was also approved by a 510K pathway. In this instance, this uh, balloon was engineered on the chassis of the original ER Reboa. It's got the same P-tip, and it's importantly has an integrated nitinol tube, which is really the wire within the catheter, em eliminating the need to deploy this device over a traditional 035 wire, but still providing the needed rigidity and support for afterload, um, uh, to resist afterload when the balloon is inflated. It also has a safety pop-off valve that releases at 0.5 atmospheres to prevent overinflation uh, when used without x-ray. Um, Hassan Alam, before he went to Northwestern, he and his group uh, at the University of Michigan did a fair amount of preclinical testing uh, and generating preclinical data on the P-Reboa Pro, uh, demonstrating or confirming that its semi-compliant balloon uh, was useful for, for controlled uh, partial occlusion of the aorta. Um, it also has an arterial lumen to assess above and below balloon pressures uh, and to leave a, leave, uh, a, a wire behind for uh, endovascular procedures if so desired. Uh, importantly, uh, Hassan um, showed, he and his group showed that the device extended well beyond the 30 minute barrier. So the new approach to attaining clinical data, this also was approved by a 510K pathway. So how now to establish uh, clinical data with this, um, with this new device and in this new approach, a structured, um, a structured release of this product, initially limited to a number, a select number of centers in the U.S. and Canada, uh, has been undertaken. This is really similar to the study of other endovascular devices that we see in our practice, a new stent graft, for example, that comes out. I refer to this uh, as an IDE-like approach. Um, if, if one of our industry partners releases a new stent graft, uh, it typically goes through an IDE study, it's released and, and, and trained at a select number of centers until data can be generated and it be released on a, a wider scale. So the Centers of Excellence program for the P-Reboa Pro has been initiated at, at the, uh, the centers shown on this map. Um, it allows for simultaneous clinical support, so the device isn't just released into the wild. Uh, the device is released like other endo or an IDE type approach. It's, it comes with training, data gathering, performance improvement for the early phases of clinical use and adoption. And to date, uh, there's been approximately 250 P Reboa Pro uses across the initial seven centers with the intent to expand the centers of excellence approach to gain this clinical data in the coming year or two. This slide shows just is an example of some of the user data and clinical data that can be gleaned uh, from these uses. And in this uh, set of data, which is just a summary, um, this is the percentage of, of, of reported benefit for these different occlusion times. And one can see that the real benefit of this catheter is for prolonged occlusion, uh, benefits of occlusion times of 60 minutes or 90 minutes. And I believe some of this data will be presented in much more detail than we have time for maybe tomorrow or certainly uh, as this data is curated by the Centers of Excellence program. <clears throat> the, second, uh, the, the second technology that I think I'd like, or that I would like to uh, present is the human acellular uh, uh, vessel. Um, unlike the, the Reboa catheter, which, which is regulated as a device through CDRH in the FDA, the HAV is regulated as a biologic uh, through the Center for Biologics Evaluation and research or CBER. It's not a device, although you take it out of a box and you sew it in. Uh, it looks all, to everybody in this room, it looks like a device, but to the FDA, it's regulated as a biologic. Uh, because it's not been FDA approved, uh, the HAV is under regulatory study using traditional phase two and three INDs. It's not issued an IDE, it's an investigational new drug. Uh, and through the FDA's EAP or expanded access program, AKA its compassionate use program. This is another way to generate clinical data, uh, in this case, for a not yet approved biologic. The HAV is a vascular smooth muscle uh, it, um, 
it, the HAV is created from banked human vascularly smooth muscle cells that are seated on a biodegradable lattice. Um, they're grown or pors, uh, pulsed in a uh, organ chamber, basically a bioreactor for six to eight weeks. They form collagen, elastin, and extracellular matrix while the matrix stent dissolves and one is left with a, an acellular vessel uh, that can be used as a vascular conduit. Um, is its final stage, the cellular components of the HAV are, are washed. It's made basically biologically quiet, so it does not stimulate an immune response when it's, when it's implanted. Our experience with this has been through the FDA's expanded access program. So initially we had five implants at the Mayo Clinic during calendar year 2001, 2021 using single use INDs uh, under expanded access provisions. We've worked with Mayo's Office of Research Regulatory Support, uh, the IRB and Humicite uh, and the FDA really to get an IND that's allowed us to conduct a 20 patient cohort uh, for clinical study. Uh, we are assessing safety and e efficacy of this in this cohort uh, using this uh, conduit as a bypass in patients with limb-threatening ischemia, not trauma, but severe PAD and limb threat. Uh, we've enrolled 18 of the 20 patients and have recently requested uh, from the FDA to expand our experience to 50. This is a, uh, a, an example of a case that we did. I'll show this. This is a 60-year-old male who 40 years ago was shot in the left groin uh, and his femoral artery is out. Um, and after 40 years of trying to maintain patency of his iliofemoral segment, those all attempts all failed. So he has no, he's got an ischemic left leg. And in this case, we use Dacron from the external iliac to the left deep femoral artery and then HAV, the human acellular vessel from the deep femoral artery to the above knee popliteal artery. This shows an eight inguinal Dacron from the left common iliac under the inguinal ligament. This shows the HAV sewn to the Dacron uh, and then to the above knee popliteal artery as a bypass conduit, um, as, as an example of one of the cases with the human acellular vessel. This is uh, the last slide. We have just limited data now that's coming out. We have, with this uh, IND study, we have 100% patient capture. It's not like the, the trauma population where we struggle to get these patients back. The PAD population, uh, especially at Mayo Clinic, we can capture them. We have 100% patient capture. And with follow-up and outcomes uh, with the HAV as a conduit, uh, we have um, basically um, a median follow-up of one year. And several of these bypass graphs are out now three years. And you can see that we have a 12 months primary patency of 72% and, and secondary patency of 81%. I can't present all of this data now because it's been submitted for publication, but as an example of real world data, clinical data that can be attained on a product, in this case through the FDA's expanded access program, that can eventually be considered uh, for regulatory deliberations. So although it's not yet approved, the HAVs uh, to me is the most promising vascular conduit reconstructive material since PTFE in 1972 or three. Um, it just needs tested and studied. Uh, this preliminary clinical experience using uh, real world data in the PAD population, um, initially at least, uh, shows safety and, and efficacy. And, and we hope to expand this experience from 20 to 50 patients uh, working with the FDA and our industry scientists and partners. So in summary, each medical innovation that you've heard about or will hear about is unique in pursuing and attaining regulatory approval and necessary clinical data. Uh, each, each one's its own case study. No two are the same. Uh, they need this clinical data prom to promote design improvement of the devices, to feed back to make better devices, and eventually to fuel adoption and to create them as standards. Uh, the limited or intentional release of some of these new products, whether it's through the Centers of Excellence type program, an IDE or IND study, is really important to ensure safe and effective introduction of these new products uh, as they emerge uh, from, from our innovation labs. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the, uh, the topic. I look forward to questions if there are any. Any questions from the audience? Uh, how expensive is this stuff going to be? And the process that you described of those preparations sounds pretty intense. So the, um, you know, I think the clinical studies, it's really important because people scream for level one data and we do want data. We need to be driven by uh, evidence for sure. But the fact of the matter is whether it's conducting a phase two or three clinical trial, uh, an RCT, you know, where, who's going to fund it? 
it's the easiest thing in the world to claim you want level one data, but there really isn't a federal funding source for a lot of this. So, so I think using these pragmatic approaches uh, to, to get registry-based data, a centers of excellence type program, a clinical series through the FDA's IND or IDE studies are really important because they're, I mean, at the least they're hundreds of thousands and often, you know, millions of dollars and tens of millions. In yeah, to, to get a product, to get this clinical data from a product, you know. And I think that's, we as clinicians overlook that. We we just sort of want data and that's sort of the, but, but as you know, um, uh, getting that sort of data takes a federal investment or it takes private investment uh, from an industry partner to fund it. And uh, it's all can be done, but it's not to be overlooked or minimized. So uh, Todd, I want to congratulate you just on a really thoughtful presentation first. It's just great to, and I think you highlighted the challenge for this community, which is trying to do clinical research and develop quality data in a really complicated patient population. And I think you, there's two examples here. Rabo is a great example of, you know, that, but the HAV is another example of how do you, and, and as far as the cost goes, it's, it's expensive, trust me. Um, we're, we're over, we've raised over half a billion dollars to make this thing, and it's still not clinically approved. Um, that's a lot of money of investment. And some of it's government funded, non what we say non-dilutional funding. But then you got to bring in the private sector and they have to invest in it too. And they have to believe that making a Tesla is going to be more valuable than making, you know, a GM, whatever thing, because it's a lot more expensive. And that's just the cost of innovation. Yep, that's right. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Super excited for our next talk to be given by Dr. Tim Timothy Williams on endovascular support for critical care. Uh, thanks, Chuck, for the uh, invitation and uh, the opportunity to present our work. I'm uh, Tim Williams from Wake Forest. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our um, concepts around uh, our use of endovascular therapy for critical care and some of our data. These are my disclosures. I'm a co-founder of CERTUS, and uh, the data I'm going to present is funded by a DOD award. So beyond addressing the underlying pathophysiology resulting in the shock state, much of shock treatment centers around the management of hemodynamics, typically involving vasopressor and volume administration. We've been exploring the use of a balloon catheter in a novel fashion for the management of distributive and hypovolemic shock. We've termed this approach endovascular perfusion augmentation for critical care or EPAC. EPAC provides mechanical hemodynamic support to augment central aortic pressure. This modality is intended to optimize proximal hemodynamics and provide for a more balanced resuscitation by reducing the need for high dose vasopressors or large volume fluid administration. EPAC involves low levels of balloon inflation well below what would be needed for uh, hemorrhage control purposes. It's inherently dynamic, so it requires the use of automation utilizing proximal and distal pressure inputs upstream and downstream. One of the key concepts uh, around EPAC uh, involves the, the working range or what we call the balloon dose, if you will. This is done by establishing boundaries on the balloon inflation range based on hemodynamics. The x-axis shown here uh, demonstrates declining hemodynamics over time. Inside the working range, the balloon remains dynamic, inflating and deflating to maintain stable proximal hemodynamics. In contrast, distal pressure and flow change dynamically over this range. Once a prescribed maximum boundary has been reached, no further balloon inflation will occur in the face of worsening hemodynamics, resulting in a decline in both proximal and distal pressures. This graphic depicts the range of possible balloon doses. A low dose can only maintain a stable proximal pressure over a narrow range of physiologies, minimizing downstream ischemia attributable to the balloon itself. Conversely, a high dose of balloon support can maintain a stable proximal pressure over a wider range of hemodynamics but inherently incurs more downstream ischemia. 
so most of a, a central uh, theme with our work has been trying to identify the ideal dose for that therapy. Uh, one of the other things that we've been focusing on is trying to identify what the ideal duration for that therapy may be. And, and finally, how to coordinate the automated co-administration of fluids and vasopressors in conjunction with this to optimize the physiologic benefits of the therapy. We've explored this in a variety of studies. I'll talk to you about one involving um, uh, controlled hemorrhage in 30 minutes of aortic occlusion. So three groups are depicted here, EPAC at a high dose and low dose in conjunction with automated critical care interventions, as well as um, automated fluids and drugs alone. EPAC maintained goal proximal pressure over 97% of the time during the critical care period. But ultimately the critical care platform in and of itself is pretty good at maintaining stable proximal hemodynamics at 82% at of the time. But EPAC is able to achieve this with reduced vasopressor requirements and a strong trend towards lower fluid administration compared to no balloon. Shown here is the aortic and renal flow over time. EPAC reduces the hyperemia seen in the early reperfusion period, which normalizes in, in all groups over time. However, the cumulative renal blood flow is markedly higher in the low dose EPAC group shown here compared to the high dose EPAC or critical care alone. This suggests that low levels of balloon support actually augment renal perfusion, likely through lower reliance on vasopressors. EPAC high dose had significantly lower urine output than the low, than the low dose, uh, but the difference between EPAC low dose, uh, or differences, uh, but there's no differences between EPAC low dose and critical care alone. And at the end of the study, there were no differences in serum lactate or creatinine levels. So in summary, EPAC shows promise as a critical care adjunct by favorably balancing the ratio of fluids and vasopressors when used in low doses, but may be detrimental if applied in excess. Also, low-dose EPAC appears to augment renal perfusion, presumably through a reduction in vasopressor utilization. Follow-on work has also indicated that even short durations of this therapy lead to the same durable effect on renal perfusion over time. We hypothesize that blunting the early hyperemia following aortic occlusion, EPAC may mitigate reperfusion injury, endotheliopathy, and mitochondrial dysfunction. And we've got ongoing metabolic work to investigate that. We're also going to investigate uh, this therapy in a 24-hour study to understand if the um, Observations that I've discussed here today remain durable over time. And with that, I will take questions. Um, this may have run by me quickly. Uh, so where, where does the balloon sit? What kind of balloon is it? And if it's sitting there for a long period of time, does the patient require long-term anticoagulation? Uh, great question. So this is a zone one deployment of a balloon catheter. Um, certainly, uh, in, in the wake of a traumatic injury, anticoagulation may not be uh, appropriate, but if this is used in the context of a critically ill patient for sepsis or ischemic stroke, uh, anticoagulation would be appropriate for sure. And what kind of balloon? Um, this is just a lab grade balloon catheter, but really the, the key to uh, performing this type of intervention, uh, intervention doesn't really center around, around a particular balloon architecture as much as it does the automation that's involved in kind of dynamically modulating it. So, um, you know, balloon occlusion of the order makes sense to me in the setting of um, a immediately reversible situation like hemorrhage. Uh, how, I guess I'm unclear, maybe you can explain how this is going to work in a prolonged period where it takes a fairly long time for sepsis um, vasoplegia to resolve and you can't necessarily leave the balloon in for a long, prolonged period of time. Or is it kind of like a, a balloon pump to sort of offload pressure in the heart? Yeah, no, um, so not exactly like a balloon pump in that it does not provide afterload support. It's really just a mechanical resistor in the aorta. And I think what we're observing is that um, 
probably the benefit of the of the balloon itself is <laughs> is during periods of significant hemodynamic decompensation. So early treatment of sepsis, not necessarily for prolonged use. Um, certainly we've seen in a follow-on study, and I didn't present that data right now, but um, we see a, a durable effect on lower vasopressor requirements and augmented distal perfusion with um, only about an hour's worth of use of the balloon. And so there may be something about um, the balloon's ability to blunt the um, reperfusion injury that takes place in the wake of an aortic occlusion event or a profound sepsis until you can get source control. So it's not exactly clear what the mechanism is or where the sweet spot for this therapy is, but I would just point out that, you know, this is all, this is a composite therapy. It's not really just about the balloon. It's also about dovetailing in the automated critical care uh, interventions as well. So um, what I don't have time to go into right now, but we've got an automated platform that will co-administer multitude of pharmacologic agents and blood and, and fluids um, that, that continuously optimize the patient's physiology. Apparently something really good just happened outside. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do have a question. You actually answered half of it in talking about uh, at least organ function with, with creatinine lactate levels, but just from a cardiac perspective, any evidence? Uh, have you all clicked troponin or looked at echocardiographic evidence? Of, of cardiac yeah, we have looked at troponins. We haven't really seen, in, in this particular study, haven't seen um, a significant difference in troponin levels across the groups. We had done this before, and we actually did see some elevated troponin levels presumably due to after uh, significant afterload with a, a higher degree of balloon support. Um, so, it, I mean, it remains to be seen if, you know, if this has uh, application in disease states like sepsis, but, um, you know, we do envision, um, you know, this being uh, relevant in, you know, post-Reboa reperfusion as well as polytrauma patients who, who have, uh, you know, a TBI where you want to maintain very stable proximal hemodynamics. Drugs and, and fluids take a while to work, right? But this, you know, some of that data I showed, this balloon is very effective at, you know, pegging a blood pressure and keeping it, you know, within your goal hemodynamic range um, consistently. So. Oh, well, sorry, Todd. No, just, I, I, just a quick question. This is more of, a, again, a philosophical thing. You know, the kidneys and the brain are really the two biosensors. Right. that when they're ischemic, they, they scream to the rest of the body and they drive your blood pressure. I mean, that's what renal vascular hypertension is, right? So when the kidney's temporarily ischemic and or temporarily reperfused, how do you think that impacts the biology of the blood pressure that the body's trying to maintain? Yeah, I mean, the, we've always been particularly focused on um, renal function because obviously that's one of the most... Um, susceptible um, organs to ischemia. And so inherently the, the fear of, you know, using a balloon for hemodynamic support is that you're going to cause a detrimental decrement in your renal perfusion. But um, the interesting thing that we've seen in this work is that despite having, you know, consistent aortic flow values across all the groups, having a little bit of balloon resistance is augmenting renal perfusion, oddly enough. And you know, the kidney can auto-regulate within a range of hemodynamics. And so just a very low level of balloon support by presumably by decreasing your reliance on vasopressors can inherently lead to an augmented renal perfusion. So we're still trying to work out the mechanisms of that physiology, but um, I mean, it's, a, it's been a fascinating takeaway from some of this work. Or is the sweet spot a zone three deployment, you know, potentially? below the kidneys, That's where you could point. still aug augment, you know, um, proximal perfusion, including to the to the renal vasculature. Have you used it in a SERS model, uh, a model of sepsis yet? We have not. Curious, yeah. yeah, so. I mean, I think that's an interesting, you know, having uh, two patients in the ICU who recently had a SERS storm from, you know, intra-abdominal issues, and they get liters of fluid, invariably sure. crystalloid, and, you know, during, to get them through the SERS, one, and then they get, you know, pharmacologic, one wonders, and I've thought about uh, this technology. I'm, you know, it's obviously 
I just think it's a unique approach because now they're paying the price now three or four days later. Source control has been maintained, but now they're in pulmonary edema because they got seven or eight liters of crystalloid and just fluid during their resuscitation. And I think uh, this is a interesting approach and I, I, it'd be interesting to try it in a, sur a model of SIRS, of incremental severity of SIRS yeah. or sepsis, you know. Absolutely. Great point. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Really great work. Thank you. Moving on with our next talk, final one for uh, for this session, but uh, London Air Ambulance, current practices, present problems, and future solutions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to present at such a wonderful conference representing London's Air Ambulance. And thank you. Um, I'd just like to thank the Reboa team in London. Controversially, I'm not a surgeon. Um, I'm a critical care doctor and pre-hospital doctor, so please bear with me. So in terms of our current practice in London, we're a trauma service uh, serving the 10 million population in London and see approximately 1,800 patients a year, and about 10% of those are the, uh, have a major hemorrhage. In terms of Reboa, we've been performing Reboa since 2014 in the pre-hospital environment, and uh, it's now standard practice for a select group of patients. Uh, so in terms of the select group of patients, that would be those at risk of imminent, imminent exsanguination that uh, are from a sub-diaphragmatic cause. So we'd either do a zone one uh, supraceliac or zone three uh, infrarenal for uh, those exsanguinating patients, or if they're peri-arrest, we would just perform a zone one. We also have the ability to insert a four French and do invasive uh, blood pressure monitoring and then upscale to an eight French arterial line and perform Reboa if needed. In terms of our uh, eight French access, that's performed percutaneously ultrasound guided and we would aim to measure pressures both proximally and distally and um, aim to get uh, partial reboa as soon as possible so that the ischemic hit doesn't uh, become, uh, the patient isn't unsavable due to the ischemic hit because obviously we've got to transport our patients to you guys in order to get the definitive hemorrhage control. So in terms of the challenges, there's a number that are listed. Uh, the one I'm going to focus on this brief talk is the balloon times in the pre-hospital environment. And in terms of the main aim, obviously, as soon as the balloon's inflated, the aim is for us to uh, achieve partial reboa as soon as possible. And that works by measuring the distal pressure with Austin Johnson's work as a pressure as a surrogate marker for flow, as you, you're all aware. In terms of a case example, I thought it'd be useful to demonstrate one of our cases. So a motorcyclist versus lamppost at risk of imminent exsanguination in the pre-hospital um, roadside. So in terms of the uh, uh, graph that's been produced, then as you can see along the x-axis, time since injury, and on the y, the arterial pressure. So the team have uh, gone to the 19-year-old patient who's lying on the road, agitated, complaining of epigastric and back pain, and uh, looks uh, peri-arrest. They've um, examined the patient and feel that he's bleeding from uh, arterial liver at plus or minus a venous element. And you can see on the left, there's a widened pulse pressure to suggest that there is a, an arterial injury. The team, so one of the doctors is performing the uh, arterial access and deciding to upscale to an eight French through uh, a guide wire exchange and perform the Reboa. The other doctor and paramedic on the team are performing an RSI, so uh, rapid sequence induction and intubation uh, concurrently. So you can see with the... Um, Oh, I'm standby. There we go. Um, so you can see then for the um, initial once there's a disconnection, the 
a hemodynamics are profoundly affected initially, and that's as a result of the uh, RSI, and then there's a significant improvement after zone one, Reboa. But it does actually take probably about 10 minutes before there's a significant improvement in the he hemodynamics. And we think that's as a result of the, um, obviously, inflating the balloon, getting the increased uh, diastolic pressure, increased coronary perfusion, and then that myocardial in, um, improvement results in an Im improvement in the hemodynamics as shown. So this is just a graphical representation of our data, um, which is obtained on a beat to beat analysis. So a few minutes after that initial zone one uh, balloon has been inflated, then you can see the uh, line of the top is the proximal pressure. Uh, the line of the bottom is the uh, distal pressure. And uh, initially, it's a race against time, but we need to achieve a partial pressure as soon as possible. And um, it, obviously, the current problem is that time, uh, ischemic time, and the potential solution to that is the partial reboa. So a few minutes later, you can see at the top the proximal and distal pressures. Um, so initially, with this, we're going to be having the improvement in the proximal blood pressure, improvement in the uh, stroke volume, cardiac output, um, and an improvement in the proximal aortic capacitance. During this time period, we're having uh, repeated blood product resuscitation uh, for this, and with it, having the improvement in the myocardial perfusion, then you we're getting an increase in the cardiac output and starting to achieve the partial reboa. Now, this is either um, can be done simultaneously uh, simultaneously, which has happened in this case with no uh, removal of fluid from the balloon, or um, the team are deflating the balloon incrementally. Well, this is shown fr from the cardiac improvement that there's no um, volume needed to be removed. Um, this is again a few minutes later, just to show there's a maintenance of the uh, proximal pressure and an improvement in the distal pressure as a result of that increased myocardial contractility uh, without the need for any uh, volume removed in the river. And we've seen in our cases of zone one that is not yet published, uh, but has shown that as 57% of our zone one patients have achieved partial reboa uh, spontaneously. So in terms of future solutions, um, we'd really welcome the uh, learning from the wealth of experience in the room. And we think it's more of a, a decision support with the use of um, AI, which has already been talked about, and automation with the use of uh, uh, robotic devices um, in these uh, reboa uh, devices. And also, we're seeing, unfortunately, more and more um, pediatric cases. Now, our penetrating trauma is knife crime and stabbings um, rather than the gunshots that you guys are seeing on a, uh, it sounds like, very common basis. And we'd really um, welcome the wealth of experience so we can see how to improve and be able to offer this for the 40 kilogram and above patients uh, in the future in London. Thank you. Hi, that's fascinating. It's, it's fascinating what um, what uh, you folks do in London. I know you do thoracotomies on the streets and now A-lines and Roboa. Could you, could you guess roughly since, uh, I, I think you said 2014 is when you started, roughly how many Roboa catheters or how many patients have you done on the streets of London? Just a, just a uh, guesstimate. So, um, Nat. In terms, I can't tell you um, the total number. Now, this year, um, we'd done, up until uh, start of this month, we'd done eight and we've done another two in the last week. So it's approximately now about one a month. Right, so in, in theory, maybe it's 50, 60, 70, perhaps, in the, in the intervening period of time. And, and all of, and, uh, and this is deployed, um, 
via the London Air Ambulance Service, although sometimes it might be a ground person that's actually doing it. Yes, so the helicopter will get the team, two doctors and a paramedic, to the patient. And it may be that uh, in the day we would go by helicopter. Um, at night or bad weather, we would go by a rapid response vehicle. And all of the doctors that are on the London Air Ambulance Service are trained in Reboa. Yourself being one of them. Correct. And we have regular monthly training sessions so that anyone can drop in to ensure competency. Fantastic. <clears throat> Very interesting uh, program, and we've certainly heard about it since you initiated. I'm curious about some of your uh, exclusion criteria. For example, uh, what do you do with a... Uh, penetrating chest injury with a systolic pressure of 70. So if it's ultimately um, a resuscitative occlusion of the aorta. So if we uh, need to do that, it would be a thoracotomy. If um, in, in terms of to get access to the um, aorta. Okay, well, I'm just talking about in between. I mean, most of us in the emergency department would not open a chest at 70. We'd go to the operating room. Uh, we may use a Reboa to enhance it a bit. Sorry, but seven, we wouldn't be opening chest at a systolic pressure of 70 in the emergency department. Sorry, in, in, in my head, uh, they were arrested. I apologize. Um, so in terms of, could you just repeat the question? Well, my, my question is, you know, it's promoted that Penetrating chest wounds are a relative contraindication. Some believe an absolute contraindication mm -hmm. for Reboa. So I'm just curious if you encounter one of these patients in the field, you know, who is legitimately at risk for cardiac arrest, where do you take the risk benefit? And do you take that patient with a pressure of 70 and put a, for example, zone three Reboa so that they don't arrest? Yeah, thank you. I think for those um, patients, then they need to have uh, definitive surgical control and we would want to get to hospital as soon as possible. So just because we've got tools to do things, sometimes it's knowing when not to do it. And so we would want to um, get them into an operating room. Uh, the other area uh, is of uh, a relative contraindication. I don't believe it should be an absolute contraindication is the torn thoracic aorta. So in the case you presented, this motorcyclist going down, uh, you got systolic pressures of 125. Do you have any kind of guidelines to keep the pressure under 100 if they got a risk of blunt thoracic injury? So we would want to aim for um, a systolic of like 90 to 100. We're not, we're not aiming for any higher than that. Thank you. Uh, we have seen this uh, presentation or the, the older numbers, but my question has always been that how many did you try to put in the Reboa in? Because the winters are harsh uh, up north there. How many have you tried to put the Reboa in and you didn't manage? And, and another thing that I have also asked a couple of times for your colleagues that have presented is, what's your time on the scene? How long have you been there? Because this patient got both intubation and the Reboa. Even doing that in RED without getting the Reboin and having anesthesiologists to do the intubation, we, we are talking about 10, 15 minutes with the best of the best jumping on the patient. What are your times? Thank um, you. So, so for times, then from us arriving, we can be first on scene, so removing clothes, et cetera. So we're talking about a 30-minute uh, scene time to um, assess, get, get, subclavian access to do for a boa and we'll be doing everything else en route it's almost a case of getting the lines in and then we could be do inflating balloons manipulating balloons continuing with blood transfusions en route to hospital uh, it's just getting lines in that we usually do on scene and for that for the other question because citing the numbers we know that you do one rebo a month basically but how many have you tried on and you didn't get that access because it was too cold or you couldn't find the vein? Uh, can you comment on that? Yes, thank you. Um, we're currently writing up a 
paper looking at the complication rate, that would be obviously, so we've got data on all of it. And it's um, approximately 10% uh, of those cases would we not have been able to get access. Um, I haven't got all the numbers uh, in my head at the moment, but I'll be able to go through it with you. It seems like, uh, first of all, congratulations on, on that experience. Uh, it's impressive and certainly relevant to the UK and the US military, so congratulations. It seems like in your experience, the measurement of pressure is pretty important. Um, you showed a pretty nice graph of above and below the balloon pressure. Um, do you think that is important as we move forward with devices and develop new technologies to have above and below so you can titrate partial reboa? And second related question is how did you measure those pressures? Were those with uh, through a fluid column uh, device or other? So we ha we have found it important to do uh, to measure the distal pressure as a surrogate marker to flow because obviously we're going to have longer balloon inflation times before definitive hemorrhage control. So we wanted to uh, try and aim for partial bow at 10, 10 minutes afterwards and we'll ask for a time call so that other things can get in the way. Uh, so yes, we do feel that that is important and train, so we do consider it. Um, in terms of the other question you said, How did you measure it? Is it the thank you. So we have in our a French cafeter, then we have uh, one pressure columnized um, arterial line, and uh, in the proximal above the balloon, then we have the other, where the other transducer would read from. Time for a couple more questions and comments. Yeah, great presentation. And I'll follow on with Todd's about the pressure above and below the balloon for a second. How long, how long are you doing partial rebo until you can get into the emergency department? So it depends approximately. So with as soon as we start for a boa case, then we will continue the care and can be transferred to them, say, 20 minutes, uh, usually uh, 10 to 20 minutes to the hospital. The hospitals, if it's we're taking them back home, as it were, to Borough mm -hmm. London, then we've got a team who are used to dealing with Robert. If we're taking them to one of the other three major trauma centres within London, then they not the clinicians may not be as familiar with. So the London Air Ambulance team will go up to the operating room with the patient, uh, aiming to get the balloon down as soon as possible. Um, but we could be going into theater uh, with the patient. Sounds like at least an hour. The, uh, and, and so the sec yeah, you said spontaneous partial reboa, right? Words I've not really heard before, but you clearly showed it happening where your pressure is above and below. Do you think that's because of vaso uh, dilation of the aorta as the cardiac output comes back up? So. Um, in in certain aspect, yes, from the continued blood uh, transfusion. However, also as a result of the improved myocardial recovery, then we feel that having the improved stroke volume and uh, cardiac output as a result would have a significant uh, impact and probably why it takes about 10 minutes before there's a, a marked improvement. <clears throat> Okay, thanks for, for your excellent presentation. Uh, actually, I want to state to, to, to the audience also that in the Netherlands, we're also close to start because we actually uh, yeah, worked also a lot with Royal, Royal London to uh, get, get the study rolling. So I appreciate your experience on that. But I, I find, find it important for, for the critical casters that you see that, you know, you, of course, you have to scoop and run and stay and play. But I always say, if you take time, especially in the Netherlands, we also do a thoracotomy on the street. And I know you guys also do that. So the strongest answer, if you consider a thoracotomy pre-hospital on the street, so why even bother that putting on just getting vascular access? So I'm not saying that you place the balloon, but even if you have just access for a four or five inch sheet, and then you have the access, and then you consider to place a rebo, a yes or no, partial or intermittent. So that's what I want to strengthen your, your outcome, because I think you have the largest co cohort in Europe. So. I think a, thor a thoracotomy is now an acceptable treatment in Europe. So I think we were also on 100 already. I think you're over that. Yeah. So 
I think the the Reboa should, should come starting it now with our teams. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Turn it over to Chuck for the closing remarks. I just want to thank uh, the moderators and the faculty for excellent sessions, being on time, for everyone attending, and for our AV and video folks, uh, really just very seamless today. Um, So uh, make sure you bring ID because the World Trade Center has a roster of names and they're going to check that against IDs. And also if you have talks tomorrow that haven't been downloaded, it would make it a lot easier if we download them tonight so that when uh, we get started in the morning, they've got all the talks ready to go. Um, but anyway, thank you very much and we'll see you at the banquet dinner at 1900.
Thank you. 